Hello there guys and gals, the Welsh Hunter here back with yet another 100% achievement guide and this time we are getting it all in Agatha Christie Murder on the Orient Express. This was developed by Microids Studio Lyon, published by Microids and Maximum Games and is available for £33.49 slash $39.99. So yes, Hercule Poirot is back, but not like you've seen before. Instead of a dumpy egghead old man, he's had a mega glow up. Muscles, muscles in the face, hell of a head on him, but still the same old voice. Yeah, well, that was kind of French-Swedish I just done there. Uh, anyway, we're on a train, bad happens, we solve the bad, job done. You know how it all goes with Hercule Poirot. Now, as for achievements, a lot of you will, uh, you, a lot of... You will get, that's what I'm trying to say, just by completing each of the 13 chapters. There's a few miscellaneous, but uh, they are easy enough. There are 40 golden mu mustaches to collect throughout, but the important ones are, so for throughout the entirety of the game, we can never get a confrontation wrong. There are 17 to do, and you must get everyone right, plus never using a hint throughout the game. But that should be a fast track to an easy 1K. Um, you do have a couple of saves, so, you know, use them wisely if you want to. But you're looking at around nine hours or so to get this done. So, with that being said then, let's do it! Now, we start off in this hotel. And also, let me just quickly explain then. The reason why this guide and this game is going to take you about nine hours long. Now, normally in games like this, you will be able... You, you'd normally be able to press the cross slash A button in order to just skip the dialogue. But you can't do it in this game. Makes the story a lot interesting since you've got to, you know, listen to it. But that's why uh, the guide and the game is so long because we can't actually skip any dialogue. Cutscenes, no cutscenes, no dialogue, anything like that. So here he is, the man with the... I mean, he looks kind of more like a thief. And this is our best friend, Croissant Head. Hello, Mr. Croissant Head. Right, anyway, as we begin then, immediately go to the right. We're going to pick up our first golden moustache. So go to the right, just behind this Ladia, right here. On the railing is the first gold moustache. Pick it up. Press the B button to pick up. And then, oh, another delightful trophy for my collection. Sorry if I completely butcher the French-English language, by the way. So go ahead. Uh, his name is actually uh, Monsieur Book. But he looks genuinely like more of a pale croissant. So that's why I'm going to call him Croissant Head throughout the uh, rest of the game. Um... So, I mean, in terms of buttons and everything, easy enough. Basically, whenever you get um, deductions and clues and everything to put together, you just need to press the Y button. You will see in just a little bit. Um, and then it's just the A button to pick some stuff up and left stick to walk around and stuff. Uh, the left trigger will get Poirot walking ever so slightly more, um, but that's about it. So he does, so yeah, he doesn't really run, he just walks slightly faster. Sists, I accept with pleasure. And we'll dine together, for I too depart this afternoon. We'll have plenty of time to catch up. I'll have the hotel transfer our luggage. Excuse me, sir, you are the director of the line? The Princess Dragomirov would like to know if she may keep her minor in her compartment on the train. Uh, good morning, Princess. It is an honor to welcome you aboard. There is absolutely no problem for your pet. You will ask about his food? Oh, yes. The Princess Dragomirov would like to know if there is food for miners on board. Insects, uh, small amphibians, baby rodents? Baby rodents? Guess who's going to make another appearance here? He's from Eastern Europe. He was in the Grand Theft Auto 4 game. It's Nico Bellic as a posh retired army man. Um, yes, so we've basically got Nico Bellic there with a scar across his head. He's, uh, he's not trying to be the Grand Theft Man anymore, no. He's just trying to go into the, uh, the train, you know? Terrible, terrible accents, I'm very sorry. But anyway, um, his name is Archibald. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. Just, why would you, why would you call your kid bald? I don't, I, anyway, speak. When this dialogue uh, finally finishes, go ahead and speak to Captain Archibald Arbuthnot. Very English posh name. 
Yesterday I recovered artifacts worth several millions. Please, my friend. It's not just any ticket. It's an Orient Express ticket. Very well, I will investigate. Thank you, Poirot. I will arrange a car to Sirkechi station for us. So here it is then. Um, this will tell you just a couple of things of how to do stuff. So you press the Y button or the triangle button on PlayStation, of course, in order to open up the mind map. It basically, it'll, a lot of this is just in terms of it'll tell you where to go. So obviously it's telling us now to speak to Captain Archibald uh, Nico Bellic or Abuthnot. Um, and then, like I said, the more clues we get and everything, uh, we can use that mind map in order to pop everything together. So, again, just speak to Mr. Arbusnot for now. And when I got back, my ticket was gone, and other things were on the floor, as if they'd been tossed about. Hello, monsieur. I suggest we begin in your room. Will you lead the way? So, this is the first sort of part of how to actually, how we're going to use the mind map. So, we'll press the button, uh, press the A button here on how to find the ticket. So click A on search, and then it's like a line going to the other side. So search the bedroom, which would be the bottom right. Then interrogate should automatically go there. And then the neighbors, which would be at the top. And then it'll be inspect. And the last one would be the door. Now, it doesn't matter if you get any of these wrong. So don't panic if you get one of the, uh, you know, one of these little puzzles or deductions wrong. That's fine. The confrontations is basically when you try and catch one of these characters out in a lie. Which I'll obviously tell you when we go, uh, when we get there. And all of these characters that are currently in this building are going to be major players later on. So, oh, wee wee wee. So, yes, 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 apparently. Floor, Captain Arbuthnot? Fourth floor. Oh, one mystery solved. So go ahead, click the buttons on the elevator, and then click f floor number floor four. Number four, please. So yeah. Now let's play some elevator made in music. And we're going to do some stuff. So um, a lot of this will come up, basically just, just some character analysis. So obviously he is very British. This fake Nico Bellic. The age will be 45. There'll always be three different sets of ages. And his profession will be retired captain. So he's, uh, he's changed his attitude from Grand Theft Auto 4, huh? I'm right again. That happens to me a lot. My room's along here, 411. I don't know what it is, but tattoos on a woman is just blamissimo. Right, so don't follow uh, Nico Bellic Arbathnot. Go to the left first and head down the end of the hallway. Again, you can press the left trigger, and as you can see, he slightly picks up his speed. But right on the table here on the left is going to be Golden Mustache Number 2. Yes, I said French stuff. So, there we go. So, what you can do is just head back, go to the left, and then speak with uh, Nico Bellica Buthnot again. You have locked the door, monsieur? Naturally. This is a foreign country. You have the key card? Of course. We will enter. The lock has not been tampered with. 
Here's the 411, folks. Say some gangsters dissing your fly girl. You just give him one of these. <laughs> bang, bang, bang. Any Simpsons fans will know. Anyway, going left here into the bathroom and picking up the third golden mustache of the level. And uh, yes, so obviously it'll tell you in the top right hand corner how many you've collected. So obviously, as long as you're on the same, we are good to go. So we're going to do, we're going to interact with the desk in the bottom right drawer. And this will actually be where Golden Mustache number four is. So you have to open it up with the right stick. And then just pick up the Golden Mustache. And that is four out of four for the level. See, flying around. Look at that. Ten minutes in. We'll be done in no time at all. Just, uh, just about eight and a half hours left now. Hooray! So, first things first. What we're going to do, we're going to go back towards the bathroom. Now we're going to do some um, clues and inspecting stuff. So, first thing we're going to do is inspect a water stain on the floor, which is just outside the bathroom here. There it is. Hmm, mm, somebody pissed themselves. Grande. The water is scented. Well, it was a hell of a night. So, uh, we are now going to walk over to these papers here on the floor, interact with it. Now, also, what you can see as well, when you interact with um, something, uh, if it's all been interacted with and you don't have to interact with it anymore, it turns grey and there's like a little down arrow icon. That's when you know that it's all finished with. Um, otherwise, it'll still remain white, uh, like a white dot like this. So interact now with the, what looks like a box, this blue box with the medal in it. So just interact with that again. See, he's old. So, as you can see, because we've interacted with it fully, it goes grey, so just keep that one in mind. So, interact now with the uh, this little receipt. Kind of looks like a receipt. And then what we can do, turn around just underneath the TV then, is going to be the wallet. So, we'll interact with that, open it up, and just interact with everything that you can. $200. Man, what I could do with $200 it is right now. Tobias! Right, so we are going to just interact with the desk again. And this time we're going to look in the top left drawer in order to get the Istanbul brochure. Brochure. The brochure for this fascinating city. So next up then, look up, we're going to interact with the open window. Um, if you're four floors up, unless you've got massive legs like Peter Crouch, you ain't getting out of that fourth floor, that thief, that thief, that thief. Interact here with the papers just by the bedside table. That's a whole lot of travel expenses there. So that'll be the papers on the floor there, just next to the bed. Now we're going to interact with the bed itself. Now, it may seem like quite pointless, but all of these little things we need to pick up do help. So, yeah. Now, just interact here with the earring on the right-hand side. Not the first time I've seen and then what we're going to do, we're going to go and enter the um, left side, the other side of the bathroom. So, not where the toilet and the sink is, but right opposite. And then we'll have a look in the bath and check the bin for a perfume bottle. So, not in this one, but the one just opposite me. A perfume bottle empty suggestive. Okay, so that's all the clues done. When one there, when all the clues are done, then it'll tell you that you can do your mind mapping deduction in. So how could a thief get into the room? A thief may have entered using a key card. So bomb option, the thief may have entered using a key card. That's the right answer. That's the right answer. Thank you. Muscular Poirot, who you used to look like a big egghead, or a small egghead in that case, but look at him. He's still got the mustache and the voice, but he looks so, so good. Anyway, out we go. What we're going to do is check room 410 and 412, which would, of course, be the neighbors. Basically, no one's in and no one wants to talk. So there's 412, then go the opposite way and check 410. Hey, please. A brief word, sir. I will give you two brief words. Go away. 
Monsieur... I've been traveling all night from New York. Must I call the management? Pardon, monsieur. I do not believe we have awakened a thief. The room is apparently empty. I will leave it for the moment. So now we are going to speak to Nico Bellica Bathnot. Now, a lot of the times we will have just options, loads of options, three, four, five, whatever. Basically, you just need to go through every dialogue option. Again, nothing is skippable, unfortunately, only if you've said the, the same dialogue before. Uh, but every time we talk to someone, you get a whole list of options. You can just normally smash through all of them. Did you leave the window open? No. That must be how the thief escaped. I think not. Unless the thief had wings. The bed is very neatly made, but the corners are not military style. The price we paid for this hotel? I'm not going to make my own bloody bed. Interesting pronoun, that. We. Right, so once you've gone through every dialogue option, we're going to press B to go back, and then we're going to press the Y button to go into your mind map. You have to wait until dialogue is finished in order for this to appear. Uh, so how could the ticket have disappeared? Firstly, choose the window is wide open and drag it to the left-hand side. And then choose there are scattered papers on the floor. So go ahead and drag that to the right-hand side. There we go. So that'll be the first one. And then you, you're going to be choosing the captain invited someone. So the captain invited someone. Oh, 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 enchanté. And an earring is on the bedside table. That's fairly obvious. You can't really lie about that one. Um, yeah, a bit tricky too. A woman spent the night in the room. That's pretty easy to conclude there. So now you can just go ahead and go down and press the conclude button. The wind probably blew the papers on the floor as it came in through the window. Moreover, the door is closed, and I found an earring on the bedside table. The captain invited a woman into his room. Maybe she is our culprit. And then we're going to get straight back into the mind map, and we're going to choose who is the woman who entered the room. And the woman is the middle one that you've seen in the elevator. So uh, choose the middle option here. And then we're going to talk to Arbuznot once again and uh, select the new dialogue option. Captain Arbuthnot, I have examined your room. Much was revealed, possibly more than you expected. Rest assured, we will soon find your ticket. It's about bloody time. I have a train to catch. As do I. You are traveling on the Orient Express? We. Oui. If you will be good enough to answer a few questions, we may both make our train. Ask away. Please, give me an account of your movements yesterday. I spent most of my day in Istanbul, sightseeing. I returned to the hotel. So this is where we're going to start doing our first confrontation here. So basically, in what he said, he said a lie in one of those sentences. We need to figure out which one it is. Remember, we have to do these without failing. So we have to get these all right. So the first one we're going to choose is, I spent the night alone. I had no visitors in my room. So I spent the night alone. I had no visitors in my room. So this, so that sentence is obviously a lie. And then we can hit him with evidence and the truth, which is going to be the earring. So make sure to choose earring. So that'll be the first out of 17 done. So doing all the confrontations without ever making a mistake. Again, if you do end up making a mistake, you could possibly get away with um, completely quitting out of the dashboard and going back in. And hopefully it'll just set you back to the last checkpoint or, you know, keep on top of the manual saves, which you have a couple of slots for. And she mailed it for me. I hadn't noticed that she had lost an earring. And when did you invite this uh, secretary? This woman may be the thief we are looking for. 
That was yesterday evening. My ticket was still there when I went down to breakfast. She can't have taken it. Hmm. I see. Never mind. It is easily checked. And uh, there was no other person in your room? No. I swear there wasn't. Ah, uh, well, never mind. If it is not her, there is only one option left. Fine. Please finish your job quickly. I'll be downstairs in the lobby. Bruh, Nico Bellic's getting a lot ruder. Now, isn't he, since he turned all English posh? Find your, do your job. <laughs> anyway, head back into the elevator and we're going to go down to the lobby now. Okay, so we're going to head over to the right. We're going to speak to the... Oh, you, desk clerk. I have lost my bloody ticket. What do our posh English people say bloody like everything? Bloody pardon, monsieur. Make a bloody inquiry when the bloody staff begins cleaning their bloody rooms. Etc, etc. Anyway, once you have spoken to the clerk, um, we can... We're actually going to just back out, inspect the business card just right in front of him first. Hotel Tocletian. Tocatlian. Tocatlian? Yes. So once we've inspected that, press the B button to go back. Speak to desk clerk again, and then ask to speak to the chambermaid. Speak with the chambermaid who cleaned room 411 this morning. I hope you don't think that one of our staff stole the ticket. No, 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 no. Do not distress yourself. We seek only information. I will summon her at once. Oh, I'd ask her to bring her laundry cart. So once L chambermaid is down, interact with the left side of the laundry basket first. And then we're going to speak to the chambermaid herself. Again, whatever dialogue options there are, just go through them all. Do not be frightened, mademoiselle. Did you clean room 411 this morning? Room 411? Yes, that is one of mine. Did you see a ticket on the desk when you entered the room? I I'm sorry, I, I didn't notice a ticket. There was a wallet, but of course I did not touch it. Did you open the window? Yes, we always air the rooms. Oh, but I forgot to close the window. While I was making the bed, the person from next door was pounding on the wall. I wondered if he needed assistance. I tossed the dirty sheets in my cart, quickly finished mopping and went to see, but it was nothing. I'm afraid I left the window open. I'm so sorry. The window left open, papers scattered on the floor. The chambermaid cleaning the room. I believe I can now visualize what happened. So, back to the mind map, that we go. For the reconstruction of the scene. So it basically plays out now, like I said, we've got to put the correct ones in the correct slot. So the first one, we're going to put the chambermaid, parks her car behind the desk. So again, you will... Press the A button and then drag that all the way to the left side, the first slot. Next up, it's going to be the chamber chambermaid opens the window. So drag that to the second one. The third one and the last one will always be the same, so near bother. So that that's already there. The chambermaid changes the bed. The wind blows the ticket into slot number four. Nos. And then the ticket lands in the cart. That'll be in slot five. And finally... The dirty bed linen is dropped on top of the ticket. And then, of course, the seventh one is already in. So, confirm it. Twerk it. Do it. That's the right answer. So go ahead, speak to Nico Bellic, our bath not to save the day. 
Mademoiselle, would you be so kind as to look in the sheets from room 411? And so the missing train ticket completes its strange journey. An open window, a laundry cart, and an annoying neighbor. But chance is the only guilty party in this dark mystery. Mr. Poirot, I apologize. I believe my concern got the better of me, and I forgot myself. Thank you. It was a case of great magnitude. I'm glad I was up to the challenge. And that, I think, is that. Now then, let us finish off this chapter, or the prologue chapter, by talking to Monsieur Croissant Head himself, Mr. Book. And that will end the prologue, and you have your first achievement called a mystery. No, a trifle for Poirot. Could do with a trifle. But yes, all these characters are going to be major players, Lighter Might. So, uh, yep, yeah, that's the prologue done. You should have a sort of fair clue of how the game works and what to do. On to chapter one. Animal. Uncaged. We must leave for the station. Our bags are in the taxi. Did you find the ticket? It was a case most difficult, but somehow Hercule Poirot managed. I knew you could do it. Now we can sit back and enjoy a relaxing train ride. You are in luck, Poirot. Of course, no journey on this train is ever ordinary. But this is a special occasion. To celebrate the 140 years of the Orient Express, the engine will be none other than the splendid Pacific 231G558. There she is, Poirot. The most celebrated train in history. Oh, my eyes fill with tears of pride. It is time we were aboard, my friend. Follow me. The wagon lead conductor, Pierre Michel, will direct you to your compartment. Lead the way, book. Okay, so here we are on the journey of the Orient Express, but there's a few things to do before we get onto the train. So the first things first is go all the way to the opposite end of the uh, station here. Uh, we're basically going to be picking up our first out of three Golden moustaches. The train is limited to 100 kilometers per hour. I assure you, that will be more than fast enough to get you to Paris in time for your connection to London in the meantime. And there it is. So, right on this bench here, kind of have to get a little bit awkward and try and get as close as you can to it. But there you go A button, B button to pick up, and that will be one for the level. And you should now be on five out of 40 golden moustaches. So now we're going to inspect the train, the beginning and the end. So we're already at the end, or the beginning or whatever. So we interact with this one first and then, well, what, what I could have done was actually inspected the train earlier at uh, the top bit. So I do apologize, but we are going to head back to the opposite side of the train and inspect the beginning of it. My friend Book did not lie. His train is a beautiful machine. My friend Book looks like a French pastry for breakfast. Okay, right. Next thing we're going to do is inspect the newspaper, which is going to be on a table just off to the right. And then uh, a parrot cage, which is underneath a white blanket. So, uh, this not this newspaper, but a little bit further up. Just on a, well, on a crate, on a box by itself. So, interact with that. 
Dogu Expressi, which means train dog. I just made that up. I, I assume it. I assume Expressi is express. So, uh, so if you continue going forward just a little bit there, you can see the white, um, white cloth over the parrot cage. Privyat, privyat. Thank you very much. So with that done, now we can go ahead and talk to Monsieur Book. Good evening, Monsieur. Your compartment is number 202. However, I am afraid that all the others are already full. Full? But how can that be? It is incredible, Monsieur. All the world likes to travel tonight. All the same, you must find room for this gentleman here. I can exercise my powers of observation while they try to find me. All right then, so we're going to do some uh, we're going to do some inspecting now. So you can press the right trigger to zoom in and the left trigger to zoom out. So basically for this section all we're going to do is this couple of sets of white dots. Uh four I think all together. So you've got the two on the right, old Chickadee doing some obvious hiding and uh, another one on the right and one on the left. So just go through and inspect all the passengers until uh, we get to talk to Signor Croissant Head again. Is everything aboard the train, Hector? In your compartment, Mr. Ratchet. I'm having them disinfect the room again as you instructed. I also got a call from the Indians. The sale is going through as you expected. There was never any doubt. No other phone calls, Hector, from Geneva or Venice? No, sir. Who were you expecting? Never you mind. Check our tickets. We're not going in until everything is confirmed. The young man seems quite agreeable, but the other. The older man is something quite different. Mary. Not now. Not now. When it's all over. When it's behind us, then. Darling, we have to get aboard. I know, I know. I have heard of the phobia of fear of flying, but fear of trains? Now you're making fun of me. Never, my love. We'll board shortly, once our compartment is ready. Why did you order so much lobster, Hotaru? My dear Freya, I need it for my specialty on the second night. And if the lobster a la mori isn't fresh, the passengers will know. We don't have enough space for my desserts. Tonight, molten chocolate cake. Tomorrow, my specialty. That is not my concern. They will not have room for them anyway. Serve your lobster tonight. Chicken a la mori must be the first night dish for the travelers. It is easier to digest. Ugh, you really are the egomaniac everyone says you are. I have every reason to be. I am the engine. You are just the caboose. Wow, I am mortified. The 140th anniversary, perhaps, but such a plague of passengers. That is not my concern. I'm terrible at accents, I'm so sorry. So, let's press the Y button here and go into Passenger Discussions, which should already be there. So, just a couple of questions to answer. So, the first answer is his secretary. So, answer with his secretary. The next one, what is the woman afraid of? Say, take in the train. Now, that is... Love it. Genuinely love. Any tattoos on a woman is just... ba 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 uh, choose she's worried. So how is the woman feeling? She's worried. Two chefs. What is the bone of their contention? <laughs> bone. Storage in the refrigerator. We've got to sort that bone out, everyone. Come on, help me. And who is the woman watching? Make sure to choose the right picture, which is old man and young man. Fantastic. That's the right answer. So go ahead and speak to the conductor, who is called Mr. Michel. 
Again, any dialogue options, we'll blast through them all. Gentlemen, has not yet come. An Englishman, a Monsieur Harris. A name of good omen. It is already time to leave. What do I care for, Mr. Harris? As Monsieur pleases, I had your things sent straight to your compartment. Unfortunately, you will be with another traveler. No. Only for the first night. It cannot be helped. I will survive, Mulan. Mushu Book, we can't find enough space in the kitchen refrigerator to store all of my ingredients. How is it possible? His recipes are extravagant. We need to leave something on the platform. If my lobsters don't go, I don't go. And have the passengers of the Orient Express go hungry? Never. Must I? Yeah, some very sorry muscular, more muscular, less chubbier Poirot. We do have to intervene. So um, we're going to speak to the chefs here. Then we're going to do a little workshop. Um, basically, again, it's just the three sort of character analysis, if you wish, on Freya, the blonde loden. Upstairs for a day or two, we can restock at another station. Delay? You ask me to delay? Yeah. Calm yourself, my friend. I'm sure we can find a solution. Is that a diagram of the refrigerator? May I see it? Yes. He refuses to look at it. So, little blue eyes here. She is American. Freya is American. Age 27 and the profession is pastry chef. So after this, we're basically going to be doing a little bit of a puzzle. You've just got to put the boxes in the right places. Very easy, so you'll just have to follow along with what I do. Or you can skip ahead and, you know, see the finished product, as I always say. Mr. Poor, I will reserve the finest lobster just for you. I look forward to it, monsieur. And to the dessert, mademoiselle. Hopefully. That will be the last mystery you face on our journey, my dear Poirot. Your compartment for tonight only is at the back of the second-class carriage, number 102. Tomorrow, you move to a private compartment. So I think it's high time we speak to Mr. Michel and enter the train. Welcome, Monsieur Paul. I apologize for the delay. Thank you, Monsieur Michel. I am delighted you could accommodate me. Right, so we're going to be getting used to this. This is going to be our home for the next um, seven or eight hours or so. Seven hours-ish. So first things first, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to go to, well, we're going to have a look in all of these rooms as we go past. But basically, we need to go to compartment 101. So it can be slightly confusing purely because, uh, as we, we're we going to just speak to the, the Hungarian dim diplomat. He's just going to get out of our way. But you can see all these are two something something. Um, and just, but, but there it says one. But what that means is first class and then two, which means second class. So 
can be a little bit confusing there, but we basically have to go down all the way through to the end. So whenever you see the big number two, that means you're in second class. Doors 101 to 105 or 106 or something. So just continuing to head down, um, stopping off at any opening doors, which I don't think there is now. But just behind here to the right and on the floor is the next golden mustache. That should be two out of three for the level. Six out of 40 overall. So once you've grabbed that, we can turn back around and we're going to head inside to compartment 102 and talk to Mr. McQueen. Excuse me, I think you made a mistake. You are Mr. Harris? No, my name is McQueen. I... There is no other berth on the train, monsieur. All is arranged. Yours is the upper berth. We start in one minute. The train's remarkably full. En voiture! Listen, sir, if you'd rather have the lower berth, easier and all that, well, that's all right by me. No, 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 you are too amiable. It is for one night only at Belgrade. Oh, I see. You're getting out of Belgrade. Not exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, dinner is served. You may join the rest of the passengers in the dining car. Well, it took 40 minutes, but we finally know what the, the name of the game is called now. Uh, right, so what we're going to do is we are going to go to the restaurant car, which basically you've got the lounge, which we were just in. This is the bar. Um, and we are actually going to speak to Mr. Fauchel here. And then in the next uh, car is the restaurant. So you've got lounge, bar, restaurant, and then storage area in the back. Oh, cheers, broski. This mustache deserves first class. And to be fair, anyone who keeps up with a mustache like this deserves all the first class. Uh, so again, speak to Mr. Fauchel and just go through every dialogue option. I see. Thank you. What is your position on the Orient Express? I manage the bar car, and I also do the restaurant car service. Well, then do not let me keep you. Lobster tonight, isn't it? Yes, indeed. I'll leave you to it, then. See you soon, monsieur. Now, we shall continue on to the restaurant car. So, just continue on. You can see the uh, where it says restaurant. You know, you'll just nip straight through. And once again, we are going to talk to Mr. Book. Of course, you can tell who Mr. Book is, because he's got a huge head. I have taken the liberty of ordering you your lobster. Thank you. It appears our fellow passengers are all gathered here again tonight. Ah. If I had but the pen of a Balzac, I would depict the scene. Oh, it is an idea, that. Ah, you agree. It has not been done, I think. And yet, it lends itself to romance, my friend. All around us are people of all classes, of all nationalities, of all ages. For three days, these people, these strangers to one another, 
are brought together. They sleep and eat under one roof. They cannot get away from each other. At the end of the journey, they part. They go their several ways, never perhaps to see each other again. Certainly it interests us, inviting us to watch and wonder about their lives. Ah, I know you, my friend. I mean, lobster on a tree, that's not a bad, uh, yeah, I'll take that. Right, so what we're going to do is do in some inspecting. So we're going to check out some women and check out some men. So what you got to do then is just uh, go to the left, uh, interact with them. And they're going to have a little bit of dialogue. Then we're going to do a little bit of character working out. And then we're going to do the same with the men, which is behind the women. I was visiting my daughter. She now, does this woman not look like Charlie Harper's mother from Two and a Half Men? Does she not? It's exactly the same. She told me I should take this high-class train. I can't wait to see Paris. It looks beautiful in the movies, but it couldn't be more beautiful than Schenectady in the good old U.S. of A. <laughs> That's where I'm living now. And you, uh, Miss Debenham, was it? Where do you hail from? I was born in the U.K. Oh, that's in England, isn't it? What do you do for a living? I teach English to children in other countries. I see. Oh, I wish I spoke a foreign language. My daughter speaks several languages. Let me tell you about So, you can always tell the English lady in here because she's called Miss Debenham, which is just British clothing store. So, nationality here is obviously going to be British. She's going to be 40, which is a uh, young looking 40, to be fair. And then her profession is English teacher. I was saying that. Remember how Steve Martin and everyone you were portrayed as mid-40s when they looked like they were in the, the mid-90s. These days, everyone who looks 40 is bloody beautiful. N no offence to anyone who was 40 in the 1980s, of course. She reveals little. She is self-contained. Some secret prompts her to allow her dinner companion to carry the conversation. I confess, in this case, what I witnessed in Istanbul suggests more. But I will respect her privacy. You will always amaze me. Mamma mia, you can feel the power of engine. We climb into the mountains with ease. I know something about the power, and this baby has it in spades. There's something special about a train. I'll give you that. I sell toys. And model trains are one of our biggest items. And not just for children, either. You sell model cars, too? Sure, but give me a train any day. Oh, my friend. What do you have against the cars? Now, I work at Fortuna in Italy as a spokesperson. We are producing the next generation of electric cars, the Fortuna Firenze. Like the city, it is beautiful. We got the competitors looking over their shoulders so much they're going to hit something. Hey, it's -a me, a Foscarelli. So, let's do the next character analysis then. He is Italian. Jeez, he's not 19. That would have been a hard paper round if, uh, if, if he was 19. But he is 35. Still a bit of a tough paper round, mind. And the profession is spokesperson. My little grey cells did not let me down. The loud gentleman is very confident, a master of his own fate. It is as much in the inflection as it is in the words. He believes in winning, also that he is the one who will win. You are a magician. Oh, it is not a parlor trick, my friend. It is simply observation. My friend, this is one of the best desserts I have ever eaten. You have always had the sweet tooth. But this... this... It is Old croissant head just had a little uh, few baby croissants in his pants there, tasting that dessert. Right, we're going to get another achievement here. Uh, what we're going to do is inspect the menu first. And then basically we're going to inspect the dessert and then we have to choose three specific answers to get the dessert connoisseur achievement. 
Ooh, nice to be on a rich person's train here. If this was a poor person's train, it would be a packet of cheese and onion crisps and a mouldy ham sandwich. And we'd still have to pay like six quid for it. Right, so you interact with the ice cream first and we're going to choose lemon. So the ice cream is lemon. The red fruit is obviously raspberry, even though Monsieur Croissant Head thinks it's a strawberry. So after this, you'll have to actually turn the dessert around for some particular reason. Uh, but there we go. So this one is next is going to be a raspberry. It looks like a raspberry. Mm. You have a good eye, Poirot. And finally, it's the base is going to be buttery biscuit base. Crushed, crushed biscuit base. Base, buttery biscuit crushed base. What do you think? It's actually crushed biscuit. So crushed biscuit... And that'll be all three done. The dessert connoisseur achievement will unlock. And then we'll have to go and talk to Freya, where we will do our second and third confrontation. Great favor. My friend, I am on this train due to the great favor you have done me. How may I assist you? This dessert is sublime. If only I had the recipe. Unfortunately, the pastry chef, Miss Nielsen, she will guard her secrets. But you, my friend, I am sure you could make her confess. You wish me to persuade the pastry chef to give up her recipe? You who are the expert at interrogation. Book, it is a dessert. It is the pinnacle of desserts. You, my friend, who, as you say, are on this train. I blush to remind you. Fine, you win. Again, what wouldn't I do for you, my friend? Oh, thank you, Poirot. Good lunch. Good evening, mademoiselle. Good evening, sir. How can I help you? That was a magnificent dessert you served us tonight. I wanted to tell you personally how much both Monsieur Bouc and I enjoyed it. Thank you very much, sir. In fact, it is so good. Monsieur Bouc insists on knowing how you made it. Oh, sir, I'm sorry. You must know a chef never gives away their recipes, but... Well, you helped with the refrigerator, and without space in it for me, there would have been no dessert. Very well. To prepare tonight's dessert, first I melt sugar to make caramel. Then I spread this caramel to make tuile. Between two tuiles, I add a small scoop of lemon ice cream, and I put the whole thing on a strawberry crown. Poirot, you are suspicious. E so here is the first of the two confrontations, first of all. And the lie we're going to choose on the sentence. And I put the whole thing on a strawberry crown, which we already know is a lie. So make sure to choose the sentence. And then I put the whole thing on a strawberry crown. Thank you for sharing your recipe with me. But I doubt those are strawberries you're using. Oops. You have a good eye, Monsieur Poirot. Very well. And of course, we're going to be choosing raspberries. So, second noun, raspberries. You used raspberries, not strawberries. I'm not fooled. You're right. Mr. Book, he couldn't tell the difference. Let's move on to the bottom part of the dessert. My favorite part of the dessert. First, I melted some butter. I crumbled pieces of chocolate into the butter. Then I placed the mix in a circular mold. Finally, I let the whole... And here is the second confrontation then. She's on about the base, base, buttery biscuit, base. So the lie is... Uh, so choose the sentence, I crumbled pieces of chocolate into the butter. It's certainly not chocolate that you... And then, obviously, we know the truth to be crushed biscuit. So make sure to choose crushed biscuit. A clever pastry chef might mix crushed biscuits with butter to create this delicious base. That's it. You're getting closer to the entire recipe. Closer? <laughs> I've caught murderers with less difficulty than this. I'll give you one last challenge. I'm sure you will be able to figure out the order I mix my ingredients in. If you can, you will have earned my recipe. Mademoiselle, solving the murder of Roger Ackroyd was easier than this. So next we're going to do some mind mapping, and it is the recipe of the dessert. That's what we're going for, the recipe of the dessert. So you just got to put all the ingredients in a particular order. So first thing first is milk in number one. 
Vanilla Extract in number two. So like a flower looking thing. Yeah, it kind of looks flowery. It's beautiful. It's vanilla. Next up is flower. So third will be flower. The fourth is going to be sugar. Sugar. Beep, 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 beep. Number five is going to be orange peel, and then six will be eggs. I'm right again. That happens to me a lot. As promised, my recipe is yours. Give me five minutes to write it down for you. Thank you. I am in your debt. So, time to do some more observationing and perving. It's not called perving, it's called observationing um, on everyone else. So, first of all, we're going to interact with the lady on the left here. Her name is Hildegard Schmidt. So, basically, we're just going to do um, a couple of character... Not assassinations, character... You know what I mean. I did not mean to offend. You didn't like the meal? The lobster, it was undercooked, and the potatoes were too dry. I expect, being Princess Dragomirov's assistant, you must be used to eating well. Cooking is an art. You do not need to wear the chef's hat to be an artist. What is your favorite dish? Curry roast. It is a specialty of mine. Character analysis, not assassination. So, first of all, she, you can probably tell she is German. She is 33, incredibly. I'm 33 and I'm youthful and hunky. And the profession is assistant. So that is Hildebrand, uh, Hildegard Schmidt. That's the right answer. So we're going to have a look at Hector McQueen here on the right-hand side in the old yellow shirt. Now... This idea, this whole train idea and having random people sit together, if they're on their own, I guess that's about 90% of people's hell. Like, what, what, what would be the thing that makes you really hellish? Sitting together with a stranger and having to uh, make small talk, etc. Anyway, McQueen here is American, he's 40, and his profession is the secretary. Voila. Here you are, sir. My recipe. Please tell Mr. Book he should not expect my recipes for the other desserts. Thank you very much, mademoiselle. I know he will sincerely appreciate the gesture, and I will make certain he gets the message. Poirot, you were gone such a long time. It proved more challenging than I expected. This is wonderful. Did it require the use of your little grey cells? More the exercise of my little taste buds. Thank you so much, my friend. Eat your dessert. You've earned it. Good evening. My name is Ratchet. I think that I have the pleasure of speaking to Mr. Hercule Poirot, is that so? You have been correctly informed, monsieur. Your exploits are well known on my side of the Atlantic. In my country, we come to the point quickly. Mr. Poirot, I want you to take on a job for me. Are you interested in earning a lot of money? My clientele, monsieur, is limited nowadays. I undertake very few cases. Why, naturally, I understand that. And the last one here is businessman with a hell of a forehead on him. I'm going to call him Mr. Sixhead. Is Samuel Ratchet. So, nationality is American. Uh, so, yep, yeah, there's American. Age will be 62. If that passes for 22, well, I'm going to cut my own titties off. Uh, but, yes, age 62. And then the profession is businessman. 
And then after this, we can finally go and get the final golden moustache of the level. My little grey cells did not let me down. What is it you wish me to do for you, Monsieur uh, Ratchet? Mr. Poirot, I am a rich man. A very rich man. Men in that position have enemies. I have an enemy. Monsieur, in my experience, when a man is in a position to have, as you say, enemies, then it does not usually resolve itself into one enemy only. Yes, I appreciate that point. Enemy or enemies, it doesn't matter. What does matter is my safety. My life has been threatened, Mr. Poirot. Now, I'm a man who can take pretty good care of himself. But as I look at it, a little insurance wouldn't hurt. And remember, big money. I regret, monsieur, that I cannot oblige you. What's wrong with my proposition? If you will forgive me for being personal, I do not like your face, Mr. Ratchet. Oh. If you wouldn't mind, I'd like to finish my coffee peacefully. To be fair, that is a hell of a clap back there from Poirot. I don't like your face, so I'm not going to do your work. Incredible. Right, so let us go continue on. This is where the kitchen area is. We're not going into the kitchen, just around the corner by the toilet door, the WC door. We're going to go inside, and it is going to be directly in front of us, just hanging off the toilet. Nobody's definitely put any um, pooping germs on there. Is, is pooping germ a German word for anything? Oh, poopin germ. Uh, anyway, so once you've got that, then that should be three out of three for the level. So seven out of 40 all together. Then we can just start heading all the way back to go to our compartment, 202. And we are going to speak to Mr. Faucher by the bar. A nightcap, Monsieur Poirot? A cup of coffee, Monsieur Faucher. Then I will retire to my new compartment. I'm sure you will find it to be most comfortable. We have stopped? Yes, sir. Belgrade Station. If you'd like to go out and get some fresh air, now is the time. The train leaves at 9.15. No, no, I see that it is snowing. I will not seek out the fresh air. Probably a wise decision. May I suggest a chocolate to accompany your coffee? It is produced by my father, the best chocolatier in Switzerland. I would never refuse a chocolate with such high recommendation. I know you will enjoy it, and please let me know if there is... I mean, I'll take chocolate, but uh, I'm happy with Galaxy, and Kinder Bueno Whites are my favourite. Right, so Jean Farcher, he is Swiss, he is 28, and he is, as you can probably tell, a control... a bartender. Yeah, close enough. So once you've done this, we will continue going forward to our compartment 202, where we will also talk to McQueen and Mrs. Hubert on the way. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Is there anything you require, monsieur? No, merci. Why, I thought you'd left us. You said you... You misunderstood me. But, man, your baggage, it's gone. It has been moved into another compartment, that is all. Oh, I see. I wish you a good night, Monsieur Poirot. Good night. I hope you'll sleep well and that your head will be better in the morning. It is just the cold. I'm now making myself a cup of tea. I hope it'll warm you up. I hope so. Good night. Well, good night, my dear. What a brave girl. On the other hand, that man there in the next cabin, Monsieur Ratchet. He scares the hell out of me. There's something wrong about that man. My daughter always says I'm very intuitive. When Mama gets a hunch, she's dead right. 
That's what my daughter says. And I've got a hunch about that man. He's next door to me, and I don't like it. I put my bags against the communicating door last night. <laughs> I thought I heard him trying the handle. Well, whoever you are, I'm going right to bed to read. Good night. Good night, madam. Whoever I am. Monsieur Ratchet seems very upset. Oh, did old Seven Head lick a bit furious there? And I think he did. Anyway, we are going to interact with our bed to go to sleep, except the mind of a detective never shuts you off. Real bed, fit for a king, or a very tired detective. Although, to be fair, if you're not actually getting into the, uh, under the blanket, you're probably going to be cold. So what we're going to do then is, if we look down to the right of us, we're going to check our mobile, uh, where it'll say 12.37, so we haven't been asleep that long. So, press the B button to go back, inspect the door, and then after the cutscene, go back to sleep. Monsieur Ratchet? Ce n'est rien, je me suis trompé. And after not even an hour later, we are going to once again in, uh, check our mobile there, quarter past one. God, this is the worst kind of sleep, by the way, when you're waking up every half hour or so. So we're going to inspect the door. This time we're going to speak to Mr. Michel, and then we're going to go back to sleep. The American lady? Yes, don't worry. You'll know how Mrs. Hubbard is. Imagine to yourself the time I have had with her. She insists, but insists, that there is a man in her compartment. Just imagine it, monsieur. In a space of this size, where would he conceal himself? I argue with her. I point out that it is impossible. She insists. She woke up and there was a man there. And how, I ask, did he get out? and leave the door bolted behind him. But she will not listen to reason. Hmm. That one does not leave time to listen. The train has stopped, Mr. Michel. We have run into a snowdrift. Heaven knows how long we shall be here. I remember once being snowed in for seven days. Where are we? Between Vinkovsky and Broad. Oh la la. It's time for me to go back to bed. I wish you a good night, monsieur. Or what is left of it. And why not dress yourself up, dress yourself up in a red kimono and uh, run up and down the uh, hallways? Why not? It's fun. Anyway, that is the end of chapter one. I do not like your face, Mr. Ratchet. Again, a uh, pretty fantastic insult. Uh, that achievement will unlock, and then we're on to chapter two, Le Trapode. The train is still stuck and the snow continues to fall. I should have taken an airplane. 
Well, I must make the best of it and join the other passengers for breakfast. Oh, that is quite unfortunate. But right, so what we're going to do is inspect our toiletries. Uh, so it's going to be a little mustache comb. I mean, to be fair, you know, there's going to be a tongue of some sort as well. You know, mustache curler. The funny thing, you know, women have got a lot to do when they do the makeup and stuff. But I tell you what, if you want to tame an unruly mustache beard, oh, it's, 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 it's a lot more science involved. I can't explain it, but it's just a lot of science. So after you've done all of that, then we can now head out of our cabin, head to the left and speak to Mr. Michel. Or if you're proper, you know, proper British, you call him Mr. Michael. Good morning, Monsieur Michel. Good morning, sir. Please enjoy our special breakfast in our restaurant. So, well, I guess that's where we're going to head then. It's time for breakfast. I wonder if there's anyone in the bar having a little bit of uh, liquid courage in the morning. It's the Italian, Mr. Foscarelli. Um, uh, yeah, just everyone. Yeah. Anyway, so ignore all the drunk cards right there. Head through into the bar, and then we're going to inspect the piano first of all. Beautiful. Uh, we're going to speak to Princess Dragomirov. Is it not? I am Russian. Snow is no stranger to me. Ah, the accent. Would it be St. Petersburg? You are very perceptive. Monsieur Poirot, is it not? And may I take it I have the honour of addressing Princess Natalia Dragomirov. We dance with the old titles these days. My husband, all of my past, was taken from me by these Stalinists. When they were gone, I became director of the St. Petersburg Museum of Antiquities to restore and preserve what I can of my country's history. Still, the delay must be vexing. If I must be late for my appointments, then they will wait. I know that I would certainly wait, madame. It has been my extreme pleasure to make your acquaintance, madame. Au revoir, Monsieur Poirot. Next up, we're going to go ahead and speak to Miss Debenhams, the old English British lady who owns Debenhams. I, I, I just made that up. But that's how I think most things are named these days, like Boots. Mrs. Boots made Boots. Mr. Toys R Us made Toys R Us. Mr. KFC made KFC. You know, it, it, it wouldn't make sense. Well, that old lady, for instance. You have probably noticed her. She just has to lift her little finger and ask for something in a polite voice, and the whole train runs. It runs also for my friend Monsieur Bouc, but that is because he is a director of the line, not because he has a masterful character. You don't have to have a strong will when you have power. But I suspect I did not need to tell you that, Mr... Poirot. Mr. Poirot. And finally, in here, go ahead and speak to Mr. Faucher, or Jean. Faucher, you have early customers, I see. Yes, I am stuck serving here as well at breakfast. Everyone is impatient. They keep complaining that the train is not moving. As if I could get out and push it. It's too early for me to order a boxcar. That is the appropriate drink, I believe. A gin, triple sec, lemon and grenadine mix. A drink for a train indeed. But not, perhaps, for my breakfast. I think I will settle for an omelette. Good luck, sir. Miss Nielsen is helping to serve in the dining car. So then, let us now head to the restaurant car, straight in front of us, of course. We are going to be speaking to Mr. Michael and Captain Nico Bellic Arbuthnot. Uh, the Arbuthnot one is automatic, so... Um, yeah. Are we expected to be strange? Yeah, we'll just uh, speak to Captain Arbuznot. That fellow there with the moustache, he may know something. Excusez-moi, sir. Yes? Monsieur Bouc asks for you to join him in compartment 203. Uh, look here, Poirot. Can you tell us anything? I can tell you the snow, it will not move aside on its own. Of course. But you obviously have some influence with Book. I am going to see him now. I will ask him if he has any information. Yes, let me just investigate the snow, Nico. Jesus. Anyway, before heading back to compartment 203, we're going to go into the kitchen. 
which we can do, unsupervised and everything, and uh, the golden moustache is to the right of you in the sink. So that's golden moustache, one out of three for the level, and then eight out of 40 overall. So from here, we can head all the way back to first class and go to compartment 203 to speak to Mr. Croissant Head. My good friend, come in. We have need of you. What has occurred? A passenger lies dead in his bed. Stabbed. A passenger? Which passenger? In there. He's an American. A man called Ratchet. It was his valet masterman who was worried that Mr. Ratchet was not awake yet. Pierre Michel, the conductor, decided to break in and found the body. I see. Well, my friend, I think it is best not to touch anything and wait for the police to arrive. Oh, I tried to call the police, but there is no cell tower for many kilometers. We could be stuck in this snow for hours. The murderer is with us. On the train, now! The sooner we catch him, the sooner we'll be out of danger. The Dr. Constantine is already examining the body. Mon ami, this is not a missing train ticket. We must follow procedure. We must wait for the police to secure the crime scene. Please, Poirot. I will take full responsibility. Book, you ask. Well, if we cannot contact the outside world, then... Oh, you are going to drive me crazy. In truth, this problem intrigues me. I was reflecting not half an hour ago that many hours of boredom lay ahead whilst we are stuck here. And now, a problem lies ready to my hand. You accept, then? C'est entendu. You place the matter in my hands. And here, the murder begins. So we're going to go into room 203, <clears throat> excuse me, and we're going to speak to Dr. Constantine. Now, the one thing that I really enjoyed about this game, this isn't just a case of somebody's murdered, who done it, job's end, that's it. It's like, it's twist upon twist upon twist, and it is a genuinely, genuinely, fantastically written story. I do not intend to perform a full autopsy, but a preliminary examination should be of some use. Of course. May I have a look? Then we can compare notes. Please. If you need any help, I won't be far away. So a bit of character analysis coming up now. Although he speaks very poshly and Britishy, he is actually Kenyan-y. So a nationality there, Kenyan. His age is 47. Does look like a lovely 25-year-old as a 47-year-old. And the profession, of course, is doctor. So now we're going to be doing some inspecting, including all the stuff on the body and etc. etc. That was easy. So first things first, what we're going to do, look around and inspect the broken door chain, which will obviously tell you that it was a door chain and now it's broke. Mm. And then after this, we're going to turn around and inspect Ratchet's body. So, once we get here, then we're going to look at the left and look at the glass on the nightstand. I'm sure I will find some interesting things inside. Obviously, you have to actually interact with something until you get the little grey icon there. Um, so, obviously, just, just remember that one. Zoom in a little bit and interact with the cell phone or the mobile phone. Uh, it looks a little... Ah, it looks a little smashed, doesn't it? So there's a bit of a vape liquid on the floor, and of course, vape is all the rage these days. Oh, a bit of uh, banana strawberry flavor. In fact, I've seen a funny meme. Um, somebody actually left a comment on a one of Amy Winehouse's videos and said, Miss you, Amy. If you were about, you would have loved vaping. Specifically, strawberry flavor or something like that. Like, hmm. Yes. Good to see that's intact. Anyway, uh, next, the handkerchief on the floor, as you can see, with the letter H embroidered on it. And then we'll back out of this, and there's going to be a gun underneath the pillow. 
So that's what we're going to check next. Ignoring the Wolverine hairy palm hands on Ratchet to interact with the gun. And then after this one, we are going to interact with the stab wounds. And wanted to be ready, yet it was no use to him. I will leave it here for the police. As you see, the victim has been stabbed many times. Several alone would have been fatal. Yes, I agree. An attack most savage. I will, of course, prepare a complete report on my findings. Thank you. And for the final thing on here, just have a look at Ratchet's broken watch. Still not done. Still going to find a. Uh, still going to find a few things. Which may seem confusing now, but will make all the more sense later on. But like I said, there's a lot of twists and turns in this game, and I really, really did enjoy it. Uh, so that's the Broken Watch done, so we can back out of Ratchet's body. Uh, didn't mean it quite like that. So have a look at the bin just behind you there to inspect the torn photo. Here's a picture of a stuffed cat. And then we can back out of this. And we will now interact with the sleeping pills. So, so just in front of us, there's going to be a couple of things to inspect. Not um, Dr. Constantine, but there it is. So we're going to interact with the sleeping pills here. Sometimes it would be nice to just sleep for dead long. Uh, next, interact with the safe. So obviously we don't have the number yet, but we will in just a moment. Um, so once you've interacted with that, we can then interact with the suitcase at, uh, just above. But you're gonna have to do the work and open it up. Lazy bitch. Uh, I'm trying, just joking, of course. So, uh, check it up. What you're gonna see is, uh, some clothes and then the document in the, um, just in the upper right there. Not exactly the reading material one would expect of a man like Ratchet. So once we are done with this, head slightly... Well, we're going to interact with the window first uh, to have a look outside. And then after this, we're going to turn to the right and inspect the door latch. So they're basically into joining rooms. This door communicates with compartment 204. The latch is open on this side. And now we have the number uh, for the safe. So inspect, uh, interact with the safe again and enter the code 1980. So 1980. And there we go. And there's a couple of things we're going to interact with in here as well. It's going to be the money, the letter, the diary and the postcard in the diary, so interact, look, and think, Jesus Christ, what could I do with a bunch of hundred dollar bills all stashed up like that? Delicious. Ratchet had an appointment he will never keep. Ah, a meeting place on the back of a postcard. Someone with the initials A.W. Hmm, unusual letter this. Well, that was quite the ominous letter, wasn't it? Right, speak to Doxter, Doxter, Dr. Constantine again. Sorry, and you're going to have to go through again all the dialogue options, and then we're going to have to restore the torn picture after this. I know your movements last night. I share compartment 101 with Mr. Book. He would not stop talking about his beloved train. I listened to him for hours talking about his Orient Express. My friend Book will no doubt confirm this. 
Did you know the victim? Not at all. I noticed him last night at dinner, but I did not pay much attention. Did you touch anything in here this morning? I checked for a pulse. There was none. Rigor mortis had commenced. The body was cool to the touch. I touched nothing else. What can you tell me about the victim? He died from multiple stab wounds of varying angles and depth. More than one would have been fatal. I would place the time of death roughly between midnight and 2 a.m. With more time, I hope I can be more precise. I assume the open window complicates matters. Indeed. Conditions are not perfect. Thank you for your help, Doctor. When did he die, Doctor? Last night, mate. I just said. Right, so there's two that we can do. One is the murderer's way out, but the first of all, if you go to the left, again, you can press the left bumper or right bumper to switch mystery. We are actually going to restore the torn picture first. So it's literally just a picture of a cat. There's nothing too difficult. Um, rotate it with the X button. Yeah, it should be easy enough, so just follow along or skip to the end after in about 30 seconds or so. For Daisy. Hmm, interesting. My little gray cells did not let me down. Right, so that one is done. So now we are going to go to the murderer's way out. Which is basically just um, picking a couple of different things. So the first of all is the chain on the hall on the door is broken. And Mr. Michel broke open the hall door this morning. So Mr. Michael broke open the door hole this morning. Yeah, Britain. Uh, next up, there is a connecting door leading to the adjacent room. There is a connecting door leading to the adjacent room. So we'll pick that one first. And then the connecting door is not latched. So that'll be two out of three done. And finally, we, first one we're going to pick is the window is open. And then the train is stopped, trapped in the snow. So, the murderer must have exited through Madame Hubbard's room. Et voilà! Next up, we are going to choose the witnesses of the escape. And it's going to be Mrs. Hubbard, Mrs. Hubbard, and Mr. Michael, Mr. Michel. That's the right answer. And then next up, we're going to go to recap events, which should be at the bottom there. So recap events. So first of all, glass containing dregs of powder was found next to Ratchet. So the cup icon and a box of sleeping pills was found in the bedroom. So that's the obviously pills icon. Grabbing pills. Pills, pills, pe 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 pills. Next up, Ratchet had a gun under his pillow. So the gun icon there, and letter threatening Ratchet was found in his safe. So that's obviously the letter. And then next up is Ratchet drank sleeping pills the night of the murder. So Ratchet drank sleeping pills the night of the murder, and Ratchet was on his guard. And that will do that one.
I can't imagine Ratchet taking a sleeping pill if he feared for his life. That was easy. And next up, we're going to do Ratchet's employees, which we would probably already know. So go to Ratchet's employees and then choose Mr. McQueen and Mr. Masterman. That's a hell of a tongue twisting name, but he's posh, bald and English. Mr. Masterman. Master 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 Man. Master Mustaman. Anyway, with that one done, we are now going to leave this. So after this, we'll press the B button to go back and we will talk to uh, Monsieur Croissant Head. I think I've seen everything I need at the moment. I am counting on you to finish your analysis. I'll have a more detailed report for you as soon as I can. So, Poirot, did you find anything out? It's a bit early for the handcuffs, my friend. Even for Hercule Poirot. Do not worry, mon ami. I believe our culprit has no plans to strike again. Monsieur Ratchet was the target. Of that I am convinced. Tell me, Book, how did you spend last night? This is a joke, I hope. Don't you trust your old friend? My friend, calm yourself. I must hear your story in order to corroborate other accounts. Ah, naturally. Let me see. Hmm. I went to my compartment after dinner. Uh, Dr. Constantin was already there. We talked about his career. He's a Cambridge man, you know. After university, he returned to his country and has done much good there. He was so interested in the Orient Express. I told him all the anecdotes I know. I'm not certain when we fell asleep. But it was very late. Here is what I have found out. Monsieur Ratchet was stabbed many times. I also found threatening letters in his safe. He had a loaded gun under his pillow, so he was on guard ready to defend himself. However, there was an empty glass with white residue at the bottom. I suspect a barbiturate. Perhaps he was forced to take it. In any case, I am certain he was unconscious, unable to defend himself. I also found several other items at the crime scene, possibly related to the murder. They must be investigated. By all means, Poirot. As fast as you can. I also found liquid for an electronic cigarette, but I could not find a vape. This might belong to the murderer. This criminal is an amateur. I need a list of the passengers with their compartment numbers. Pierre Michel will have it. I must interview the rest of the passengers and the staff. I'll be in the bar car if you need me. We are hours late. Soon I hope help will arrive. So let's just take a little look at that glorious moustache up close. Mmm, delicious. But we will now go and speak once again to Mr. Michael. No, Michael, no, that is so not right. Monsieur Michel, I must ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. I will do everything I can to help. First of all, tell me about yourself. Very well. My name, as you know, is Pierre Michel. I am from Calais. I have been with the company for over 15 years. Thank you. And now we can finally character analyze uh, Mr. Michael. So, he is obviously French. His age... <laughs> I mean, if this is what 17-year-olds look like, then count me dead. Uh, no, he is 57, of course, and he is the controller, so confirm that one. Et voilà. Can you provide me with a listing of the passengers and their rooms, please? Yes, certainly. Are you a smoker? Indeed. Do you smoke e-cigarettes? No. Tobacco only. I would like to reconstruct with your help the events of last night. Monsieur Ratchet retired to bed. When? Almost immediately after dinner, sir. Actually, before we left Belgrade. Did anybody go into his compartment after that? His valet, monsieur. Monsieur Masterman, and then his secretary, the young American gentleman, Monsieur McQueen. And that is the last time you saw or heard of him? No, monsieur. 
You forget that Monsieur Ratchet rang his bell around 12.40 a.m., soon after we had stopped. I knocked at the door, but he called out in French, Ce n'est rien, je me suis trompé. I then left to answer another bell that had just rung. Where were you at 1.15 a.m.? I was sitting on my little seat at the end of the car, facing up the corridor. Are you sure? I left a little after 1 a.m. to speak about the snow with my colleague Jean in the bar car. I came back later. There was a call. I remember speaking to you. Indeed, I remember. Carry on. It was the American lady, Madame Hubbard. She thought she saw a man in her compartment. Then, around 1.50 a.m., I made the bed for Monsieur Ratchet's secretary, Monsieur McQueen. He had spent the evening talking with the English Captain Arbuthnot. At 2 a.m., I returned to my place and stayed there until dawn. What is the last station where we stopped? Vinkovsky. Could someone have come on board? Possibly. I was very busy. Owning to the weather, we were a few minutes late. We left at 12.10 a.m. And after the long, long-winded conversation, we are now going to press the white button to go back into our mind map and go to Mr. Michel's activity. So what we're going to do, first of all, it's going to be uh, midnight. Mr. Michel smokes on the station platform of Vinkovsky. So put that, of course, to the first slot, as it were. And now 12.10 a.m., you're going to look for Mr. Michel returns to the train and the train leaves Vinkovsky. There it is. So 12.40, the train is stuck by the snowdrift. Ratchet calls, Mr. Michel. That one, yep, that's the one. And obviously, the uh, next one is already there, which is Mr. Michel leaves the bar car. 1.20 a.m., you're going to look for Mrs. Hubbard, calls Mr. Michel, then he speaks with me. The next one is Mr. Michel goes to make Mr. McQueen's bed, which is automatically there. So the last one must be Mr. Michael stays at his post until morning. Man, that is one hell of a long job. Dude does not sleep. No wonder he looks like he's about 157 for a 57-year-old. That was easy. Okay, so from here then, what we're going to do is go to compartment 204 now. So we're already in first class, so head to compartment 204. You're going to have a little conversation with Mrs. Ubald, and then we're going to do some... More character analyzation in ying ying. Hercule Poirot. Caroline Hubbard. What can I do for you, Mr. Poirot? I am the bearer of unfortunate news. It's obvious with all the commotion that something has happened. Madame Hubbard, I am afraid your neighbor, Monsieur Ratchet, was murdered last night. <gasps> oh my god! I knew it! I knew it! I would like to ask you some questions, but first, may I inspect your room? Of course, yes, you must. So this is the, the mother, of course, from Two and a Half Men. She looks exactly the same. But she is actually American, of course. Again, that's uh, I mean, it's an 11, 18-year-old. Uh, no, she would be 60. So American, 60, and she's a housewife. My little grey cells did not let... Right, so let's explore Mrs. Hubbard's room. First thing we're going to do is inspect the sink, the door latch, and the button on the table. So there's the sink, so we'll just interact with that one first. Uh, so you can open it up if you want, but we're going to come back and sort out this little uh, little puzzle. And, and that's what it is in this game. So there's a lot of thinking going on, but the puzzles are quite light. Uh, so with that one, go ahead and inspect the door latch to the right where it goes into Mr. Ratchet's room. And then go ahead and interact with the button on the table. It's not a button that you press, it's a button that popped off someone's jacket. Here is a jacket button. It bears the logo of the Orient Express. All right, Golden Mustache 2 out of 3 is going to be directly in front of us on the nightstand, so make sure to pick that one up. So that should be, like I said, 2 out of 3 for the level, and that should be 9 out of 40 uh, for the entirety of the GAM so far. So once again, 
Talk to Mrs. Ubald. Madame, please tell me about last night. The murderer was right here in my compartment. I woke up. All in the dark it was. I was just so scared I couldn't scream. I pressed the call button. I pressed and pressed. I heard footsteps running in the corridor, then a knock on my door. Come in, I screamed. And I switched on the lights at the same time. And would you believe it? There wasn't a soul there. You think he went back into the other compartment? How do I know where he went? I had my eyes shut tight. The conductor came in. I told the man what had happened, and he didn't seem to believe me. I asked him to search the room, but he found nothing. I told the conductor to look at the door between the compartments, and sure enough, it wasn't bolted. Well, I soon saw to that. I told him to bolt it, then and there. How is it you didn't bolt the door between the two compartments? But I had. Well, as a matter of fact, I asked that Swedish lady, um, Olsen, uh, Greta, if it was bolted, and she said it was. How was it you could not see for yourself? I was already in bed, and my toiletry bag was hanging on the hook of the door. I couldn't see the latch from where I was. What time was it when you asked her to do this for you? Oh, it must have been around 10.30 or... 10.45 p.m.? She'd come along to see if I had an aspirin. But instead of opening my door, she opened Mr. Ratchet's door by mistake. He said something quite rude, like, Not a chance, lady, you're too old. <laughs> it shocked her. She came in. I told her where to find the aspirin, and she got it out of my toiletry bag. <sighs> Poor girl, she didn't have a good night. The same could be said for Monsieur Ratchet. It appears Mademoiselle Olsen may be the last person to see Ratchet alive. Is this your handkerchief? No, not at all. Yet it is embroidered with an initial H, like your name. I don't care. It's not mine. And I would certainly never buy something so impractical as that frilly thing. So when we're asking about the button in just a moment, what we're going to choose is a train employee. There's going to be a question that says, where's this button come from? And again, we are going to choose a train employee. Table, it looks like it belongs to... A train employee. The button bears the logo of the Orient Express. Well, of course, the conductor came in last night, but he didn't go near that table. Still, it's a safe bet that it belongs to the conductor. I'll check his jacket later, to be sure. I have not finished inspecting your room, if you don't mind. All right, so we're not quite done yet, so we will go ahead, inspect the sink again, and then we will pick the toiletry bag up this time. So open it all. Yes, we're going to have a look through an old lady's things. I hope there's nothing untoward in there. No, no, no. Um, so yeah, just press the B button to pick it up. We're not actually looking to interact with it. We'll just pick it up. And then what we're going to do, just to the right of us, once we back out, we're going to place the toiletry bag on the door hook. So basically, you just need to interact with it a couple of times. And after it's done, go and talk to the Hubbard Mrs. Cupboard once again. This hook is probably where Mrs. Obaud hung her toiletry bag. I can see the latch very well from here, even with the toiletry bag attached. I'll have to clear that up with Mrs. Obaud. Mrs. Abald, you told me that the door connecting the two compartments was closed, correct? Yes, it was, as I told you. I was already in bed and my toiletry bag was hanging on the hook of the door. I couldn't see the latch from where I was. So once again, it be confrontation time. Remember, we've got to get all of these right. So the lie, the sentence that we're going to pick, is I couldn't see the latch from where I was. So I couldn't see the latch from where I was, which should be the third one there, so that is going to be the lie. And the truth is going to be latch visible. Not for a six-year-old you don't rev. Uh, latch visible, that's the truth what you are going to choose. So your memory is about as good as an Alzheimer's patient, sorry. 
bag on the mm, door. Book, as you told me. From your bed, you can easily see the latch on the door. The toiletry bag does not hide the latch at all. Are you saying I'm lying? It may have been stuck somehow in a different position. Or I may not have seen it in the darkness. Or I didn't think to look, you irritating man. Details matter, madame. A man has been most savagely murdered. You will excuse me if I attempt to separate the truth from the false. Forget my toiletry bag and focus on who entered my compartment. Probably after killing Mr. Ratchet. Madame Hubbard is a force to be reckoned with, but I suspect I'm not done with her. Thank you for your assistance, madame. Right, now it's time to leave. We're going to go ahead and speak to Mr. Michel once again. So go to the left. Speak to no, Michael, no. That is so not right, Michael. And only Formula Four, well, only Formula One fans will get that res reference, by the way. Abu Dhabi 2021. <laughs> oh. A staff jacket. Did you lose one by any chance? No, monsieur. As you can see, I have all my buttons. It is not mine. Okay, now what we're going to do is head all the way to second class and go to compartment 103 to talk to Mr. Mr. Masterman. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, so yeah, by the way, the first two chapters in this game seem to be the longest. Sort of coming in at sort of just around the hour mark. Um, after the second chapter, they do get a little bit shorter. They're sort of between 30 to 40 to 50 minutes. Uh, but if you're wondering, Jesus Christ, these chapters are getting long. The first two are quite long. So anyway, here's compartment one of three. Speak to the balding man. By the way, if you do, uh, no disrespect meant at all, because I've got the same sort of thing. But if you've got a haircut like this, where you're just bald on top and you got hair around the back, just shave it off, bruh. It's what I've done, and I've never felt so cute. Doctor, I use essential oils. If you can find my flask of clove oil in my box, I would be grateful. Fine, if you insist. I will help you. I mean, normally I'd tell you where to shove your essential oils, but, uh, well, this is a game and we must get achievements. So, uh, inspect the case, open it up, and then inspect both scales, the one just outside the box and the one directly at the back of the box. The other bottles leaving their labels illegible. I must find another way to find which one is Masterman's toothache remedy. The weighing scale is soaked in jojoba oil. It's unusable. Ah, this old scale will do the job. And that's going to pop them all out. So all we got to do then is just arrange the flasks from left to right. So it'll be, first will be black. So it's basically going to be black, green, red, yellow, blue. So again, it's going to be black, green, red, yellow and blue now that i know the order i think that i can easily guess which one is the clove oil and then what you're going to do is actually pick the third one which with the red cap that's going to be his essential oil essential clove oil yes rather so, once we've got the red topped essential oil, whatever it is, talk to Mr. Mr. Masterman again. Here is your remedy. I hope it will help. Mm, thank you very much, sir. Ah, well, I can finally speak without too much pain. I'm ready to answer your questions. You are Monsieur Ratchet's valet? Yes, sir. That is correct. Were you told that your employer was murdered? Yes, sir. A very shocking occurrence. Edward Marsden, at your service. He looks like the butler you froze in Tomb Raider 1 all those many moons ago. Right. So, somehow he's American. Uh, so, nationality American, aged 39. He looks more like 79. And then valet. So, American, 39, and valet. So, if you're 39, you know, 39, 40, and you're, looking, you're thinking you're not looking the best... Well, there's always worse, trust me. And you're goddamn beautiful. Don't beat yourself up. Anyway, go through all the dialogue options again. Uh, we're going to be coming up to another confrontation here with Mr. Master Masterman. ...as my room. 
Mr. Foscarelli. He almost immediately began snoring. What did you do then? I read, sir, and I spent a while soothing my toothache with clove oil and listening to the snoring. Did you hear anything during the night? Yes. My roommate snoring. Are you a smoker? Yes, sir. I have a cigarette now and then to relax. Tell me about your employer, Monsieur Hatchet. I've been working for him for nine months. I should not wish to speak ill of the dead, but he was uh, not a gentleman, sir. Did you know that he had enemies? Yes, sir. I heard him discussing some threatening letters, sir, with Mr. McQueen. Did he mention these letters to you? He had been reading a letter when I came in. He asked me if I was the one who put it in his compartment. I told him that I had done no such thing, and he should report it to the police at the next station. How did he respond? He laughed, sir. <laughs> You're joking. I do not joke, sir. <laughs> Forgive me. I can see you do not. Was he taking sleeping pills? Always when traveling by train, sir. He said he couldn't sleep otherwise. Last night he asked me to give him two. I did so, along with a glass of water. He dissolved them in the water. Did you see him drink the water? No, sir. I left right after I gave him the pills. Was Monsieur Ratchet a smoker? No. He finds smokers disgusting. Can you tell me again why you gave sleeping pills to Monsieur Ratchet? Yes. I gave him the pills because when he takes the train, he has trouble sleeping. The letter must have worried him. He specifically asked me to... So where is the lie this time? Well, it's actually where he says he specifically asked me to prepare the sleeping pills. So the lie is he specifically asked me to prepare the sleeping pills. Monsieur, I believe you are not telling me the truth. What? How can you say that? And the truth will be the gun. So make sure to choose gun. He received threatening letters. One, it seems, last night. Did you know he had a gun under his pillow? And even asked for my help to watch over him? I find it strange that he asked you for sleeping pills when he was afraid for his life and prepared to defend himself. I'm sure I don't know. Maybe to calm his nerves. Maybe out of habit. It makes no sense. Wait, please. Isn't it possible that Mr. Ratchet asked me to prepare the pills, but didn't plan to drink them for some reason? It is possible. But I am a student of character, monsieur, and the Monsieur Ratchet you describe is not the man I met. If you'll excuse me, my toothache is getting worse again. I'm afraid this time you must prepare your own clove oil. All right, so after speaking to Mr. Mustard Man, we're going to leave and now enter compartment 102, which should just be next door. So go to 102, we're actually going to pick up the third and final gold moustache of the level. And it's basically under the pillow on the bottom right there. You have to get very close to it if you can. Sort of have to put the camera in such a way uh, where you'll be able to pick it up. And once you have picked it up, again, should say 3 out of 3 in the top right hand corner. And that'll be 10 out of 40. Then we can go ahead and talk to Mr. McQueen and smash through all the dialogue options again. I believe I am addressing Monsieur Hector McQueen. Guilty as charged. I beg your pardon? Oh, sorry. Just an expression. Uh, my father used to say it. You must have had an interesting childhood. I am Hercule Poirot. No need to be modest. You're a detective. You are Monsieur Ratchet's secretary? I am Mr. Ratchet's secretary. Just over a year. I mainly take care of translating certain texts for him. Mr. Ratchet only speaks English. Prepare yourself for a shock. Your employer, Monsieur Ratchet, is dead. So they got him after all. What do you mean? You are assuming he was murdered? I know he had enemies. What can you tell me about Monsieur Ratchet? He was American. He was an antiques dealer. I don't know much more. Mr. Ratchet never talked about himself or his life, but... I think Ratchet wasn't his real name, and he left the United States to run away from something. 
or someone. Yes? He started getting letters. Threatening letters. Do you still have them? I have one. Did you know that Monsieur Ratchet had asked for my help? Asked you? No, I didn't know. He knew he was in danger. When did you last see him? Last night around 10 o'clock, I should say. Did you like your employer, Monsieur McQueen? No, I did not. He was, I'm sure, a, a cruel and dangerous man. Can you tell me your movements last night? I went back to my compartment. I read a little. In Belgrade, I went out onto the platform to smoke, but it was cold. I quickly went back in. I then went to Mr. Ratchet's compartment to take some dictation for him. I left around 10 o'clock. I saw Captain Arbuthnot. We ended up chatting in my compartment. Then we went out on the platform to quickly stretch our legs at Vinkovsky. He left around 2 o'clock. Thank you. I will need to check Monsieur McQueen's story with Captain Arbuthnot. I found a diary in Monsieur Ratchet's safe. Did you know about it? I kept a business appointment book, but I know he had a personal diary as well. That looks like it. Are you a smoker? Yes, I smoke cigarettes. I've tried to quit, but no luck. Can you give me this letter, please? Of course. Here it is. Was Monsieur Ratchet a smoker? No, no. He hated the smell of smoke. T time to die? Right, so press Y to go into the mind map. We are going to choose Ratchet talks to Mr. Michel first. So Ratchet talks to Mr. Michel. So interact with that one. And then we are going to do Ratchet apparently spoke in French during the night of the murder. And Ratchet only speaks English. So that is the first one done. And then it's Ratchet called Mr. Michel at 12.37 a.m. And it's not Ratchet who spoke to Mr. Michel. The murderer may have impersonated Ratchet by calling Monsieur Michel to make it seem that Ratchet was still alive at 12.37 a.m. That's the right answer. Right, so next up then, we're going to now choose the hypothesis, hypotheses of the night of the crime. So again, should be on the bottom, the hypotheses of the night of the crime. And all we're doing for this one is selecting the uh, middle option. So there's three statements to do. The most likely hypothesis is the middle one. Ratchet takes sleeping pills, blah, 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 blah. So that, that, this right here, right now, that's the one. And we're also going to do the killer avoided Mr. Michel. So there it is, just on the right. So the killer avoided Mr. Michel. And all we're choosing for this then is uh, Mr. Michel is not at his post between 1 a.m. and 1.20. 20. And Ratchet's watch is apparently broken at 1.15 a.m. That's what Ratchet's watch. And that's the only one we're going to be doing. And then we are then going to do our intuition and see who's suspect in the suspecting case. I was chatting with Monsieur Fauché in the bar car between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. The murderer could have escaped Ratchet's room without being seen. Et voilà. But we've got to go and find him. There should only be just underneath anyway, so... Uh, we're going to basically look for now is Miss Mr. McQueen um, a suspect. Basically, we're just going to say yes. So is Mrs. Hubbard a suspect? Yes, she is. According to the information, um, and it's going to be the same then for Mr. Michelle, Mr. Masterman, M Mustardhead, and Mr. McQueen. So all four of them are going to be yes suspects. Hmm, this direction looks promising. Uh, 
Very well, I choose to go this way. This appears to be a good lead. So we are actually finally getting close to the end of chapter two. Uh, but first of all, we're going to go to the bar car and talk to Monsieur Croissant Book. Uh, remember, you've got to go past second class in order to get to the bar, the restaurant and everything. So, my friend, have you found our killer? Not yet, but I will tell you what I have learned. Please. Our assassin could have gotten on the train at Vinkovsky disguised as a conductor, entered Ratchet's room and killed him. Then he walked out through Madame Hubbard's connecting door, where he lost a button from his jacket. He had to wait for Monsieur Michel to be absent. He waited too long. The train had left the station. He was trapped aboard. Indeed. He had opened the window to make it look that he'd escaped that way. However, if he waited until the train stopped again due to snow, his footprints would have been found. The murderer is still among us, on the train. There's a problem with the second-class toilets. What now? All morning passengers have been complaining that the door is locked. So I went to check. I knocked, but no one answered. I didn't think I should open it without speaking to you first. You did well, Monsieur Michel. Lead the way. I use my master key. But who is she? Is she alive? She is breathing. Then if she isn't dead, isn't she our murderer? That, my friend, is what we wow. find out. Wow! Scooby want a Scooby Snokes? No one wants Scooby Snokes. So, we are going to inspect Joanne. We are going to have a look at her... Uh, her uh, pocket, as you've just seen us do, and um, there should be something just on her head as well to inspect. Miss, can you hear me? Hmm? Hmm. She's breathing. Her pulse is strong. There is no sign of physical violence. This woman is sleeping very soundly. This woman is sound asleep. Given her location, I would say she has been drugged and deposited here. Well, at least it's not another murder on my train. The train is, of course, full. Monsieur, the list I gave you indicates that Hildegard Schmidt shares her compartment. I will want to talk to her later. For now, we will concentrate on this mysterious young lady. Let's return her to her more comfortable bed. Good idea. Pierre, locate this woman's room and fetch the doctor. Yes, sir. I will question her when she wakes up. Please, let me know what you learn. Mademoiselle Locke's compartment is 105. I suggest we return her to her more comfortable bed. Yes, hopefully she will awaken soon. A couple of things then. We are in compartment 105, so we're going to investigate first of all the cup on the table just to the right of us. Uh, you need to actually have a look inside the cup to see the same white blustery powder, which we won't go into what it is. Uh, but once you've interacted with that, you can put that down. We can t uh, Now we can check the suitcase, which is on the shelf just above us. Uh, again, we'll automatically move that one to the floor. 
And then what you can do is investigate the suitcase, basically open it up, and we will find the conductor's jacket in it. So now it's starting to get all twisty, like, what the hell is going on and who the hell is this girl? So, yeah, once we've done that, we can also then investigate the briefcase. And we're actually going to be coming up to another achievement as well, once we've done that. So basically, all we've got to do then for this is put in the code without asking book to keep quiet. So just don't interact with Senor Croissant Head at all. And the code that you're going to be putting in is 86249. So just focus on... So again, you'll have to turn it um, and click it in place. But it's going to be 8629. Again, just focus on that. Do not focus or interact with book at all. I remember my passwords. So I make them easy ones. We really need to find the combination. But of course you know what you're doing. It is booby-trapped, is it? Poirot, I'm disappointed in you. I was certain you would have it by now. So that's good. So now you should get the cheater achievement. Now we can open it up. And we're just going to interact with everything in the briefcase again, which will be the photo, ratchet's file, driver's license, gun, and badge. And that will end chapter two. And we've only got oof, 13, what, 11 chapters left. I'm getting through it. The train. This badge says that Joanna Locke is an American detective with the Berkshire Police Department in Massachusetts. An American police officer? Oh. Mademoiselle Locke seems very interested in our victim. Of course. She has studied her target. Possibly. Her driver's license confirms her identity. She is American. These are fake IDs. It's certain. The stuffed animal is the same as in the photo found at the crime scene. What a coincidence. Mademoiselle Locke appears to have been investigating Monsieur Ratchet. Look, she's waking up. Thanks to you, I would not be surprised if our murder victim were also waking up. I... what? Oh, my head. What's all the yelling about? Who are you? Give me a good reason why you should not be in handcuffs. I can give you a reason, Book. Whose handcuffs will we use? I have none. Do you? Well, I... You are Joanna Locke, mademoiselle? Yeah, yes, um... Joanna Locke. I'm, um... I'm a detective. Berkshire, Massachusetts Police. I have found your credentials, mademoiselle. And I know who you are. Mr. Poirot. Then, if the introductions are complete, perhaps the explanations may begin. I... I'll try. It's simple, really. I... I'm on the trail of a murderer. I had just been promoted to detective after five years on patrol. It was my first time on a major case. It had been a month since Daisy Armstrong was kidnapped. The Armstrongs were desperate for some sign of hope. I was there only for paperwork, to fill in some blanks. Hello, Miss Locke. Now, this is where the chapters do get a little bit shorter, so we'll actually start feeling like we're getting through the game now. So first of all, go to the, interact with the right there, have a look at the glove compartment and have the map. Um, we can now... And then after this, we'll just back it out, check the case file right next to you on the seat. And you're going to have to make sure to inspect every single page and basically have Joanna Locke, uh, Jojo here, comment on every page. How could the kidnapper know which was the window of Daisy's room? 
The misspellings are clearly on purpose, and they didn't return the child when the ransom was paid. How could the child be taken with so many people in the house? I can't imagine the pain her parents felt when they realized Daisy was gone. How are they going to... That's why I'm here. A damn computer glitch. The phone record of the night of the kidnapping. The last call was for 911. So there we go, that's done. If you haven't read everything, she basically won't leave the car, so you uh, can't really miss anything. Uh, so just go ahead, go into the house. You're going to have a little chat here with the missing girl's father. Good evening. Colonel Armstrong? Yes. You're the detective they phoned about. Joanna Locke. I don't remember you. I'm newly assigned to the case. It's about time more detectives were involved. My wife, Sonia, she... she hasn't been herself. Every day is a waking nightmare for us. Tell me you've uncovered something new. I'm here to speak to your daughter's nanny. There was a computer problem. Her earlier statement has been lost. Oh. I see. We had hoped. Well, do as you wish. So during this sad time, we're just going to sniff around your house for a couple of golden moustaches, if that's okay. Thank you, John. So uh, if you go to the right, just behind John on the shelf, right in front of us now is the first out of four golden moustaches for this level. Uh, so once you've grabbed that, go ahead and speak to Mr. Anderson again. How are you doing? Are you holding up? You know... In the military, you're supposed to have the stiffest of upper lips. The Desert War taught me that soon enough. But this, it's difficult. Damned difficult. Harder on my good lady, of course. Do you know where I can find Miss Moreau? Her room is upstairs across the hall from... Daisy's. She seldom leaves it. I won't be long. Take whatever time you need. All right, cheers, mate. That's exactly what we're going to do now. Uh, so we're going to interact with the thing on the table first. And then in the opposite corner of the room, so if we just turn the camera around to the right, on the right-hand side of the stairs, there's going to be a photo and some flowers, which we are going to interact with as well. What a dear child. Sympathy and support for the Armstrong family during this difficult time. Thoughtful, but never enough. And now we are free to just roam upstairs. So, first things first, what we're going to do is go to the right and enter Daisy's room, which is straight in front of us. Uh, the other room we can't actually enter, so we'll just go straight in front of us. Now, before speaking here to Mrs. Anderson, have a look in the toy castle for golden mustache number two out of four for the level. And that's 12 out of 40 for the game. Uh, we're going to check the toy castle as well, so we interact with that. And to the left of us, we are going to interact with the picture on the wall as well. And then we can speak to Mrs. Andy Anz. Mrs. Armstrong, my name is Joanna Locke. I'm a detective investigating the kidnapping of your daughter. May I talk to you? When is your baby due? Mrs. Armstrong? Sonia? I don't want to talk. I just want to see my daughter again. That's all that matters. The poor woman. I can't imagine how she feels. Why do I keep calling her Mrs. Anderson when they're clearly Armstrongs? Right, so choose a missing daughter and just select Daisy's photo. So there it is in the case file, page one. Select Daisy's photo. And then go ahead and speak to Mrs. Armstrong again. Mrs. Bicepstrong. Mrs. Armstrong, let me show you this. Daisy, my little Daisy, I miss her so much. How good it is to see her face. I can't imagine the pain you're feeling right now. She loved her little stuffed animal, Fluffy. She took him everywhere with her. The kidnappers took it as well. They didn't have to. That means they wouldn't hurt her, doesn't it? Every lead will be followed up. You have my word on that. Thank you. I shouldn't lose hope. Somehow. I know it isn't my case. But I just made a promise. And I mean to keep it. Do you know where I can find Miss Moreau? She's in her room. Last door on the left. May I come back? If I have more questions? Of course. Anything I can do. 
So now we are going to enter Daisy's room. We're going to stay upstairs, go straight ahead, and on the left-hand side door is going to be um, Suzanne Moreau's room. So again, just before talking to Ms. Moreau, we are going to check the train and the photo on the wall straight in front of us. So once you have spoke to her, um, done all that, speak to her, go through all the dialogue options as usual. Yes, I'm Joanna Locke, a detective working on Daisy's case. Is there any news? I'm afraid not. How can I help you? I'm really sorry. I'm afraid I have to take your statement again concerning the evening of Daisy's disappearance. There was a computer problem. Your statement was accidentally deleted. Of course. I want to help any way I can. Tell me about that night in your own words. The Armstrongs had a party to raise money for a museum, I think. Mrs. Armstrong is on her board. I was in charge of Daisy. I stayed with the little one all evening, playing with her and reading books to her. She couldn't sleep with all the noise and the comings and goings. When did you notice Daisy was missing? I was only gone five minutes to, to phone my mother. She's in the hospital. When I returned, Daisy wasn't in her bed. I thought she might have gone to look at the party. But then I saw the handsome note on her pillow. I screamed and screamed. I couldn't stop. Did you notice anything unusual before that? I was with Daisy all evening. Finally, she fell asleep. I didn't see anyone else or notice anything in particular. Do you have any idea who did this? No. I can't see who could have done such a horrible thing. The Armstrongs are such good people. Like my own family. Thank you for giving me your statement again. I'll get back to you if I have any questions. I won't be far. Okay. I have Suzanne's statement. I just need some checking. Hmm, is something adding up? I don't think so. So, let's check the facts of the file in the mind map now. Now, select the option, I noticed Suzanne was not around, but Daisy was sleeping peacefully. So it should be the second option there. Does not correspond to what Suzanne told me. Suzanne said she left. Uh, yeah. Minutes, Sorry. Yep. That was just making sure that was the correct one. It was. I noticed Suzanne was not around. So what we can do now is leave and go back into Daisy's room and speak to Mrs. Bicep Strong again. Tell me about the night Daisy was taken, especially anything about your daughter and Suzanne Moreau. Apart from seeing to our guests, I took a moment to check on Suzanne and Daisy in Daisy's room. Suzanne wasn't there, but Daisy was asleep. I sat with her for ten minutes or so. Suzanne didn't return while I was there, but there's no reason for her to sit there all night. When Daisy is asleep, I went back downstairs. Okay, the stories Sonia and Suzanne tell don't match. I should recheck my file. Right, to so go back into your mind map now and choose check the phone numbers in the file and select 10.11pm to 10.45pm. It's got the one ending with 2140. Second from bottom there, so pick that one. And then we're going to leave this room, go back into Ms. Moreau's room, and speak to her again, where we're going to get another confrontation to get completely right. If I understand you correctly, you left Daisy when she was not asleep? The party was very loud. Daisy was too wound up to sleep. I read her a motley mule detective story to try and put her to sleep. Daisy finally fell asleep. Right before motley mule solved his case in the book I was reading her. I had to make a quick phone call. No more than five minutes. But... When I came back. And the lie, what we're going to be needed to do in, uh, or the one that we're going to need to be picking, is I had to make a quick phone call, no more than five minutes. So I had to make a quick phone call, no more than five minutes. 
Are you sure you are only gone for five minutes? Five, six, what does it matter? And for the truth shall set you free, choose the phone record. You say you were only away five or six minutes, but Mrs. Armstrong says she was alone there more like 10 minutes. And the phone record shows that you stayed on the call for more than 30 minutes, way longer than you said. My mother is extremely ill. It's difficult for me. I may have lost track of time. When I came back, Daisy had disappeared. It must have been a coincidence. You have to be precise, Suzanne. A little girl's life is at stake. Why are you doing this? I didn't do anything wrong. I would never out Daisy. I need to check Suzanne's story. She's panicking. Why now? What is she afraid of? All right, so we need to be doing some reconstructing. Not of my face, not of my nose or my nips, but the facts. So first of all, we are going to put the kidnapper places a ladder under Daisy's bedroom window. The second one should already be there. Ms. Moreau makes her call. So the third one will be the kidnapper enters through the front door. Because it's a party. Uh, the kidnapper climbs the stairs will be number four. There we go. Kidnapper climbs the stairs. Boop. The kidnapper takes Daisy is going to be number five. And obviously the last one will be the kidnapper carries the girl down the ladder and is gone. Score. One for the good guys. The kidnapper places a ladder under the window to Daisy's room. Then he joins the party. Just one guest in the crowd. He somehow knows when Suzanne leaves the room, then sneaks upstairs. He opens Daisy's window, carries her down the ladder, and vanishes. Thank you, Joanna. We got this, man. We got it. Right, so, mind map again. Go down to a suffering mother and just enter in the code 2140. That's 2140. Hey, I'm a pretty good detective after all. The number you have called is not in service at this time. Please hang up and dial again, or contact your service provider. The number Suzanne called is not in service? A hospital? All right, so now we're going to do some more running back and forth. So go back into Daisy's room, talk to Mrs. Bicep Strong again. I spoke with Suzanne. She was phoning her mother. That's why you didn't see her when you went to check on Daisy. Yes, her mother. I tried to call the poor woman earlier that week, but the hospital said she's been in a medically induced coma for more than two months. Suzanne told me she called her mother, but she would have known her mother was in a coma. And then next we're going to head downstairs to talk to Mr. Bicep Strong. A lot of strong biceps in this family. I like it. Did you see Miss Moreau during the party? I remember seeing her at some point, but otherwise, no. I was too busy with my guests. Wear the smile, shake the proffered hand. Miss Moreau told me she called her mother. Well, why not? I believe they are very close, and the poor woman is not well. She needs some experimental treatment that isn't available yet in France. I won't be long. Take whatever time you need. Up the stairs we go once again. We're going to go back into Suzanne's room and speak to her again again. And we're actually going to be coming up to another confrontation. The number you called that night is no longer in service. I, I, I don't understand. That's, that's the number the hospital gave me to call my mother's room. You told me you were on the phone with your mother when Daisy was abducted. As we said earlier, I didn't pay attention and was on the phone longer than I said. But since my mother is very ill, she had to leave her hometown, Lyon, 
because the treatment is not approved yet in France. She is in an hospital in Boston for a special treatment. I call her every night to check on her. When I came back, Daisy was gone. And the lie that we're looking for then is I call her every night to check on her. So choose the option. I call her every night to check on her. Are you sure you called your mother? Yes. Every night since she was admitted in December. And then pick the option a coma. Coma, 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 chameleon. Wow. I think you really care for Daisy. If you do, then tell me the truth. You can't have been calling your mother while she's in a coma. My mom really is in the hospital in Boston. She really is in a coma. I... I wasn't calling her. I was on the phone with my boyfriend, Noah. Why lie about it? Why are you panicking? Because he's gone. I haven't heard from him since the night of the kidnapping. I'm afraid he's somehow connected to Daisy's disappearance. That he was just using me somehow. But I swear I talked to him. Yes, for more like... 30 minutes that night. So, he couldn't have kidnapped Daisy at the same time we were talking. But he could have kept you talking so someone else could take Daisy. Yes, you can see why I lied, can't you? I was afraid you'd suspect me of having something to do with it. You can understand that, can't you? Suzanne, I want to believe you, but you've made it harder to find Daisy. Do you realize that? Oh my god, what have I done? What's most important is not what you've done, but what you do now. Go. I'll be back to talk to you. No more lies, Suzanne. For Daisy. No. Oh yeah, what I forgot to say at the uh, beginning of the chapter is, oh my god, we get to play as someone other than Poirot. And Joanne runs. That's mad, isn't it? Uh, so what we're going to do is inspect the books first. So basically just going to quickly nip through each one. And it's going to be the third or fourth one in where it's going to be something different. Okay, maybe the fifth one then. Oh, maybe the sixth one. Oh, there it is. Yep, yeah, sixth one. So it's the diary that we are actually trying to go for. So you actually need to spin the diary around. And there we go. So I could have actually... Oh, uh, 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 uh. So, sorry, I think uh, we were just having a bit of a seizure or something right there. Uh, so we just interact with all the books anyway. And then back out, inspect the flowers just next to you. And then after you have inspected the flowers, mm, for, no, no, these my flowers, get away, not your flowers, man. So now we can inspect the drawers. Um, so we will inspect the top one first, and then you can just interact with the books and the glasses, or the book and the glasses. What's in the glass case? Ah, oh, big surprise. Glasses. And then the bottom one, you are going to actually interact with the tissues, the keychain, and the jewelry box. I expect Suzanne must have gone through a lot of tissues these past weeks. Um, same here, but for, I reckon, completely different reasons. Hmm. Not a lot of tissues left now. Uh, Merry Christmas! Small jewelry box. By the size, I'm guessing earrings. Why put a key in a jewelry box? E yes, so we have the key. So now we can interact with the diary again. So we interact with the bookshelf and interact with the diary. Now, what you're going to need to do is uh, obviously interact with it. You then need to spin the key around because it works with the back of the key. Very clever. And then just go ahead and read it. So go snooping. Okay, it's going to be pretty decent for a police officer. Might need to go through snooping through everyone's diary and stuff. Like, oh my god, last night I had a dream about his hairy mustache waxing my lips. Or something rather. I can see why Suzanne didn't tell me everything about this, Noah. It's clear when he disappeared that she realized something was very wrong. So 
someone that's not telling the truth, the truth and nothing but the truth. So go back downstairs and by the photo and the flowers, speak to Suzanne again. I imagine these flowers must have been beautiful. Who gave them to you? The gardener. They're getting pretty wilted, but I hate to throw them away. Tell me about your boyfriend. Have you been together long? My boyfriend? Why? He doesn't have anything to do with this. Please, Suzanne, the sooner you answer my question, the sooner we'll be done. His name is Noah Garretti. I met him at a Lunar New Year party in Great Barrington. He... He is a kind and caring person, although, well, I miss him. He had to go away on business. He should be back. Noah? Noah? Noah! Right, uh, go ahead and speak to Mr. Bicep and Mrs. Bicep upstairs once more. Boyfriend? I know she went out with someone for a while there. More recently, I saw a man in a 4 by 4 who would pick her up on her nights off. He never got out of his car, just waited for her. She did seem to spend more time than usual on the phone these past few weeks, but she worked hard. We weren't going to begrudge her what free time she had. Since Daisy... since the abduction, she keeps pretty much to herself. I won't be long. Take whatever time you need. Can you tell me anything about Suzanne's boyfriend? I know she dated our chauffeur for a while. There was someone else she'd met recently, but I don't recall his name. Broski, it's time for some more mind mapping. Press the white button, look through the file for something about a 4x4, four four, which should all, we should already be on, and then go ahead and select the page with the photo of the tire track. So the second page there, just go ahead and interact with that page, and then we can go back down, speak to Suzanne again, and we're going to come up to another confrontation. That is a great detective job. Tread marks of a four-wheel drive vehicle were found outside the garden on the night of the kidnapping. Noah drives one, doesn't he? Where is he, Suzanne? If you know anything more about him, you have to tell me. I know what you're thinking, but it's impossible. He was very nice to me. He never did anything to make me suspicious. We went out to eat to the movies. Just like a normal couple is not the only man in So, ready for the next confrontation? Of course you are. You the best. So, choose the option, he never did anything to make me suspicious. So, he never did anything to make me suspicious, apart from... He was talking about pegging a lot for some reason. I thought he just meant washing, but, uh, hmm. well, That's what I prefer. Uh, anyway, the truth is Valentine's Day. So, choose the option there, Valentine's Day. You say that Noah took you to a cabin in the mountains on Valentine's Day. You read my diary? I'm sorry, but we have to find Daisy. We both want that. So yes, I looked in your diary. I... You're right. He took me to a cabin in the woods. I waited for him in the car. He came out after a few minutes. He was very sweet and apologetic, but he never explained. We went back to the restaurant for dessert. Did you ever go back to the cabin with him? No, never. So what made Noah drive all the way to a cabin in the middle of nowhere? He left her in the car. Why was he there? This is important. I know it is. I can use Suzanne's directions to the cabin and compare them to the map of the area. No, no. Never go to the cabin in the woods. We've all seen the film. And we've all seen Chris, uh, Chris Hemsworth attempt at uh, getting out of the cabin in the woods by riding a motorcycle and then falling to his death. Um, spoiler alert, by the way, if you haven't seen that. But you should have because it's years, years, years old. Right, so back into our car. We are going to get the map from the glove compartment. 
and we basically have to find the uh well we basically have to find our way um so Thank what we're looking for then is just if you have a look at the lone sort of black square right there just to the right of where the uh big pond or big lake is or whatever this is what we're looking for again make sure to be choosing no hints anytime you're in puzzles make sure not to press the select button in order to use a hint um, which hopefully you haven't done by now so we're not quite done we are going to go into the cabin next Boo! <laughs> nah, just joking. There, there, there's no Willy here. Willy from The Simpsons. So, um, just straight in front of us here, just go ahead and interact with the chair, which is straight in front of us, and then go around and knock onto the front door. Hello? Is anyone there? Nobody. I can't just waltz in without a warrant. And it's obvious that no one's there, so go back and go to the left, which is technically the right side of the cabin here. And inspect the window first of all, and then if you turn to your right, you can also see the axe, which will be on the wood as well. So there's the window. And just to the right in this bit is the axe, so just have a little look at that. We'll be back for that in just a minute. Um, so just to the left of us in the, well, kind of looks like a double tree, two branches sticking out. This is where the next golden mustache is. So just head to the left, that tree right there. And golden mustache. Three out of four it should be for the level and 13 out of 40 for the game. So now we're going to go to the other side of the cabin, in the left of the cabin. We're going to move the barrel. Pull it all the way to the left and climb up on it to check the window. So go ahead, take a look at the deer trophy right in front of us. Deer trophy. I don't think I like you anymore. And then interact with the broken bottles or some of the bottles on the floor. Empty wine bottles. And then at the top right hand corner is the plush toy on the shelf. You can probably see where this is sadly going already. It's Daisy's plush toy. If Fluffy is here, the kidnapper has been here. I have to get inside this cabin. So now we'll back down, uh, back out, go around and pick up the axe from the uh, pieces of wood and then go to the front door and interact with it to bash, smash, crash your way in. Right, so there's Joanne with the old prostate gloves on, so now we can inspect stuff. So first thing we're going to do is just enter the small little room in the back. So go straight ahead into the room. Again, you can interact with the deer trophy if you wish, but obviously we've already done it. Um, there should be a brush just on the desk as well. So interact with the brush straight in front of us. And then after you've done this, we can inspect the bottles and the toy on the shelf again. Um, there is also the final Grand Moustache in here as well. So this one you actually do need to interact with, the bottle of wine. And again, the plush toy on the shelf. The uh, Daisy's cat again. Very, very sadly, you probably know where this is going to end up. And then go ahead, just by the... End of the bed is Grand Moustache, the golden moustache of number four. 
so you should be all good for the levels now. So, a couple of puzzles we're going to do first. Going back to the main room, what we're going to do is inspect the stove here. Nobody's been here recently. Then we're going to inspect the cards which are on the table. Some people seem to have played here before. We are then going to interact with the boxes under the window. Not those ones, but the ones behind you. So, not these ones here, uh, but there are a bunch of boxes on the windows as well. Uh, but basically, this is where we are going to find a pretty horrific discovery soon enough. But that's the box there. And then interact with the tools on the tool desk. Um, well, and then, of course, you can move the sofa and open up the hatch. Oh, gosh darn it, it's a bomb. Right, so don't worry, you're not timed or anything like that. Remember not to use hints. But what you need to do is basically um, join up the dots. So you need to, uh, we'll rotate the dials on the top to have the three dots at the bottom, uh, at the top, sorry. The bottom two to touch the sort of top one with two and one. So you basically need it, yeah, three, two and one, if that made sense. So next up then, uh, we are go just going to press uh, press the left buttons in this order. For, uh, one from the top down to four. Make sure to press two, three, and four. So two, three, and four. If you do get it wrong, don't worry. You'll just um, be able to restart it without any punishment. And then finally, you need to disconnect the correct cables. So the first one, we're going to go with the top, with the top one. We are going to... Uh, so interact with the top one and then choose the top cable. If you choose the bottom one, it's wrong. Uh, then the middle one, you are then going to unplug. Oop, we'll try that one again. Oh, no, we're going down for some reason. Uh, unstrap the middle one from the bottom, the middle cable from the bottom one, and then the middle one, interact with the bottom cable. And that will smash that one. Horrific, disgusting discovery coming up. But uh, this is the end of chapter three. Now, this genuinely, uh, this genuinely hits harder. It's it's horrible every time you hear about it on the news, anyway. But especially if you've got kids of your own, it hits way, way harder. Place and whoever opened this hatch, a wooden crate. I, I have to open it. Oh no. Daisy. No. I called in my discovery of the body. Then there was nothing I could do except protect the site for forensics. The forensics team arrived an hour later, cordoned off the cabin with crime scene tape, and went to work, looking for physical evidence, fingerprints, Testing for fluids, DNA, any clues science can uncover. They removed Daisy's body. The autopsy would take place in the morning. But I had one more stop to make. That night, I swore to find the monster who killed that child.
Ratchet uh, on train s- saw me? How? Daisy. She was awake? And then she collapsed again. I take the responsibility. She was weaker than I realized. Oh. Lie still while I examine you. Pupils dilated. I'm all right. You are far from all right. You have been heavily sedated. Your pulse is very weak. I... I have to... to finish my story. Ratchet can't escape again. Can't escape. Have no fear of that, mademoiselle. Ratchet will not escape. We must hear her story. This woman needs rest. I will let you know when she is recovered enough to continue. But I warn you, it will be some time. I understand, Doctor. Thank you. I have completed my preliminary examination of the deceased. I think that it will interest you. Indeed it will. And I have other witnesses to interrogate. You are right. Let's not put this poor woman in danger. There will be plenty of time for her to finish her story when she has recovered. By all means. Okay, so now we're going to play as the mustachioed hero once again. Uh, after the horrific, disgusting, and quite frankly, horrifying discovery. Uh, so first of all, obviously Joanna is American. She is 32, and she is a police detective. That's the right answer. Can you estimate the time of death? Rigor mortis was advanced, but not complete. I estimate the death occurred between midnight and two in the morning. Hmm, that tallies with the witness statements I've collected so far. What is the cause of death? Multiple stab wounds to the upper torso. It's odd there are no signs of a struggle that might indicate one of the first wounds was enough to kill him. It seems that Monsieur Ratchet had taken sleeping pills during the night. Ah, that would explain the lack of defensive wounds. Mr. McQueen and Mr. Masterman told me that Monsieur Ratchet didn't smoke. Can you confirm this? I can't say without a more extensive post-mortem. What can you tell me about the stab wounds? I counted twelve in all. One or two are so slight as to be practically scratches. On the other hand, these three would be capable of causing death. The angle of the wounds is instructive. Most appear to have been struck by a right-handed person. But you see this one under the right armpit. It's not a deadly blow given the depth, but a right-hander couldn't have done it. It was most certainly struck with the left hand. So, our murderer is left-handed. No, it is more difficult than that, is it not? As you say, Mr. Poirot, some of these other blows are just as obviously right-handed. Could the assassin attack and then move the body for some reason before finishing. Monsieur Poirot, I can assure you that the body has not been moved. Well, then we are left with the hypothesis of a second murderer. Do you see another explanation? That is just what I am asking myself. Have we here a bizarre coincidence or what? Thank you, Doctor. Excellent work under difficult circumstances. Please let me know when I may speak again with Mademoiselle. Right, so for the next couple of questions then, what we're going to do... So the first one is ask passengers if they smoke. Smoko Loco, the Snoop Doggy Doggy, who, will never quits, uh, who would never quit smoking. 
no, <laughs> but a very good marketing ploy there by Mr. Dog. Uh, next up is Remember People I Have Seen Smoking. So Remember People I Have Seen Smoking. And for the final one, the answer is going to be Ask Someone Who Smokes A Lot If They Know A Vape Smoker. So for the final one, like I said, it's Ask Someone Who Smokes A Lot If They Know A Vape Smoker. Yes, I suppose it's likely they will give me the list of who smokes what. I'm right again. That happened. Right, we're not quite done yet. We're going to go back into the mind map. There it is. And we're going to go down to Mislock and Ratchet. So the question is, what are the links between Mislock and Ratchet? Uh, the first one, a photo of Daisy's stuffed animal. You're going to put that to photo of Daisy's stuffed animal in Ms. Locke's suitcase. Then the next one is going to be Ms. Locke as a police officer. And join that up with Ratchet was probably immersed in a shady business. And then, of course, the final one is Ms. Locke hid from Ratchet and Ms. Locke was spying on Ratchet on the platform. Et voilà. So we're not quite done, we're going to go over to Who Smokes? Who smoked the smoky smokes? I'll tell you who smokes. Mrs. Hubbard does not smoke. So first of all, Mrs. Hubbard does not smoke. Mr. Michael, that isn't so not right, does smoke. So there he is, smokes. Mr. Mustard Man, next up, also smokes. And Mr. McQueen, Mr. Freddie Mercury himself, without the mustache and without the um, without the AIDS and everything, he smokes too. Right, so for the final time, talk to Dr. Constantine. We're all done with this bit now. We can back out, talk to Dr. Constantine and go ahead and leave. How is Mademoiselle Locke, Doctor? Her vital signs are improving, but she is still unconscious. I understand. Thank you for looking after her. And leave we shall. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, we can have a little cheeky look out the window. Hmm, train still hasn't left. Get me off this train with moiters! So now we're going to go to compartment 106, first of all. And nothing's gonna good is going to happen here, so we're going to go straight to the lounge slash bar car after this. Questions for me? I'm grateful you found my ticket, Poirot, but now is not convenient. Hmm, I certainly didn't expect such a resistance. Most of the passengers pass by the bar during the day. They eat, drink, write. Maybe I can use this information for my investigation. So we're going to have to answer a question. How can you find out who is left-handed? Uh, the answer is going to be ask Mr. Fauchier to observe the hands of the passengers. Nice. The next one is going to be ask everyone to write something. Zervent young man, wee wee wee, ha ha ha. Wine and cheese. Sorry, that's very prejudiced against the French. I'm very sorry. I was just, it's just joking. So ask everyone to write something. Yes, if I ask them to write something trivial, they may do it instinctively with their dominant hand. And finally, choose for people I have tested before. Remember if they use their right or left hand. Good job. Yes, I will remember which people use their right or left hand. Et voilà. Mademoiselle Debenham, I have a few questions for you. Of course. 
Let's start with your movements last night. There's little to tell. I went to bed and slept. Did you know the man who was killed? I saw him for the first time during lunch yesterday. Did you notice anything about him? Well, if I believed in auras, I might say he seemed dark. So we're going to get an option here. I mean, there probably could have been an easier way to do this. Can you write down some details or something? But make sure to choose right-handed rather than... Can you write down your address just in case I need to... You know, it could have been write down your email address or something, you know? But uh, our Poirot is very... Uh, oh, he's a very uh, smooth, charismatic man. Anyway, carry on speaking to Ms. Debenham. Then we're going to go and speak to Ms. Olsen, who is also right-handed. That confirms what Madame Hubbard told me. Do you smoke by any chance? No, I never have. Do you own a scarlet nightgown? No, it isn't mine. Whose then? I don't know. What do you mean? You do not say, I have no such thing. You say, it isn't mine, meaning that you know who it belongs to, am I correct? Oh, I see. No. I woke up this morning about 5am with the feeling that the train had been standing still for a long time. I opened the door and I saw someone in a scarlet kimono some way down the corridor. Her back was turned. It was impossible to see who it was. I understand. Thank you for your assistance, mademoiselle. Mademoiselle, I am sorry to disturb you, but I need to ask you a few questions. Are you the investigator? I am. We are lucky you are on the train. What do you want to know? I hear, Mademoiselle, that you were the last person to see the murdered man alive. I do not know. It may be so. I opened the door of his compartment by mistake. I was much ashamed. It was a most awkward mistake. You actually saw him? Yeah. He was reading a book. And what did you do after that, mademoiselle? I went in to the American lady, Mrs. Hubbard. I asked her for some aspirin, and she gave it to me. I usually carry extra aspirin for the refugees. Oh, yeah, we haven't analysed this character yet, have we? So let's get ahead and do that. Greta Olsen, at your service. So she is Swedish, even though sometimes she does sound a bit Welsh. Welsh-Swedish, I think. Uh, she's 46. Good looking, 46. Very youthful and nurse she is as well. I'm right again. That up. Did Mrs. Hubbard ask you whether the communicating door between her compartment and that of Monsieur Ratchet was bolted? Yes. And was it? Yes. And after that, what did you do? After that, I went back to my compartment, took the aspirin and lay down. That was around 10.50 p.m. Is there anyone else in your compartment? Yeah. A young English lady. Very nice. Very amiable. After the train left Vinkovsky, did she leave the compartment? No, I am sure she did not. Why are you so sure, if you were asleep? I sleep very lightly. I am used to waking at a sound. I am sure that if she had come down from the berth above, I should have awakened. Did you yourself leave the compartment after that? Not until this morning. Do you have a scarlet silk kimono, mademoiselle? No, indeed. I have a good comfortable dressing gown of Jaeger material. Do you smoke, mademoiselle? No, I can't stand the smell of tobacco. Perhaps you will be so amiable as to write me down your address. With pleasure. Mademoiselle Olsen is indeed right-handed. 
This was a very interesting conversation, mademoiselle. I thank you. If you have any other questions, I'll be in my compartment. Good luck, Mr. Poirot. So, thank you, Mrs. Hergen Schlergen. Uh, right, so what we're going to do, just before we go to the bar, we are going to go to the mind map here and go to a contradiction. So, there it is. Choose a contradiction. Now, choose, according to Miss Olsen, Miss Debenham slept through the night. So, according to Miss Olsen, Miss Debenham slept through the night as her understaffed minimum wage employees got nothing and got shouted at by customers. And then choose Miss Debenham saw the woman in the red kimono. And that's that for a contradiction. Uh, so you can include that one. And then next we are going to go and find tracking dominant hands in the mind map. Mademoiselle Debenham getting out of bed. She even made a point to tell me the opposite. That was easy. And just choose both options as right-handed. So Mrs. Hubbard and Mr. Michael, that is so not right. Both right-handed. Right. I'm right again. That happens. Alright, so once we're done with this, we're actually now going to head inside the bar itself. And we're going to do some more observing of people. So, we basically now need to observe uh, Mr. Foscarelli, Mr. Hardman, and Ms. Schmidt after we speak to Foscher. Again, who is going to be right-handed, by the way. It is, of course, about the murder of Monsieur Ratchet. Can you tell me your movements last night? I understand. Yesterday evening, I took a break at Vinkovsky Station with Hotaru. We then went to our quarters in the staff accommodations, a section of the luggage car. Freya was there, reading, and I went to bed right after. Freya is there now, I think, and Hotaru is in the kitchen. They can verify my story. What time was this? 11.30 p.m. or a bit after. The snow is beginning to fall heavily. I see. Thank you. Can you write your address on this paper, please? You want to pay me a visit? <laughs> Who knows, Monsieur Fauché? He is right-handed, there can be no doubt. Are you a smoker? I'm trying to quit, but yes. I'm now down to just one pack of cigarettes a week. If you're looking for a heavy smoker, you should talk to Hutaru. Thank you, Monsieur Fauché. I'll come back to you if I have more questions. So again, like I said, go ahead and observe Foscarelli, Mr. Hardman, and Ms. Schmidt, who, once again, are going to all be right-handed. So once, once they are all observed, we can now press the Y button, go into the mind map, and find dominant hand of bar car passengers. And again, choose all three that are right-handed. That's the right answer. So, you thought we forgot about golden mustaches? Uh, no, no. Let's go to the storage just behind the bar here, and just to the left is going to be the first out of three for the level, golden mustaches. So once you've picked that one up, we can now go to the restaurant and talk to Mr. Croissant himself. The old pastry head. So, Poirot, I hope you are progressing in your investigation. I have not finished yet, but it is progressing, yes. I still have many questions that must be answered. I will report to you as soon as I can. So after this, don't go too far. Have a look on the right-hand side seats to find the second uh, golden moustache out of three for the level. That should put you on 16 out of 40 altogether. 
And then what we can do is go towards the kitchen. We are going to pick up the recipe from the fridge door after we speak to Hotaru Mori, who is looking like he's just about to explode his pants. Not in the good way. Do I look like I can answer questions? The room is spinning. My head is about to explode. You were celebrating last night? Celebrating? When Freya always wins. Ah, oh, what am I saying? If you want my answers to your questions to make sense, help me recover. You see there, the magnet on the fridge. That is my special recipe. I call it my day after survival tonic. If you could make me my special tonic, I might survive long enough to answer your questions. Jean knows the recipe very well. He can help you with the preparation. Very well, Monsieur Mori. If nothing ever works that quickly, so I think Mori is wrong. But anyway, another little character analyzation here. So nationality is, of course, Japanese. He is 55, he's looking good for 55 to be fair, yeah, 69, so 55 and then Chef. That was easy. Okay, so turn to the left, we're going to pick up the recipe here from the fridge door and then pick up a few little uh, delicious things, man. So first of all, we're going to pick up the Mint leaf. Uh, we, don't, we don't actually need to interact with the fridge. The mint leaf is just to the right of us. There it is. Mmm, minty. Why don't you just shove that in your up his nose? Ah, oh, goddamn. Now I'm awake, man. Uh, so pick up the lemon next, which is going to be on the right. So we'll pick that one up. Then we're going to pick up some ginger, which is going to be just past Maury on the shelf to the left right there. There is some old Ginga Binga. Oh no, that's no good. Now pick up the sparkling water from the fridge. Oh no, no. And now what we need to do is actually use the lemon on the lemon squeezer. So go just back past Maury to the right of where we are. There we go. So get a bit of lemon, squeeze a bit of lemon out. Pretty much could have just used your hand, but there we go. So you actually need to move it all the way down to get some of that delicious stingy eye lem lem. I have all the ingredients, all the ingredients for... I mean, you know what a can of monster would have done. A can of tropical Red Bull would have also done, but there we go. So we're going to go back to the bar and we're going to to speak to Mr. Fauchel again. Or Jean. Monsieur Fauché. Of course. How? Monsieur Fauché, I need your help to prepare a cocktail. What is this phrase? This is music to my ears. What can I fix for you? A mojito? A gin and tonic? Or perhaps a martini? Shaken? Not stirred? <laughs> it's not for me, but for Monsieur Maury. Ah, his day after survival tonic. Unfortunately, I know it well. Here is everything that was listed on the magnet. Excellent! I can take it from here. Mr. Poirot, I'm uncertain about the lemon juice. Is it half a lemon or a full lemon? For the so, make sure to choose the answer half lemon, first of all. Half a lemon. And then when he asks about ginger, make sure to say with ginger. Or without. Do you remember? I can assure you that he will want the ginger. There you are, sir. Hotaru will be himself again. Excellent. Thank you very much. So now we can just go ahead, go back to the kitchen. 
and speak with Mr. Moray. Memento Moray. Here you go, Mr. Mori. I hope this will help you. Thank you very much. Please give me a moment. While this takes effect, it will be a while, I'm afraid. But I will not move from the kitchen. Since I have to wait, do you know where I can find Mademoiselle Nielsen? She is in the staff quarters in the luggage car. If the door is locked, John will have the key. Thank you. I will return. I hope you have a speedy recovery. Ah, man, you suck. Okay, so now we need to go back and speak to Jean. Luckily, he is cleaning tables, and he's basically going to go ahead and give us the key card. Uh, excuse me, Jean, what is this uh, white stuff on it? Washing up liquid? Okay, no problem. So, talk to Jean here, and then we're going to go past the kitchen all the way to the storage car. I have a favor to ask. Could you visit the passengers who are in their rooms and explain there has been an error with their allergy and diet form? But, Monsieur Poirot, I made no errors. <laughs> of course not. Call it a computer error. Yes, it is possible. But even if I can see this is part of your investigation, I do not understand it. I would ask that you observe which hand each passenger uses. Ah. You wish to know if they use the right or left hand when they write. That is my intention. I will take on this mission for you. Excellent. That's it. It's open now. Ooh, a new place. Oh, it's just full of suitcases. Hmm, that would make sense since it is a storage car. So, uh, inspect both bottles, the one here and on the opposite end of the table. And the pack of cards as well. And we're actually going to be grabbing the final golden moustache of the level as well. It's going to be... Um... 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 um just to the right of us, that's what I'm trying to get at. So in the box, just past us now, right there to the right of us, that's where the next golden moustache is. Another delightful trophy for my collection. Oh hey, another treat. Right, go ahead and speak to Freya right here. We basically have to do a puzzle, which I will take you through. Don't have a minute. My career is ruined, and it's not my fault. But how did this terrible thing come to pass? My supplies, passenger luggage, our living space. There is so little room. I gave the cargo handlers in Istanbul strict instructions how to stack my crates containing the ingredients I need for my desserts. So as one box is used up, it can be discarded. And these fools of cargo handlers did not follow your instructions? Ignored completely. I have four crates that must be moved from there to here to correct the order they are stacked. But placing the wrong crate on top of a smaller crate will crush it, its contents, and my career. Calm yourself, mademoiselle. I understand. So, the problem is, these four crates must be moved there, but carefully. Yes. I have to move these four boxes from this location to here. But there is not much space to move the boxes, and I have to be careful never to put a bigger box on top of a smaller one, or the smaller crate will be destroyed. The problem is clear. So we basically have to move the boxes from the left to the right, but we have to do it in such a way. So, uh, I'm just going to call it one, two, three. So the first small box, move that to um, the second one. Grab the next box and move that over to the third gap. Let's call it that one. Uh, grab the first, uh, the smaller box and move that over to number three. Sorry, I'm trying to go as slow and less confusing as I can. But uh, grab 
box number three and move it to the middle. Grab box number one and put that over to the left. Grab the second box and grab it, uh, put it to the middle. Grab box number, the smallest box and put that in the middle again. Grab the bit largest box and put that over to the right. Then grab the smallest box, put that over to the right. Grab the second largest box, second smallest box or whatever, put that over to the left. Grab the small box, put that over to the left. Then grab the third biggest box, put that over to the right. Then small box, put that to the middle. And then small, smaller box, put that over. And then the smallest box over to the right. So apparently she said she had no room where she could, when, let's be honest, she had some plenty of room. That is lies and slander. Can you tell me your movements of last night? Last night after dinner, I stayed in the kitchen until 12.15 a.m. Then I joined Jean and Hotaru in our quarters. Then we... Then all of us read quietly in our beds until we fell asleep. A very studious staff. However, Monsieur Mori doesn't seem to have followed the same literary pursuit. So there's actually another confrontation coming up now. She's basically going to say, we read quietly in our beds. Which we all know that is a lie. So make sure to choose the sentence we read quietly in our beds. I rather think that you didn't just read last night. And then make sure to say Mr. Maury's headache, which I mean, it's a headache with some spewing and some butt spewing. More than just a headache, but that is the truth. And that will actually be 9 out of 17 for the human lie detector. Freya always wins. Wins what? Looking around, it is clear you were gambling and drinking most of the night. You don't understand. It's late when we're off duty, but we need to unwind. And now there's been a murder? Yes, I admit it. We went overboard last night. But please don't tell Mr. Book. It's against regulations. We could all be fired. Mademoiselle, I realize your difficult jobs have been made more difficult. But as you say, there has been a murder. I must have the truth. Of course. I'm so sorry. It's not such a crime. I'll leave it there and check in with Monsieur Fauché. Would you mind writing your address on this paper? I'm asking everyone on the train for addresses, in case I need to contact them once they leave the train in Paris. I understand. Yes, that's it. Mademoiselle Nielsen is right-handed. Do you smoke? No, I never have. Thank you. Thank you for your answers, Miss Nielsen. You're welcome. So after grabbing everything then, we can now go back to the kitchen again and speak to Mr. Memento Mori. Now if you're wondering why I'm calling him Memento Mori, it's because that is a fantastic song by uh, Lamb of God. Which if you're into that kind of music, it's so good. I really like it. So go back into the kitchen, speak to Mr. Memento Mori. How are you? Mm, it's better. Thank you. Then may I ask you some questions? It will not take long. Quickly, please. I have hungry passengers to feed. Très bien. Can you tell me your movements last night? Oh, nothing special. When I went off duty, I joined John and Freya in a compartment. I read for a short while, then went to bed early. Reading? <laughs> I'm not sure you have recovered enough to tell me the truth. Don't waste what little energy you have recovered to lie, Monsieur Moy. Yes. Sorry, Mr. Poirot. You're right. It obviously wasn't reading that made my head hard like that. But if you told Monsieur Book, it could mean my job. I will keep your secret, but I am investigating a murder. You must tell me the truth. Thank you. Please, write your address on this paper. My address? 
I don't see why. I think I hear Monsieur Book approaching. My address? Yes, of course. Another right-handed person. Not surprising, most people are. You are a heavy smoker. My job. It is very stressful. Would you happen to know who vapes on the train? A banana flavor? Oh, yes. The smell disgusts me. What is wrong with the good tobacco? I do not have time to answer that. Who is it? I've only seen one person who vapes. It's Captain Arbuthnot. Captain Arbuthnot, I see. Your testimony was invaluable to me. Thank you. Take care, Monsieur Mori. My palate depends on your good health. So after we've done all this stuff, we can now go and speak to Jean in order to give him the white powdered stained uh, washing up powdered key card back. And then we're going to go all the way to second class and interact with compartment 106 to talk to Captain Nico Belek Arbuthnot again. Ah, of course. I was able to get new allergy forms from guests who were in their compartments. Monsieur McQueen, Monsieur Masterman, Count and Countess Andrani, they are all right-handed. I also asked Princess Dragomirov, but she had her assistant, Madame Schmidt, sign for her. She is right-handed as well. You have exceeded my expectations. Well done. Thank you, Monsieur Fauché. Captain Arbuthnot, I know that you are the only person on this train to smoke e-cigarettes. We found a vial of e-liquid at the crime scene. Will you talk to me about this, or should I pass on what I've learned to the police? All right. Come in if you must. I have just a few questions for you. Very well. Let's hear them. The young English lady, Mademoiselle Debenham, was at the Tocatlian Hotel. Perhaps you met her there? We exchanged a few words. Fellow Brits abroad, that sort of thing. Hmm. What can you tell me about Mademoiselle Debenham? Nothing whatsoever. We barely spoke. The director of the Orient Express, Monsieur Book, thinks the assassin is a woman. And that is enough to accuse her? She had nothing to do with this murder. How can you be so certain? The idea is absurd. Ratchet was a perfect stranger to her. She'd never seen him before. Ah, did she tell you so? Well, yes, maybe she did. She may have commented once upon his somewhat unpleasant appearance. If a woman is concerned, as you seem to think, to my mind, without any evidence, I can assure you that Miss Debenham could not possibly be implicated. Hmm. It is clear that the captain is defending Miss Debenham, a woman he supposedly doesn't know very well. What were you doing last night around a quarter past one? One fifteen. I believe I was still talking to that young American fellow, Mr. McQueen, the secretary of the man who was killed. We were in his compartment. He was a friend or acquaintance of yours? No, I never saw him before this journey. We'd hit it off at dinner, and the conversation continued into the early hours. Until what time was that? Until one forty-five or so. Then I retired to my room and went to sleep. 
There is nothing you can recall last night that in any way struck you as suspicious? It's nothing. A mere detail. Allow me to be the judge. Well, before returning to my room, I went to the lounge car to get a glass of water. When I was passing through the first-class corridor, I noticed that the door, which is just after your room, 201, was not quite closed, and the person who was inside peered out in a furtive sort of way. Then he closed the door quickly. I know there's nothing in that, but it was the furtive way it was done that caught my attention. Struck me as a bit odd. I understand. Thank you for letting me know. Could you uh, write down your address here, please? My address? If you insist. This man is right-handed. Is this e-cigarette liquid yours? What flavor is it? Banana. Well, that is awkward. That's my flavor of choice. But I have no idea what it was doing there, whatever. Can you explain how it ended up there? I have no idea. I never entered the man's room, Poirot. That's the truth. Thank you, Captain. You're welcome. So after that long conversation, let's go into our mind map and we're going to find the vape liquid conclusion. And there it is. Hello, vape liquid. So first of all, we're going to choose a bottle of vape juice is found at the crime scene. And Captain Nico Bellic Arbuthnot is the only person on the train to smoke e-ciggies. So that's the first one out of three done. Next, we are going to choose Mr. McQueen confirmed that Captain Buthnot spoke with him until 1.45. And the murder apparently took place between midnight and 1.45. And then finally, the bottle of vape juice belongs to Captain Arbuthbuth. And, of course, Captain Arbuth has an alibi at the time of the crime. Captain Arbuthnot is the only passenger to smoke an e-cigarette. Even if this liquid in Ratchet's room is a solid clue, he has an alibi. I cannot accuse him without any other proof. Et voilà. All right, so now we are going to go to compartment 104, so just a couple of doors down, and speak to Mrs. Jürgen Schmergen, Miss Olsen. And actually, when we do speak to her, we're going to be coming up to another confrontation. Earlier confuses me. Oh, please. Come in. How can you be sure Mademoiselle Debenham was in bed all night? As I told you, I am a very light sleeper. The slightest noise wakes me up. If Fräulein Debenham had gotten out of her bed, I would have heard her. I, I got up this morning around 8 a.m. She was sleeping soundly. And the sentence that we need to confront her on is, if Fräulein, Fräulein Debenham had gotten out of bed, I would have heard her. So if Debenham had gotten out of bed, and the truth is that Ms. Debenham woke up at 5 a.m. So top answer, Ms. Debenham woke up at 5 a.m. to check on all her minimum wage employees. She told me that she got up around 5 o'clock in the morning. She opened the door and looked down the corridor. It was then that she saw a woman in a red kimono. How do you explain that? I think I must have been sleeping very soundly not to have heard it. Oh, but does that make me a suspect? I am not accusing anyone, mademoiselle. Do not worry. I am just trying to determine what happened last night. Thank you for your testimony. Right, time for some mind mapping once again, and this time we're going to go to alibis. Should already be on it. So, we are going to choose Mr. McQueen was talking with, Captain Arbuthnot. 
Ms. Debenham slept all night, confirmed by Ms. Olsen. Mr. Michael, that is so not right, went to see Mrs. Hubbard. And Ms. Nielsen, Freya, was playing cards with Momento, Momento Mori and Jean Jean. Do not let me down. Right, so that's all we need to do for now. So now we can just go all the way back to the restaurant and talk to Mr. Book. So, Poirot. There is no trace of the murder weapon on the train, as yet. The killer could have hidden it anywhere. It must be somewhere. Indeed, as you say, it must be somewhere. According to Dr. Constantine's report, the stab wounds were made by at least one right-handed and one left-handed person and with different strength. For the moment, everyone I have checked is right-handed. It is impossible to draw any conclusions as yet. However, I still have a few people to interrogate, notably the Russian princess. You still have many avenues to explore? Indeed, the case is far from over, mon ami. I identified the person responsible for the bottle of liquid for the vape found at the crime scene. So, this is our culprit? Do we hold him? No, unfortunately this bottle belongs to Captain Arbuthnot, but he has an alibi, confirmed by Monsieur McQueen for the time of the murder. Monsieur Book, Monsieur Poirot, Michel, calm down. But it's Mrs. Hobart. She says she found the murder weapon in her room. She's very upset. Let's go, Poirot. Funny how you always manage to find Book at the restaurant. They do say you are what you eat, and he is basically one beef corn beef pasty head, isn't he? Uh, right, so we're going to head down to compartment 204 and automatically talk to Mrs. Hubert. I demand to be allowed to leave this train! Madame, we are in the mountains, trapped in a snowdrift. Stating the obvious, there is a murderer among us. He had the audacity to hide his weapon in my room. Please, Madame Hubert, take a deep breath and tell us what occurred. Where did you find the knife? I... I... I wanted to get a handkerchief from my purse, and when I opened it, I... I saw it! A bloody knife! Am I next to be murdered? I very much doubt the murderer would give you his weapon. What do you mean? Madame, he would have used it. <gasps> oh my heaven! Did you touch the knife? Of course not! What a question! I will take that as a no. So, let's go and inter interact with the purse. It should have been right in front of us right there. I don't know why I decided to go everywhere else. So interact with the purse and then interact with the knife in it. And then once we have interacted with it, we can then speak to Monsieur Corn Beef Pasty Head. It's a red herring. Mrs. Hubbard is distraught, Poirot. I should stay with her. Please go on without me. I have every right to be distraught. Thank you, Mr. Book. Hey, bruh, just because you're old doesn't give you any right to be 
all well, although a man did get stabbed next door to you, so eh, maybe you got a point. Right, head down to compartment 105, back to Joanna Locke's room, and speak to Dr. Constantino. Dr. Constantine, we may have found our murder weapon. We need to make certain. There is a pretty quick way to be sure. I have estimated the depth of the wounds. You can easily find the depth of each wound by comparing the width. There are five of them that I am not sure about. Test them, and then we will compare our results. I will do as you say, Doctor. All right, so this is kind of a little puzzle. So the first one, we're going to put width 9 and depth as 13. So 9 and 13, first of all. Then you can go ahead and confirm that. So, you know, go ahead and confirm that. So, you know, go ahead and confirm that. So, you know, go ahead and confirm that. Oh, there we go then, by pressing the A button, as it were. Then you're going to do 8 and 11. Then press the A button. Then you're going to do 7 and 8. So, width 7 and depth 8. And then finally, you're going to do 5 and 5. And that will complete all the wounds. It will also finish the chapter. And away we go to chapter El Fivenos. Une, deux, trois, quatre, cinq. Cinq. We're on chapter cinq. 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 Yeah, five. Estimates I made during the preliminary autopsy. I can assure you that you hold in your hands the weapon that took Ratchet's life. Thank you. I feel way better now. The rest gave you time to sleep off most of the effects of the drug. I'm still a bit groggy. That's understandable. Are you able to continue your story now? Yes. Yes, I think so. Where was I? You were explaining how you returned to the Armstrong house to tell them their poor little child was dead. Yes, that's it. I felt helpless. My part in the case was officially over, but I knew I couldn't let it go. Daisy deserved justice. Two days later, I returned to the Armstrong house to tell them Daisy would be released soon for burial. I was angry with myself that I couldn't bring them better news. I wasn't prepared for more tragedy. Right, so once we're out of the car, before heading into the house, uh, have a look at the bush just next to the car. And we are going to find Golden Mustache, one out of five for this level. Oh, a lot of mustaches going on right now. So much. now we can enter the house and have a chat with Mr. Bicep Strong. And, well, it's even worse news. Hello, Miss Morrow. I'm here to see Colonel Armstrong. Good morning, Detective. Colonel Armstrong is upstairs. He... he isn't well. Good morning, Colonel Armstrong. Is your wife here? Here? No, Sonia is not here. Always one step behind. She died of a miscarriage last night. My wife, Daisy, and our baby. My whole family is gone. I... I'm so sorry. I came straight here this morning. I received word that you can arrange for Daisy to be returned to you for burial. I didn't know. Well, then, now you don't have to come back. I can arrange for Daisy, my wife, and our unborn child to be buried all at once. Very efficient. Being a military man, I can appreciate efficiency. I know how hard this must be for you. No, you don't know. I don't want your sympathy. I want you to do your bloody job and catch the creature that did this. I know you won't believe me, but I swear to you. I will find who did this. If it takes me to the far corners of the earth, I will find them. Then go. Please go now. Go find them. Now that is literally just like saying, Hi there, 
Here are my exposed testicles. Please kick them as hard as you can. While I'm down, why don't you kick me in the back of the head? Why don't you shove a metal pipe up my ass too while you're there? Um, yeah, so a bit of a, a bit of a triple whammy blow there for Mr. Bicep Strong. Incredible. Um, incredibly sad is what I meant to say. So, getting back into the police car anyway. And we are automatically now going to go to the cabin. The Armstrong was found, spotted a pickup truck, drive through the barricade tape, and then head up the dirt road toward where the subject cabin is located. Any car nearby who can respond? Unit 28, we can respond, but we're a ways away. Dispatch, this is 11. I'm on it. Copy that. 11, you're good to go. Copy that. Okay, there's the pickup. Let's see who ignored our barricade tape. Eleven here. I'm at the cabin. Someone has broken in. Are you requesting backup? Not yet. I'm going to take a look around. Copy that, Eleven. Ooh, creepy! So, we're actually going to go inside. We're going to observe the torn tape Somebody and the footprints just as, we, uh, just as we're about to enter the cabin. So, if we go straight in, we're going to check evidence markers 1, which should be straight in front of us. And number 3, which should uh, be where we found the box and the bomb puzzle. Have to go through this place and while we're here, Golden Mustache 2 out of 5 is going to be in the box just next to the wardrobe directly in front of us. So give that a little pick up. Again, that should be 2 out of 5 for the level and 19 out of 40 overall. So go to the opposite side of the room here, check evidence marker number 9 and the duct tape just next to it on the box. So you can see the tape of duck. To silence Daisy's screams. Ah, uh, don't say it like that. Nah. Right, go to the small room. We're going to check the Dia Trophy again. This is basically a hint for a puzzle uh, that we're going to come up to in just a minute. And then once we have looked at this, we're going to turn around and then have a look at evidence marker number seven. So that's six. We ain't going to bother with that. We're going to turn around. Number seven is where the uh, Daisy's toy was. Daisy's special toy. And then what we're going to do, we can leave the cabin, go to the, as we come out of the cabin, go to the left, which is actually the right side of the cabin, uh, go to that little shed with the wood where we found the axe to find golden moustache number three. Not really my style, but I'll take it. So now we've got a new area of ex exploration, not quite here. But if you carry on just going to the left a bit, we can squeeze in between some rocks. And we're going to start speaking to a journalist called Michael Clark. Don't shoot, officer. I'm on your side. Sir, keep your hands where I can see them. Sure, no problem. Sir, this is a crime scene. Who the hell are you? I'm a reporter. Boston 6 News. You can get us on cable even here in the mountains. They haven't heard of crime scene tape in a big city like Boston? All right. That wasn't my best move. I got all excited. I didn't expect to find the place deserted. It was hard to resist. You should have tried harder. I'm placing you under arrest. You should be thanking me. Look what you apparently missed and I found. We'll get to that. But you're going to answer some questions first. I'm more used to asking questions, but fire away. Who are you exactly? I'm Michael Clark, journalist for Boston 6 News. Off camera, but someday I'm going to be anchor. You just wait. Do you have a way to prove that? My press card's in my truck. What are you doing here? You should know a crime scene is off limits. I'm investigating the Daisy Armstrong kidnapping like you. Does the pickup parked in front of the cabin belong to you? Yes, indeed, it's mine. I'll check. Show me your hands. I'm going to cuff you. I'm sure we can work out a deal. Put your hands in front of you.
Aren't you gonna read me my rights? You have the right to remain silent. I really wish you'd exercise that one. Dispatch, this is Eleven. I intercepted a suspicious individual at the crime scene. I'll check to determine how badly he's compromised it. Then I'm bringing him in. Copy that, Detective Locke. See, that's how police should do it. Not fanny about with paperwork. Just, there's a guy. Arrest the crap out of him and do stuff. I mean, sometimes uh, maybe American cops do take it a little bit far with the guns and stuff. Uh, right, so into the van here, we are going to grab the key from the top of the um, sun visor. That's what I'm after. So go ahead, interact with the other sun visor as well, but there is actually not a ting in that one. Not a lot of ting. Um, have a look down and interact with the press ID card, which should be right in the middle there. Michael Clark? Well, seems like Michael Clark. Oh, he's a little journalist, and then at night, he's Superman. Uh, so then interact with the camera, including all the photos that are on it. So go through every single photo. Candid photos of the entire Armstrong family. A reporter just doing his job. Or something else. Now then, open up the glove compartment next, have a little look through. So the glove compartment, we're going to check the registration document, the driver's license, and the museum card. So check everything in here. Clerk's driver's license seems to be in order. The vehicle registration is not in the name of Michael Clark or a rental company. Okay, so this kind of smells like a like a Chinese pasty or something. Ooh, a Chinese pasty. That sounds... That sounds real nice. I could really go for a Chinese pasty right now. And if one doesn't exist, make it exist. Um, so, uh, after we've interacted with the number at the back of the card, sorry, I forgot to mention, type in the code 3487 and then confirm it. So that's 3487. Hey, I'm a pretty good detective after all. Hi, I'm Detective Joanna Locke, Berkshire Police. I'd like to speak to an editor, please. One moment, please. Hello, Detective Locke? This is Abby Wilson. I'm a senior editor. What can I do for you? Does a man named Michael Clark work for you? Yes, he does. Why? When was the last time you heard from him? Oh, it's been at least seven or eight months. That's not unusual. He works in the field? Yes, Michael Clark is what we call a stringer. He works as a freelancer. Comes up with a story we can use, we pay him. And we don't hear from him again for several months. What kind of stories does Mr. Clark write? Mr. Clark is an investigative reporter. Mostly crime stories, to tell you the truth. He comes up with some pretty macabre stuff some of the time. Is there a problem? Or a story? Do you remember what the last case he investigated was? It was a murder case. The victim was a millionaire named James Miller. He was called the Frozen Fish King of Gloucester, Massachusetts. His body turned up in one of his nets. Or, rather, most of it did. Ah, well. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. You've been a great help to me. Pleasure. I hope he's not in trouble. He can be a little pushy, but he's a good guy overall. So what's he working on now, detective? Are you sitting on a story? Thanks again. Thank you, you nosy little son of a monkey balls. Right, okay. So what we're going to do is go back now to the uh, back of the cabin where we found Michael Clark, first of all. And there's going to be a bunker where we can check the entrance of.
So we need to input a code and that code is going to be 3892. So that is 3892 and then press the red button. Yes, I knew I could do it. I can always use safe cracking as a career move. There. Now let's see what secrets you're hiding. So in we go, highlight. Let us check the gas tank on the floor. Because I need you more tonight. But uh, yeah, so check the gas tank. Or the fuel tank. Or the Gaia's tank. Depends obviously where you're from, whatever the hell you want to call it. And then we are going to, there's going to be a couple of power boxes here with three cables inside it. So we're going to open the power box right here. There we go. Let's just check that out. So basically what you'd have to do is obviously follow the cables around and see which one that you need to pick. Uh, in the, There's basically three power boxes. Now, basically to complete the puzzle, there is going to be, you just have to interact with the very... Uh, with the first one over on the left. So open up both the power boxes. And then what we're going to do is go into the small room, first of all. So just at the back here is the small room. Uh, we're going to have a look, interact with the armor door here, and then interact with the power switch, but it's obviously not going to work. No, it doesn't work. Right, so head out. So there are three of these little switches that we got to do. The first one here can be on the wall, fits in the wall. So again, for me, I just flicked up the very left switch on all three of them, and that seemed to work fine, just fine. So go to the next one, and again, flick up the left switch. Also, while you're here, make sure to grab the golden mustache four out of five. It's in this corner with the blueprint room. Um, and apparently I'm just quickly finishing off this puzzle first. So there we go. That should now get uh, everything working. You won't... Nothing will be working just yet. You've actually got to go and interact with the door first of all. Um, and I'm, I'm looking for the golden mustache in all the wrong places. That's what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> so it's actually, as I said, it is in the right-hand corner of the room. Yep, just over here by the table. So, apologies about that. For some reason, I seem to get loused. Uh, anyway, that should be, as I said, number four out of five. So now we can just go ahead. We'll check the blueprint on the table and the shelf unit next to it. This blueprint. It looks like the bomb in the cabin. The kidnapper built the bomb here. Right, let's go ahead and open this boy. Chuck it open, let there be light. Tidy boys. Right, open the armor door here and enter the room. A couple of things we're going to check. The first is the calendar right in front of us. So we'll just go ahead and check that. The date should be on the 24th. Uh, check the light bulb then on the ceiling. And everything. Could use a new light bulb. And then go ahead and check the safe. Now, because of the noisy light bulb, we can't actually open it. So what we're going to have to do is go back to turn off the power and then come back. So it gets a little dark, but it doesn't really matter. The armor door will obviously stay open. So switch it up. Go back to the safe. Now, the code is 5173, but it's one of those where you have to go to the right in order to get five, and then the left to get one, and then right to get seven, and left to get three. So if you keep going to the right, it just basically resets itself. But like I said, it's five, one, seven, three. Yes, I knew I could do it. Yeah. <laughs> 
An expensive looking pen with the initials JM? What's its story? It's Daisy's hair clip, the same as the picture I saw at the Armstrong house. That looks like a hair caught in the band around the money. Forensics will tell me for sure, but that doesn't look like Daisy's color. These get locked up again until forensics get here. Okay. Time so after inspecting the pen, the hair clip, and the money, we're going to leave the bunker. We're going to go back to the back of Michael Clark's pickup truck and basically inspect the fuel tank slash gas tank outline. Progress at last. The gas can I found in the bunker would match this outline perfectly. Okay, time for forensics to attack that bunker. And the gas can I found oh. the gas can I found in the bunker would match this outline perfectly. Okay, time for forensics to attack. And Clark, he's. I need to get him into. I know my rights. You can't keep somebody locked up in a car like this, you know. You wouldn't do it if I was a dog. Do they have bathrooms at the station? I have the right to make a phone call, Detective whatever your name is. That phone is an outside line. Hello, boss. It's Michael Clark. I'm still on the Armstrong kidnap, but there's a small problem. I got caught being someplace I shouldn't be. I'm at the police station. No, I'm not under arrest. Just questioning. Fire me. Why? The station's integrity? You're kidding me, right? If you think I've screwed up that badly, then fire me. Got that? Fire me. Yes, do it. That didn't go well. I think I got my point across. What happens now? Go ahead. Then we'll have a chat. Oh, Joanna, you messed this up. You'll see why in just a bit. So, first of all, we're going to pick up the final Godel mustache. It's just behind this water cooler here. So that'll be 5 out of 5 for the level and 22 out of 40 altogether. All right, let's go ahead and enter the left door. Not that left door, but the left door of these two doors. Door, 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 door. So we're going to inspect, first of all, the files on the desk to the left there. Yes. I'll just cut off his ponytail, bro. That's uh, as soon as you cut off a man's ponytail. Huh. All power is lost. To interact with the chair and then the case files. And then the window and the laptop. This is all a game to him. And he doesn't expect to lose. An extra computer so I don't have to go all the way out to my desk. And now let's go ahead and enter the other room and talk to Mr. Clark Pasty Pie himself. Now that we've taken your DNA, we can begin. Interview of suspect Michael Clark, 6 p.m., March 30th, 2019. This interview is being recorded. By elves behind the mirror, no doubt? You were arrested at a crime scene where you damaged police barricade tape. I'll pay for a new roll. That's a Class A misdemeanor, and it carries a $500 fine. Oh, that's unfortunate. To begin with. Where were you on the night Daisy Armstrong was kidnapped? I was watching TV in my motel room, but I had my police scanner on. I heard the first reports that the little girl was missing. No way the police at the scene were going to let me get close. I set my alarm so I could get on the story first thing in the morning and tried to sleep. It was difficult. Can anybody confirm where you were? No, afraid not. I was alone and sleepless. A sad combination. And I realize a bad alibi. Ugh, look at him smile. That is a creepy nun smile right there. Go to prison! 
Anyway, interact with the press ID first. And so, yes, we would like to confront Michael Clark. You say you're a journalist, a stringer for Channel 6 News in Boston. I sell my stuff to lots of media outlets. And then choose the option, the camera that was left in the car. Your camera was in your pickup. You didn't want to take pictures of the crime scene? I like to get the lay of the land. Once I see the story I want to tell, then I start documenting it. I don't know any journalist who works a case without their camera close at hand. He thinks he's invincible. I need to play his ego. That's the key. What are you doing in the Berkshires? And what is your connection to the Armstrong case? For the past few months, I've been working on a big case. Boston 6 News was looking forward to my next story. The Armstrongs have been on my list of potential targets for a long time. I changed gears when Daisy was kidnapped and started... In and another confrontation coming up then. This is about the Bicep Strongs. So choose the sentence, I changed gears when Daisy was kidnapped and started investigating. So I changed gears when Daisy was kidnapped and started investigating the Bicep Strongs. And as we know, the truth is going to be the camera. So make sure when the option comes up to choose camera. Wow, the Armstrongs. That's not a Science Sunday report. That's a lead. Sometimes you just get lucky. Your camera in the pickup. There were photos of Daisy from before she was kidnapped. The Armstrongs are a famous family like the Kennedys or Hollywood couples. Gossip sites love them. People want to see how they live. I started out just stealing candid shots. Paparazzi live on getting that one exclusive shot. Steamy, intimate, whatever. Then when the kidnapping happened, I realized I was here first. What an opportunity. And I jumped at it. You have an answer for everything. You're not very good at this, are you? How long have you been on the job? Long enough to put you away for life. If you killed that little girl. Right, next up, we are going to choose the right hand option, which is going to be the pickup truck. Let's start with why you went to the cabin. If the police were interested in it, I was interested in it. And for the next option, make sure to choose the pickup. That pickup of yours, that's a very nice ride. Especially for a stringer who only gets a few stories on the air. How can you afford it? When Boston 6 does use a story, they pay okay. That truck is top of the range. How much did it set you back? Fifty-five, sixty thousand dollars $60,000? When I have to, I do what everybody else does. I take out a loan. How about you, detective? You got a loan on your car? He's enjoying himself. I need to throw him off balance somehow, surprise him into making an error. Explain to me again how you got to the crime scene. I listened in on the police radio frequency. Anybody can do it with a scanner. I headed for the crime scene in my trusty pickup, like I've done for years. After the forensic team left, I needed to see the crime scene for myself. I got to the bunker. Just Yar, kids, it be yet another confrontation here. So, make sure to choose, I headed for the crime scene in my trusty pickup, like I've done for years. So I headed for the crime scene in my trusty pickup, like I've done for years. And the truth, the next option that we're going to find, Oh, choose is vehicle title. Vehicle title. You vehicle tittle. For years, but the title certificate is not in your name. The truck belongs to somebody named Stephen Baker. Okay. I don't get why the pickup is so important to you, but I guess my ego made me say that. Yeah, the pickup was lent to me by a friend. I couldn't afford it even with a loan. I think you stole it, Mr. Clark. You needed a pickup like that for our mountain roads, so you stole that one. Try proving it. But while you run off on some wild goose chase, you can't hold me. And for the finale of all pasty face right there, make sure to choose now the gas tank photos. Let's move on to the gas cans and what we found in your pockets when you were brought in here today. That sounds exciting. And then choose the option, burn the place. To burn the place, you got to, to the pass the test. The I'm gonna get it on the road, on the top of a mountain. You need a lighter and gloves 
in your pockets. Sorry. You were going to set fire so sorry. to the bunker and every scrap of evidence inside. Where to begin? I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I wasn't planning to use these things to destroy the crime scene. I've been around crime scenes my entire career. I brought the gloves so as not to contaminate it with my fingerprints. The gas can in the back of my pickup, I use it to put gas in the truck. Gas stations are few and far between in your mountains. I didn't know there was a gas can in the bunker. If that's true, I did you a favor. My arrival obviously scared off somebody planning to burn everything. Do you also have an excuse for your lighter? The lighter? I'm trying to quit smoking. I use the lighter as a reminder not to start again. I know that Clark is lying. I need to reconstruct the whole sequence of events in order to- Okay, time for some mind map reconstructing now. So, let's get into it. Reconstruct the events. Yes, let's. So, for the first one, it is going to be Clark breaks the barricade tape. There she blows, looks like a seatbelt, but it's not. Next is Clark takes a can of gasoline from his pickup. So that'll be the second one. The third one is going to be Clark opens the bunker. The fourth one is obviously going to be automatic. It should be I arrive at the cabin, which it is. Next up for the fifth one is Clark throws the can of gasoline into the bunker. Number six is Clark closes the bunker. And then number seven is I come and surprise Clark. Hey, honey. Wrong, honey. Get out. That's it. No rookie mistake there. I'll tell you what really happened. You waited until forensics left and arrived in your probably stolen pickup. You grabbed a can of gasoline from your truck. You then went into the cabin to check if Daisy had been found. You then went straight to the bunker to see if it had been discovered, planning to set it on fire and destroy all the evidence inside. Before you could start the fire, you heard me arrive. So you hastily left your gas can and closed the hatch. You didn't think I could open the bunker. If I hadn't found you, I expect you would have burned down the cabin too. I'm not going to make fun of you, detective, or how you handled my interrogation. You're obviously very new at this. I swear I'm telling the truth. I didn't know the bunker was there until the moment you showed up. I seem to have trumped your entire police force. When I get the DNA results from the bunker, we'll continue this conversation. You have no concrete evidence against me whatsoever. The lab results will be in soon. You won't get away with this. See that call? That's your arrest warrant and a one-way ticket to prison. I'll be right back. Hello, sir. I think I found the man who kidnapped Daisy Armstrong. I'm interrogating him now. Hold on, Detective Luck. I have some bad news. Someone set fire to the cabin in the bunker. The fire department is on the scene, but they say it's too late. Th that's impossible. My suspect has been in the interrogation room with me all evening. We can't hold him. Suzanne Moreau. Her fingerprints are on the wine bottle found in the cabin. We also found an unknown person's fingerprints, but they don't match your suspects. Sir, with all due respect, I'm convinced Michael Clark is involved. Detective, I'm cutting you some slack already. But we cannot hold your suspect simply because you're convinced he's guilty. We have evidence that Suzanne was working with an accomplice, Noah Garrity. I order you to release the reporter and arrest this Moreau. L let me just check my last lead. The DNA analysis of the hair found in the bunker safe. The results just came in. I know how hard this is. I... Okay. Get the DNA results. Detective Locke, I will give you one hour maximum. Then you close the file and arrest Suzanne Moreau. Thank you, sir. Human blood. Yes. So let's go back in now and speak to Mr. Clark. Not exactly Kent Clark, is he? An editor from the Boston Six News. An editor you repeatedly said should fire you. That was your accomplice, wasn't it? You were telling him to start the fire. An accomplice? And make sure to choose Noah here. So, Noah. And by the way, I obviously know it's Clark Kent. That was just silly, terrible joke about... Yeah, so, anyway. Um, coming up now to the end of Chapter 5, just a couple of things left to do. And the next one is going to be a small little puzzle. So after we, after we have finished with um, Clark Kent right here, or Crap Clark, or Kent Crap, 
don't know, whatever you want to call him. We are going to go into our room and solve the DNA's puzzle on the laptop. Sorry, we only have the DNA sequence. We haven't had time to compare it with the suspects yet. It'll take seven more hours. I'm sorry, but you are not the only one on the waiting list. Send your analysis to my computer in the office. I'll do the comparison myself. I need authorization. I have a murderer who is going to walk free unless I get those results now. Fine, we'll send it to you right away, but I'll have to log this. It's my last chance. Okay, so what we're going to do then is go to the bottom right-hand corner where, it's, where it says Susan Moreau. And then just basically put it in the bottom middle. So where it's sort of got TTA, CCA at the top. There we go. So right in the middle. That should be where it is. Go ahead and validate that. And da da da. But of course, it's obvious that she's being set up. And unless you don't think so, then... Well, I just ruined that for you. Sorry. Anyway, go back in and talk to Mr. Hippie Balls again. You can leave. Sorry it didn't work out for you, detective. Maybe you should consider a career change. We are not done. Oh, but we are, my dear. We are done. I had no choice but to return to the Armstrong house to arrest Suzanne Moreau. So we are back at the Bicep Strong House, or the Tricep Strong House, whichever you want to call them. Um, we will obviously check the arrest warrant, interact with it, leave the car, and then we're going to enter the house. Go upstairs to Suzanne's room on the left. I will fight for her defense, but for now, the district attorney is in charge. If I want to stay a detective, he always has the last word. Hmm, the door is wide open. How strange. Hey, is anyone there? Miss Moreau? Miss Moreau? This is Detective Locke. And holy crap and a cracker, she's sleeping. Miss Moreau, can you hear me? It's me. Permanently, Detective forever. Locke. You must get up now. Uh, yeah, she did. Miss Moreau? Miss Moreau, can you hear me? Suzanne Moreau is dead. There are no traces of blows or injuries on her body. She doesn't seem to have defended herself from anyone. Yeah, that definitely, this kind of story definitely can affect everyone. Uh, so we will inspect the sleeping pills. And then we are going to inspect the letter. So the letters are just going to be on the opposite side of the room there. There it is. So inspect the letter. Have a little read if you want. Suzanne was telling the truth about uh, yeah, like I said, it's just basically about her mommy being in hospital. Um, interact with the laptop. She must have realized at last how she'd been used. The death of her mother would have been an additional shock, and the self-righteous court of social media was as quick as usual to try and convict her. The point there is just how toxic and terrible social media can be. You read one thing on the internet, and then everyone believes it. Yes, especially a place like Facebook, hmm, shall we say, and Instagram. Everyone just loves a bitch and an argument, don't they, on social media? And apparently everyone's a, a, an expert at everything, of course, as well. So uh, so we've just interacted there with the bookshelf, the drawers, and interact with the book and the glasses case, since there are no glasses in it. And for the final one, 
interact here and interact with everything and that will be the end of chapter 5 and on to chapter 6 we go getting through it slowly now come here I called the district attorney to inform him. This is Detective Locke, sir. I'm at the Armstrong house. Have you arrested Suzanne Moreau? She's dead, sir. Apparent suicide, but I need a forensics team. She killed herself out of remorse for her part in the crime. We don't know that yet. I'm calling forensics now, but I wanted you to know. What a mess. Stay on site until forensics arrive. Yes, sir. Standing by. The investigation was officially closed. I was certain that she was innocent, and Clark had been responsible for four deaths and then vanished into thin air. With a million dollars. Dollars marked, though, and not easily spent. I didn't care if the case was officially closed. I swore, Mr. Poirot, whatever it took, I would hunt him down. I waited for the forensics team, then went into the station to write my report. I was officially off the case. Thank you, mademoiselle. That obviously cannot be the completion of your story. If I might ask a question? Of course. So, no mucking around here, we're straight into it. Choose Ratchet was Michael Clark, the reporter. So now it's starting to get interesting. Ratchet, who has been stabbed and who wanted some help, of Poirot, he was Michael Clark, and it's only going to get weirder from here. -ader. You looked for similar cases. What do you Americans call the MMOs? Means, motive, and opportunity. Yes, I looked for someone in plain sight. Someone on the edge of a kidnapping case. Someone in plain view, keeping track of the investigations. An innocent witness, a concerned neighbor, even another reporter. And eventually you found a name behind an alias. Yes, I found a name. Cassetti, the real name. The real name of the man you call Ratchet is Cassetti. This explains much, mademoiselle, but not all. It explains why she is our number one suspect. But not how she came to be on this train. Attends, she has grown pale. I, I don't know what's wrong with me. Excuse me, Mr. Poirot. I don't feel very well. You are exhausted and still feeling the effects of the drug. Stay with us, mademoiselle. One more effort. I need to know your recent movements. I snuck aboard the train. This I observed. You came directly to this room? Yes. Yes, and other than a couple of careful trips to the... the ladies yesterday, I never left this room. I didn't want to be spotted by Ratchet. Yesterday, I, I chatted with my roommate, Miss Schmidt, I think, here in our room. She brought me some dinner. I got very sleepy and nodded off. And now she nods off again. Is this a joke? She must be faking so we can't interrogate her further, Poirot. No, Book. She really seems to have fallen asleep again. It is my fault. She must have been given a dangerous dose of sleeping pills last night. The effects should wear off soon, I hope, but I am afraid asking her to tell us her story was too much for her. Pinch her, Poirot. She's faking. Her eyes are dilated. She is not faking, and there will be no pinching. Dr. Constantine, please stay with her. Monsieur Bouc, ask the other passengers to gather in the dining car. There are still many questions I need to ask. But all of them together? Won't someone overhear your questioning the others? I will speak softly because I am trained to do so. They will speak softly because they want to. Whoa now, croissant bruh. She's obviously not faking. Your big chin leathery faced boosh. Right, so what we're going to do is head out of this room. We're going to go to compartment 202, which is obviously not that way. Uh, so go to compartment 202 and we're going to pick up the golden mustache. So only one out of two for this one. And El Mustacho should be on the shelf just above you. 
There it is. So that is the first one done. So that should be 23 out of 40 now for the game. And now we can go to the lounge. So head straight up and go to the lounge. And just before heading through to the bar, if you go to the right, you can see this little cupboard. That is where the second and last mustache of the level is. So we've got those two out of the way. Now we're all good. Right, next we are going to go to, to the restaurant. So straight through the bar, go to the restaurant and speak to old Debenham's lady. The passengers who agreed to come and talk to you are assembled. Wow, Mr. Masterman is already here to answer your questions. Perfect, thank you, my friend. Sit down, Mr. Masterman, please. Thank you. Does the name Cassetti mean anything to you? No, should it? Have you heard of the Armstrong kidnapping case? Of course. It was all over the news a few years ago. Your employer's real name is Cassetti. He was the man behind that kidnapping. Mr. Ratchet was... He murdered that poor little girl? Mr. McQueen, the man you worked for is a kidnapper named Cassetti. What? <laughs> what kidnapping? He murdered his victim, a child named Daisy Armstrong. The Armstrong kidnapping? You had no idea of Monsieur Ratchet's real name? Damn, skunk! Why are you so upset? My father was the district attorney who handled the case, Mr. Poirot. I saw Mrs. Armstrong more than once. She was a lovely woman, so gentle and heartbroken. If ever a man deserved what he got, Ratchet, or Cassetti, is the man. He didn't deserve to live. Madame Olson, have you heard of the Daisy Armstrong case? No, I've never heard of it. It was only two years ago. It was famous. Maybe so, but it was not famous in Spain, where I have been helping the refugees from Africa. You've never heard the name Daisy Armstrong? No, never. Daisy Armstrong? No. No. No! No! Yes. It was all over the English tabloids before I went to Jordan. A horrific crime that claimed the lives of an entire family and their wrongfully accused nanny. That's right, isn't it? Quite so. I thought the culprit had been punished. Some might say that the culprit was punished last night. Oh, my heavens. May I ask you a few more questions? Yes. Yes, of course. You read about the crime, as you said, in the tabloids. Yes, that's right. For weeks, news of the royal family was eclipsed. Have you ever been to the United States, mademoiselle? No, never. Jordan was really my first trip abroad. You were in Jordan? Yes, I was an English tutor there to the children of a high official. Until recently. What is your relationship to Captain Arbuthnot? Who? A former soldier travelling with us. You must have met him. Oh yes, I met him on the platform in Istanbul. Okay, so a few minutes of long conversation, but this is the next confrontation. Um, the lie is, I met him on the Istanbul station platform. So make sure to pick the sentence then. I met him on the Istanbul station platform. Are you sure everything you have told me is accurate, Mademoiselle Debenham? Of course. Ah, we know that because of the earring at the hotel. So, second option, earring at the hotel. That should be 13 out of 17 confrontations done. I know that you met Captain Arbuthnot at the Tocat Leon Hotel. You were spying on me. I am very attentive to my surroundings. It helps in my profession. I... well, it's your word against mine. I had occasion to be of some assistance in recovering Captain Arbuthnot's train ticket. 
While searching his room, I also discovered one of your earrings. Whatever your relationship may be to the good captain, I doubt it has anything to do with British Reserve. Hmm. You will not tell me your secret, mademoiselle? I... I can't. I... I don't know what you mean. Poirot, Miss Devon. All right, so we're going to come up to a miscellaneous achievement here. There's going to be two options while Labathnot goes to punch us. Make sure to choose Bend Down. So make sure to choose Bend Down. You will dodge the old uh, ex-Eastern European Grand Theft Auto man's punch and get the achievement. I know Kung Fu. And there we go. Leave her alone. Have you no honor? Archie, we should go. Captain Arbuthnot, I am certain you are a brave soldier, but you are a poor actor. And next up, choose Ms. Debenham's lover. Oh, that scar ain't stopping nobody from making the honky tonky donkey donkey. Miss Debenham is beyond doubt, Captain. Your reaction was apparently that of a man trying to protect the woman he loves. I might understand that if your relationship were some cleverly disguised secret, but it is not. You make puppy dog eyes at one another at every opportunity. You cannot hide your love. Everybody knows. I advise you to stop with your accusations, Mr. Poirot. I'm going to escort Miss Debenham back to her compartment. Make of that what you will. The captain and Mademoiselle Debenham are obviously adamant about not revealing their relationship, but this scene convinced me there is more that is not so obvious. This murder has everyone on edge. In my 25-year career, I have never seen such madness aboard the Orient Express. I understand, my friend. The more we learn, the more perplexing this train ride becomes. But we have other clues to pursue. What do you have in mind? The broken watch on Monsieur Ratchet's wrist, for example. And the handkerchief found near the body. Who does that belong to? This little drama we have just witnessed has not put you off the scent. Far from it, my friend. Will you return to your watch over Mademoiselle Locke? Yes, I will. Dr. Constantine can probably use a break. Good. Au revoir, Poirot. Right, so we've got a lot of mind mapping to be doing right here. So first of all, we are going to look for hypotheses about the watch. So which watch? Yes, the watch watch. So, choose the watch was tampered with by the murderer. So we need to choose three options here. The watch shows the time of the murder. And the watch was out of adjustment before the murder. Yes, there are only three possible hypotheses. The watch has been tampered with, or... It is out of adjustment, or it indicates the time of the murder. I shall explore these last two possibilities before reaching any conclusions. If the watch is out of adjustment, it may be broken. There may also be another reason related directly to Ratchet. Maybe the watch is set to another time zone. Back to mind map goodness now. Now we're going to choose what was the watch defective before the crystal was broken. And we're going to select the um, mid, the big hand moving or trying to move. Defective because the second hand is still moving. That was easy. And then next up, we're going to look for contradictory information. Just to the right, there it is. Contradictory information. And the answer is, someone impersonated Ratchet at 12.37 a.m. I'm right again. That happened. Next up, we're going to go for time zones. So time zones it be. So in which time zone is Istanbul located? UTC plus two. So it's UTC plus two. Well and then the next one, the answer is UTC plus one. UTC plus a one. Great. If this theory is correct, 
then the murder took place at 12.15 a.m. I must interrogate all the passengers to see if any of them have... And we're not quite done with this just yet. So, back into the mind map. Search for cross-check known alibis. Uh, again, well, sometimes you may just have to wait until uh, whoever's speaking has finished speaking. And then it'll pop up. There we go. So, cross-check known alibis. We're going to go with Captain Arbuthnot to Mr. McQueen. And then we're going to go to Ms. Debenham and Ms. Olsen. Then we're going to go to uh, Maury slash Nielsen and Mr. Fauchel. And then, of course, finally, M. Book and Dr. Constantine. Et voilà. Right, so next up is who owns the handkerchief over on the right-hand side. So basically, the question is, which letter is embroidered on the handkerchief? And obviously, the answer is... H or HA for hash brown. Goodness. I'm right again. That. And for the final one for the time being, handkerchief owner, we are going to choose all these people. So it's going to be Dr. Constantine first. So there we go. Choose Dr. Constantine and then Cyrus Hardman. Looks like a bit of a soft man, but there we go. Uh, then choose Caroline Ubeld. Then Hector McQueen. Hotaru Mori. Mrs. Andreni. And Hildegard Schmidt. Schmidt. That was easy. Right, so with all the mind map stuff done, we are now going to solve a couple of puzzles. So we're going to go to the bar and talk to Jean and Foscarelli in order to solve the Gears puzzle. Monsieur Foscarelli, I would like to ask you a few questions, if you allow me. Ah, Signore Poirot, is it? I was wondering when you'd get around to me. Unfortunately, you find me on a mission of mercy. Hello, Monsieur Poirot. Sorry, we have a small problem. The orange juicer has broken down and I can't fix it. Mr. Foscarelli has kindly offered to help me. It isn't a car engine, but I am doing my best. Even with the two of us, we can't manage. Let me guess. You call upon Poirot to help. I'd be happy to answer your questions when we finished. <laughs> So we're going to go from left to right. So pick up the bigger gear on the left-hand side and put that to the left to get that rolling. Next, we're going to take the small left one and put that to the next one. And then we're going to pick the middle two big ones and then we'll pop that just on the bottom. Uh, well, sorry, just, just to the left of the last one. Uh, so there's three gears in a row. Next, we're going to put the middle bottom one in the bottom middle. And then we're going to pick the bigger gear. And we're going to put that on the right, just underneath. And then the last one will go just on top. And that will solve the gear puzzle. And then we can talk to Foscarelli and Jean. Bravo. I should stick to automobiles. Well, now we can talk calmly. Monsieur Foscarelli, is it? Antonio Foscarelli? Delighted, Monsieur Poirot. You have, of course, heard about Ratchet's murder last night. Oh, naturally. It is all anyone is talking about. Have you ever been to the United States? Yes, it has been a primary market for our cars for the last ten years. You remember the Armstrong case? Armstrong? The name, yes. It was a little girl. A baby, was it not? Yes, a very tragic affair. Did you know that Cassetti, the kidnapper, was actually Ratchet? Oh, no. Then he deserved to die. 
I mean, wouldn't you agree? Can you tell me your movements on the night of the murder? I went to bed right after dinner, but I slept very badly. My roommate, uh, Mr. Masterman, had a toothache. Oh, he moaned all night. It woke me up several times. Did you hear anything or notice anything unusual? No, nothing that I can think of. I stayed in my bed all night. Well, thank you, Mr. Foscarelli. I'm sorry I couldn't help more, Signore. I remain at your disposal if you should need me. Thank you so much, Monsieur Poirot. I can put orange juice back on the menu. So, from here we are going to go back to the storage car and speak to Mr. Memento Mori. Sorry to bother you, Monsieur Mori. I have a question to ask you. Please make it quick. I have a meal to prepare. This handkerchief embroidered with an H, is it yours? No, I've never seen it before. Thank you. That is all I wanted to know. I hope your investigation won't interfere with today's menu. Next up, we're going to go back to the lounge and talk to Miss Schmitty. Old Schmidt, your pants. Enchanté, mademoiselle. You are Hildegard Schmidt? I am Lafrol. And you, I know, are Herr Poirot. Correct. May I ask you for a few minutes of your time to answer a few questions? With pleasure, but uh, first may I ask for your help? <laughs> Why does this not surprise me? I... I don't know. I am at your service, Fraulein. My mistress, Princess Dragomirov, has asked me to open this traditional matryoshka doll. There is a trinket inside she must retrieve. Madame, in my experience, each Russian nesting doll simply pulls apart to reveal the next one inside. Indeed. Yet try it for yourself. As you wish. Oh, you are a gentleman. And solving more people's problems. That's nice. So what we need to do then is basically just arrange the rings in order to get a flower pattern. So... Um, if you just want to have a look at the first one, fast forward it by about 20 seconds or so. So basically what it's going to be is like a purple flower on top. Then the two little flowers that are already there in the middle. And then another purple flower on the bottom. Next one, you are going to put a white flower on the top, a red one, a red slash orangey one second, purple one third, and two small flowers on the bottom. So it's white, red, purple, and two small ones. And finally, what we're going to do then is, with this one, we're going to turn the top ring to the right twice. So the top one, we're going to do it twice to the right, and then the bottom one to the left once. 
and that'll get the flower going and that will open up this I don't even want to know what the hell is on that head but uh, that's what we got so <laughs> interact with the bottom of it to my dearest friend is me um, but anyway after this we will be able to now go to compartment 205 to talk to Count Andreni for the first time to her strength of will, she rose to be the head of a museum of antiquities in St. Petersburg. Even though she now lives in Berlin, it is said that the Kremlin still fears her. She must be a formidable woman indeed. You are her maid? I am her companion. I help her in her daily tasks, and I keep her company. Ah, forgive me. You will have heard of Ratchet's murder last night. Yes, of course. Everyone is talking about it. Can you tell me how you occupied your time last night? Just after we left Istanbul, I had tea with my roommate, Fräulein Locke. I went to dinner with the princess, and when I returned to my compartment, Fräulein Locke was already asleep. A little later, Herr Michel, the conductor, came to get me because Madame la Princesse needed my help. Her back troubles her. I massaged her for about an hour. Do you remember the time? Ah, I'm sorry, I do not, mein Herr. Have you lost a handkerchief embroidered with an H, madame? Oh, no, monsieur. I thought perhaps since your first name is Hildegard. It is not mine, I tell you. I could not afford something so nice. I have no idea who it belongs to. My apologies. I did not mean to alarm you. Thank you for answering my questions, madame. Monsieur, I am Hercule... I know who you are, Monsieur Poirot. What do you want? Answers to a simple question or two. All right, but quickly. My wife is quite ill. I would like to stay by her side. I promise. First of all, I imagine you know about the murder. Of course. The Countess is terribly distressed. Your full name? Rodolphe Adreni. Your home is? Budapest. And how do you come to be aboard the Orient Express? I am a Hungarian diplomat. My family has represented our homeland since the revolution from the Soviet Union in 1956. I was on my country's business in Istanbul. Business which I cannot discuss. And your wife often accompanies you on your diplomatic missions? Yes, and why not? Okay, he's a handsome fellow, isn't he? And his wife is a lovely lady, too. So, Rudolf Andreni, he is Hungarian. He is 34. Now, compared to him, I look about 64, which is kind of depressing. I know it's just a video game. But he is then a diplomat. So you can confirm that, finish up your conversation, and then go to compartment 204 next door to talk to Hubby Hubs. Me down. Can you tell me how you spent last night? I was in our compartment with my wife. She went to bed early. I... I played a video game on my phone. Around 11 o'clock in the evening, my wife woke up and couldn't get back to sleep. She took a sleeping pill. As for me, I went to bed soon after that and slept straight through until morning. Have you ever been to the United States? I was posted to the Hungarian embassy in Washington for a year. You knew, perhaps, the Armstrong family? Armstrong? Armstrong. It is difficult to recall. One meets so many people. It was the kidnapping of a child, a very sad affair. The culprit was the man on this train who called himself Ratchet. The one who was murdered last night. Indeed. It sounds like justice finally caught up with him. Thank you for your time. Now, I'd like to speak to your wife, if you don't mind. It's impossible. As I told you, my wife is very ill. Thank you, and good luck with the investigation. Eh bien. The good Count does not appear to want me to talk to his wife.
Madame Hubbard, may I ask you a question or two? It won't take long. Anything I can do to help. Have you misplaced a handkerchief recently? No, I don't think so. Why? We found a handkerchief embroidered with the letter H, so I thought it might have been yours. I'm sorry, but it's not. It may belong to Miss Schmidt, Princess Dragomirov's lady's maid. I believe her first name is Hildegard. It is a possibility. Anyone could be lying, of course. I thank you, madame. Whose bloody handkerchief is this already? So next we're going to go to compartment 201. Man, this is just... Could somebody just... Just who basically who looks posh. I know Mr. Mustard Man thinks he does, but he's not. So, check the phone on the table first of all. Ooh, it's a Blackberry. Well, these ain't coming back in fashion anytime soon, are they? Because the buttons are about as big as your bloody nip. Um, so go ahead and talk to Mr. Hardman himself. Hello, Mr. Hardman, I believe. You have heard of the murder? Cyrus Hardman, yes. And the fact that there's been a murder is all over the train. You do not seem very concerned about it, monsieur. It's not the first murder I've run across. I had no idea the selling of toys was so dangerous. I did overhear you mention at dinner that this is your profession. Toy salesman is a cover. I'm a private detective. Just like you, from the U.S. So, Mr. Hard-Boiled Eggman, he is American? Because they're obviously mostly American. He is 55. He could probably get away with a 21-year-old if he didn't look 55. And his profession is private detective as well. Ooh, competition. That's the right answer. I did not expect to find another detective on this train. I just finished a job in Istanbul when I received an email from Ratchet. He hired me to protect him. Something you failed to do. I'm not happy about that. He'd received some threatening letters. I was supposed to watch his back, and yeah, something I failed to do. But he seemed to think he was in more danger when he left the train. He was traveling to Paris? I assume so, but I'm not entirely sure. Can anyone on this train confirm your identity? Yeah, that McQueen kid. Ratchet's secretary. Were you on duty last night? You bet. I kept my door open a crack and I watched all night. No one entered that car who didn't belong there. Did you see anything in particular? The conductor, Michelle. He was there most of the time, too, except for 15 minutes or so after we left Vinkovsky. He must have answered a call from Ratchet's room, then he was absent again for a while around 1 a.m. After that, he didn't move until 5. Monsieur Hardman, have you heard of the Armstrong case? Armstrong? The kidnapping three or four years ago? Who hasn't? Why? Ratchet's real name was Cassetti. I have reason to believe he was the kidnapper. What? He killed that little girl? No, I didn't know. If I had known, I wouldn't have taken the job. Do you have any idea who was behind the threatening letters? I don't know his name, but Ratchet told me he was a small man. Dark hair, with a womanish kind of voice. Oh, thank you for your help. Uh, is this handkerchief embroidered with an H yours? Do I look like the kind of guy who would use a handkerchief like that? <laughs> thank you for answering my questions, Monsieur Ardman. Listen, Poirot. I know I fell down on the job, but if you need help, any at all, let me know. I'd like to make it right. Thank you, hard-boiled Eggman. We will now leave. So, where we're going to go now is compartment 107 in order to talk to Princess Dragomirov, old Smirnoff head herself. Because you know, back in the day, you know, old Russian ladies these days are like, oh, I'm so polite. But they're like, 
Nah, boys. We smashed the vodka down us. We smashed the vodka down us. 68%. 69 and I owe you one. Uh, but she doesn't want to talk right now. So that's fine. We're going to go to Joanne Locke's compartment, which is 105, and talk to Buk and Contantin. Finished your investigation? No, but I have managed to solve a few mysteries. Okay. I stay here to watch this young lady. Excuse me, Doctor. May I ask you a question? Anything that can help the investigation, Mr. Poirot. I wanted to know what your first name is, Doctor. My name is Robert. Why? To find out if the handkerchief embroidered with an H could have been yours. I'm a doctor, Mr. Poirot. Cloth handkerchiefs are a playground for viruses. I would not touch one. So, since nobody is of any help here, we are now going to go to compartment 102. Yeah, big, pasty-headed, corned beef nose, yeah. So, go to compartment 102. We're going to check the book. There's going to be a little book that we're going to check first. Uh, just to the right on the bed. So, the call of the wild. Q. Right, so interact with that and then talk to Mr. Freddie Mercury himself. May I ask you a question? Anything I can do to help, Mr. Poirot? This handkerchief embroidered with an H. Is it yours? No, I don't use cloth handkerchiefs. Thank you. I won't bother you anymore. Seeing that, mind, he looks more like Moldy Old Bean than uh, Freddie Mercury, doesn't he? Um, so now we can go back to compartment 205, and we're going to talk to Count Andreni again. Now, to get the next achievement, you have to answer the four... Uh, we have to basically answer him four questions, and they have to be the exact same ones that I answer, uh, like I said, in order to convince the Count at the first attempt. So again, like I said, it's always worth making a couple of manual backup saves if you get a bit weary and a bit leery. It's always good to have something to go back to. So, first of all, ask for Mr. Andreni's help. Monsieur, if I am to catch this murderer, I will need your help. My help? I am at your service, Poirot. Then say, you love your wife, so you love your wife. Obviously a devoted husband, Count Andrini. My wife means the world to me. There were questions in Budapest about a Hungarian diplomat marrying an American woman. It did not deter you. I would have given up my position for her. I would think it is universal. Are you married, Mr. Poirot? No. I fear marriage is not for me, but... Her condition, is it very grave? She is suffering about a vertigo. You understand? The then next up, you were going to offer Dr. Constantine's help. So offer Dr. Constantine's help? I think Dr. Constantine could help your wife. There is a doctor on this train? I did not know. Where is this doctor? And then choose, you should go get him. So once this has been done, you will unlock the achievement. He is the doctor you're looking for, and then we can finally go in and speak to Countess Andreni herself. Thank you very much. Forgive me for intruding, madame. I am Hercule Poirot. I know who you are, Mr. Poirot. I overheard you send my husband on a wild goose chase. Your husband cares for you greatly, madame. I apologize for exploiting that fact. But the situation is urgent, and I need to ask you a few questions. Apology accepted. I realize you must speak to everyone. This horrendous murder. It's very upsetting. That is a beautiful music box. Please don't touch the music box. It's a fragile family heirloom. Your accent, is it American? Boston, perhaps? You have a good ear, Mr. Poirot. Yes. Born and raised in what we call the Back Bay. Are you in the diplomatic service like your husband? No, not officially. I was still in college when I met Rudy two years ago. I keep myself busy handling his scheduling, travel, appointments. 
Ah, what is this saying? Behind every great man there is a great woman. That was the saying. Today one might reverse the sentiment as well, don't you think? Of course. I stand corrected. So, El Countess, with the incredible body tattoo she got going on. Uh, she is American, she is 21, and she has no profession. I mean, to be fair, if you were married to a Hungarian diplomat, you'd probably need no profession. Just look good. Et voila. A handkerchief embroidered with an H was found at the crime scene. By any chance, does your first name begin with an H? No, my first name is Elena, with an E. Hmm. Can you tell me what you did last night? Well, my husband and I went to dinner. Then we came back here. We went to bed around 10 o'clock. I tried to sleep, but I couldn't because of the shaking of the train. I suffer from vertigo. I finally took a sleeping pill and that did the trick. When did the train's motion prevent you from sleeping? Between midnight and 2 a.m. I know because I must have looked at my watch about 10 times. Mm. Right, another confrontation coming up here. So we're gonna need to choose the option. Between midnight and 2 o'clock, I tried to sleep, but I couldn't because of the shaking of the train. So between midnight and 2 o'clock, shaky train. That's the lie. Calm now, Countess. You are not telling me the truth. Why do you say that? And then choose the option, train stopped. That is train stopped, and that'll be 14 out of 17 for confrontations. 30 a.m. due to snow. So there was no shaking of the train. But you told me that it was the shaking that prevented you from sleeping. I don't know. You're confusing me. My vertigo. Madame, a man died last night. You can't talk nonsense just because you're sick. You are hiding something from me. How dare you? I didn't do anything wrong. I'm going to find my husband. That was unkind, I know, but my strategy worked. I can now inspect this room in peace. Very unkind Poirot. Right, so let us inspect the jewelry stand. Uh, no, this is not the jewelry stand. Sorry, we'll we'll try that again. Um, <laughs> so the jewelry stand and the sleeping pills, which are on the nightstand. So there we go. Just on the nightstand next to the bed. There's the jewelry stand. How many times have I just said that in the last minute? And sleeping pills. Then everyone seems to enjoy these Farmer Sleep 3000s. I mean, if it's got 3000 in the name, you know it's going to be damn good. Uh, so now we can inspect the book on the sofa. And then we can finally inspect the music box after this and get some puzzles going. So there's a whole bunch of puzzles what we're going to do. So first of all, uh, we will turn it around in order to find... Where are we? Yes, this part. So spin it around. Now all you need to do then is put these squares in this order from left to right. Flower, leaf, and a bird. So a flower, a leaf, and a bird. Then hit the button at the top. That'll open it up. And we can grab whatever's inside. And what seems to be inside? Oh, it's a crank handle. Lovingly. Right, so pick up the crank handle of life. And now these dots on the bottom here, they're not random. They'll be the same every time. Uh, so don't worry about that. But we're going to switch to the other side now. A little bit further on. Just to insert the crank over on the right. Come on, you douche nozzle. There we go. Sorry, I got a little crappy there. So what you need to do then is just rotate it until the dots are basically in the same pattern as they were in the drawer. So if you can't remember what it is, just um, keep following it along and skip forward a few seconds to find it. It's actually this one right here, though. 
Yeah, it's actually that one. So once you've done that, you've interacted with the button. The top is open. And now we can use the crank again in order to rotate the figurine. Uh, so basically, what we need to do is get the same symbols that are on the base of the figurine until the symbols align. So for the first one, basically on the left is going to be the music note. So about here. And it's basically where the music and the star is. So that is what it should be looking like. If it doesn't work, it should be in a little order like that. Then open it up. And that will you will then pick up the necklace. Make sure to inspect it on both sides. An engraving written in, I believe, Russian Cyrillic. It looks like a first name. For my beautiful young ladies, Helena and Sonia. Helena with an H. It's Countess Andreni with an older girl. Poirot! Have you no shame? Monsieur, I am afraid shame is not a very helpful emotion for a detective trying to get at the truth. What are you doing in our compartment? I am investigating a murder, Count Andreni. My wife is ill! My apologies, monsieur, but your wife seemed in perfect health when she left the room to find you. I do apologize, but I needed to search your compartment. You will regret this, Poirot. Please, Count. You aren't going to challenge me to a duel, are you? Countess, I'm afraid I took the liberty of inspecting your little music box. How dare you! The message in the medallion was addressed to you and Sonia. Sonia Armstrong, your older sister, the mother of Daisy, the murdered child. I am a Hungarian diplomat. You have no official standing here. You have no right to search- No, Rudolf. Let me speak. It's useless to deny what this gentleman says. I am Helena Goldenberg, the sister of Sonia Armstrong, and Daisy was my niece. The music box is a gift from my sister's godmother, a very close friend to my mother. We hid the truth from you when we learned that the man killed last night was the person who destroyed my family. I panicked. I didn't want to be accused. That is also why you lied about the H in your first name? Exactly. Your ferreting about looking for the H is obviously part of your investigation. If I found a anchor chief in Monsieur Ratchet's room embroidered with an H, I might suspect you had been there. A handkerchief? I don't have any handkerchiefs embroidered with my initial. To be honest, that sounds awfully old-fashioned to me. I give you my word of honor that last night, Helena never left her compartment. My wife is telling you the truth, Poirot. I hope so. I'll let you rest. The matter of the H on the anchor chief still needs clearing up. But first, I should check the inscription on the back of the medallion. Dun, dun, dun. Bombshell! Okay, back into the mind map with that bombshell then. So, translation of the engraving. All you're going to do on the bottom of the letters is spell out the name Natalia, which will be N-A-T-A-L-I and then Y-A in the last box. So, Natalia. Beautiful name, I like that. Natalia, Natalia. Would it be Natalia Dragomirov? She is the only Russian passenger on the train. In addition, her first name begins with an H in Cyrillic. That was easy. I keep saying it's easy, but he hasn't actually uh, solved the case yet, has he? 
Right, next up, we're going to go back to compartment 107 in order to speak to Princess Draga Smirnoff again. I am not prepared to receive any- I'm sorry, madam, but a man has been murdered. I must ask you a few questions. You must have misunderstood me. I cannot speak to you just now. Madam, I know that Sonia Armstrong is your goddaughter. Come in, please. Please forgive my intrusion, madam, but I really must ask you some questions. Then ask. I'll answer if it pleases me. Hmm, we have not been properly introduced, yet I have observed her a couple of times, so I can already deduce some... And time for a bit more character analyzationing. So, she will be, and is, Russian. 26, oh, sorry honey, you can't get away with that one. But she is 85, and her profession is that she is a director of a museum. I'm right again. That happens to me. I will first ask you about last night. Will you tell me your movements? I went to bed just after dinner. I read until 11, then tried to sleep. Later I woke. What caused you to awaken? I suffer from back pain, a consequence of old age interfering with an active life. I called Schmidt around 12.45 a.m., to give me a massage. She did so until I fell asleep. How long was she with you? A good hour, I would say. I see. The first initial of your first name, Natalia, in the Cyrillic alphabet looks exactly like the letter H in the Latin alphabet. I'm Russian, Monsieur Poirot and I was the head of a museum of antiquities in St. Petersburg for decades, until I moved to Berlin recently. <laughs> I'm familiar with Cyrillic. This handkerchief is yours, isn't it? Uh, yes, indeed. I lost it. It was found in Monsieur Ratchet's room. Can you explain to me why Madame Schmidt didn't identify the handkerchief. She must have known it was yours. Possibly to protect me. She is very loyal. Your next question will be, how did my handkerchief come to be lying by a murdered man's body? My reply to that is that I have no idea. That is not an answer, madame. It is all I am able to give you. I must tell you, Princess Dragomirov, I have discovered something astonishing. And that is? You are Sonia Armstrong's godmother. You make that sound like a revelation. I have never hidden the fact, monsieur. You knew Colonel Armstrong well, then? I knew him slightly. But his wife, Sonia Armstrong, was my goddaughter. I was on terms of friendship with her mother, the actress Linda Arden. Linda Arden was a genius one of the greatest tragic actresses in the world. I was not only an admirer of her art, I was a personal friend. Very well. But this links you to the Armstrong kidnapping case. Helena Andreni is the sister of Sonia Armstrong, the late mother of Daisy Armstrong, kidnapped and killed by the man who was murdered on this train. Ratchet. Indeed. Was it he? Then justice has at last been served. Allow me to summarize. Do I have a choice? First coincidence, I shall call it. You are close to the Armstrong family, and the presumed assassin of Daisy Armstrong was killed while you were on board the same train. Second coincidence. Your handkerchief happens to be found at the foot of the victim's bed. Third coincidence. 
one of these stab wounds inflicted on the body was by a left-handed person. You are left-handed. That is a lot of coincidences, Princess Dragomirov. Well, Monsieur Poirot, call it fate. If you report to the police your coincidences, they will laugh. A woman of my age and frailty has violently murdered a man? With how many potential witnesses who saw me doddering along the corridor in the middle of the night like Lady Macbeth? You are right, princess. You could not work alone, which means you have one or more accomplices. And it is only a matter of time before I find out who they are. I would appreciate it if you would remove yourself from my room and take your fantasies with you. So next up then, we need to now go after a long conversation there with Mrs. Smirnoff Ice. We need to go back into the mind map and cross-check new alibis. So cross-checking new alibis. First of all, it's going to be Ms. Andreni and Mr. Andreni, because they's married. Uh, Princess Smirnoff and Ms. Schmidt, your pants. Uh, Mr. Foscarelli and Mr. Mustard Man, who basically is a Tory. Who's the scum? Uh, Mr. Hardman and Mr. Michael. And then after this is done, we can actually uh, we just go back into the Smirnoff princess's room and just check the parrot. And then once we've checked the parrot, we can then leave and talk to Signor Buk. Oh, Poirot, you're there. She hasn't moved, but she seems to be waking up little by little. What about you? Your investigation progresses? I find myself helping everyone with their problems before they can help me with mine. I have shifted boxes, helped with hangovers, repaired an orange juicer, unlocked some Russian dolls, all so my investigation can proceed. Don't forget the dessert recipe. How can I? Truly, the labors of Hercules. My friend, I would rather clean out the Orgeon stables. Yet, I have managed to solve a few mysteries. Oh, tell me everything. The embroidered handkerchief belongs to Princess Dragomirov. I also found out that she was Sonia Armstrong's godmother. On the same train with the little girl's murderer? Exactly. Also, Elena Andreni is the younger sister of Sonia Armstrong, Daisy's mother. Another passenger connected to the Armstrong case? Yes, Book. What are the odds, do you think? But I cannot see either woman stabbing Ratchet over and over again in a frenzy. And they apparently have alibis. I had three theories concerning the broken watch. It could have been tampered with. It could have been out of adjustment before the murder. Or, of course, it could indicate the actual time of the murder. The only hypothesis I could rule out was that the watch was out of adjustment. For the others, they are impossible to verify. So, the watch is of little use to the investigation. And I was convinced that it indicated the time of the crime. Two women involved in the Armstrong case. Let us not forget our patient here. There are three women. Look, she seems to be waking up. What's happening to me? Did I fall asleep again? Uh, indeed, Mademoiselle Locke. Did you take any medication? Sleeping pills, for example? No. I never use sleeping pills. I inspected your cup. You can clearly see that there is a residue of something at the bottom. I'm sure a lab test would confirm you were drugged. Most likely an overdose. That would explain your battle to shake off the effects. You think Fräulein Schmidt did it? She certainly had the most opportunity, but why would she? But no one knew who I was. And for the final time in Chapter 6, before this one finishes, straight into the workshop, 
Ms. Locke drugged? Yes, so the two suspects, most likely suspects who have drugged her is Mr. Michael, that's so not right, and Ms. Schmidt yourself. I, Schmidt, or Monsieur Michel, may have drugged the tea that Mademoiselle Locke drank. Fraulein Schmidt or Pierre Michel could have drugged your tea. They are really the only two people on this train who could have done it. But why would either one do it? Mr. Poirot, I'm feeling much better. I'd like to bring you up to date to why I ended up on this train. If you are able, I would very much like you to finish your story. Very well, then. After the Daisy Armstrong case was officially closed, I put out a standing request to the police departments in the Boston area for anything on Michael Clark. But he didn't turn up on their radar. I even set up an anonymous tip line for news about Clark. That's how I met Braid, a sketchy contact on the dark web, but they found nothing I could use. Four long years passed without anything new. Okay, so this is a nice, relatively short chapter. We're basically just staying in Joanna's room. We're, we're just going to look at some stuff and do some stuff and try and get some stuff going. A couple of puzzles again, as usual, but nothing too bad. Right, so if you want to, as you begin, the, there's a golden mustache in the floor in the corner in the little cat cave. Um, but we'll I'll grab that one in a bit. So first of all, we are going to go and check the book on the right Nightstand, first of all. I've read it probably ten times. Already. Moby so Dick. You there? cannot say that anymore, because, you know, people would be fuming. Like, oh my god, the whale's not a dick. He's so nice. Uh, anyway, inspect the items on the box, which is going to be an envelope, a travel magazine, and a case file. A bill from the power company with, I'm sure, plenty of excuses why my rates keep going up. Travel. For the discriminating traveler. Also for the overworked detective who never seems to have time for a vacation. Well, I can dream, can't I? Years of no new leads in the Armstrong case. And then this. Michael Clark. The sarcastic reporter. My prime suspect in the kidnapping. Murdered four years ago? Ye Michael Cl This is Michael Clark? He doesn't look anything like the journalist I interviewed. Michael, you have earned a place on my evidence board. <laughs> Oh my gosh, more revelations, huh? Right, so in the box, we are going to interact with everything, but just leave the keys for last. Okay. To interact with the toy, the cutter, the duct tape, the bottle of wine, the hairbrush, and then finally the keys. So clever. All that evidence, and yet no DNA found. The only fingerprints found on the bottle were Suzanne's. Suzanne's hair, so conveniently left in the cabin for us to find. It was planted. I knew she was innocent. So there was a little bit of an edit there. Joanne will talk some stuff about the keys. So first of all, what we're going to do is find what looks like a kind of um, a red dot in... In fact, no, we're going for this bullhorn thing first. So what you need to do then is basically just press the eyes in order what they need to be pressed. So it's left, right, left, left, right, left. So left, right, left, left, right, left, and go ahead and just inspect the knife. Sorry, I have done that puzzle a little bit quick there. That's my bad. Possession alone can lead to serious jail time. Uh, yes, of course. 
So once that is done, we can now go ahead and interact with the red dice looking thing. So all you got to do then is just basically enter the code 3569. As you can see, there are lines at the bottom of the 6 and the 9 indicating which one it is. But just find the numbers 3569. What do we find? A capsule and a smell. Bitter almonds. Cyanide. So next one, we're going to interact with the torch with what looks like a sun on it, because it actually is a sun on it. So all you got to do then is just turn all three rings to make a sun and then press the bottom, uh, press the button at the bottom and then inspect the pocket. Lock picks. Sorry, it's starting to get quite late as I'm recording. And my voice is getting old Marge Simpson in there. What do we have here? A flashlight. They can also conceal knives, but in this case we have... Lock picks. And finally then, it is the ball. So what are you going to do then? Uh, we'll just turn it around where we can interact it. You need to turn the left side up once. There we go, until we've got eyes, skull eyes, and then the top and bottom parts, either left or right, basically until we get the full skull. It is as easy as that. Hmm, a USB key. Let's plug it into my PC and see what nasty little secret it contains. So as you can see, the golden mustache there is on the floor in the corner, just in the cat house, the cat bed, whatever. That's the only one in this level, so grab that one. Now we're going to go over to our desk. We're going to check the printer. I know. Then we're going to use the laptop. It's basically a bit of back and forth we're going to do now. So, uh, so yeah, Michael Clark's name is actually Cassetti. Lanfranco Cassetti. So just inspect the driver's license and then go across another screen in order to interact with the money. Goes on the board. Maybe they needed to show the ransom to someone to check if the serial numbers were still on record. I'll print them and on the wall they go. So head down to Lanfranco Cassetti absolutely and absolutely nothing. Well, that sucks. So back out now a couple of times anyway. Of course, this is not going to be the end. Uh, so on the left nightstand by the bed, we're going to check Daisy's photo and the travel magazine. And then just go ahead and inspect the evidence board. So this is where we're going to do some connecting of this other stuff. So first of all, we're going to connect the autopsy report tattoo, which is in the top of this little area somewhere. Uh, so, yep, find autopsy report tattoo. There it is, right at the very top. And connect that with third photo of the ransom. This tattoo is the same on both pictures. Next up, choose, find and choose the Michael Clark I met four years ago. There it is. And then connect that with Michael Clark, the journalist found dead yesterday. I knew it. The faces don't match at all. They are clearly two different men. I should run facial recognition on my computer. And then again, the Michael Clark I met four years ago and driver's license of Lanfranco Cassetti. 
So Ratchet's real name was Cassetti. Right, so now we should be good to back out and go back to the laptop. So we're going to choose facial recognition this time and select the photo in the top right corner, the ratchet, what we know from the first episode of The Train. A uh, bit of Bradley Walsh there in the bottom right hand corner. Yeah. Maybe whoever he really is has finally made a mistake. That could be him, but he looks pretty different. And then make sure to choose these four. It's going to be hair, glasses, nose, and beard. So hair, glasses, nose, and beard. Okay. He's changed his appearance a lot. Probably had some plastic surgery on his nose. But there is no doubt it's the same person. Let's see why he was arrested. Mr. Ratchet. You didn't just steal statuettes. What recent information does the database have on you? So we have uh, now go down to Samuel Ratchet. Oh, it's so frustrating. Oh, I can't find anything about him. So interact with him as much as you can. And then we're going to back out and talk to Brady Boy, the Brady Bunch. We are monitoring this call. Hello, Braid. Long time. Oh, Joanna. Hey, how may I assist you? I need you to search the dark web. Yeah, uh, can you narrow that down a little? Because, uh, it's pretty big and pretty dark out here. Could you find intel about a Samuel Ratchet? Samuel Ratchet. Got it. Bad dude? They don't come worse. Send me what you find by email. All right, hang on. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh-huh, okay, nope, nope, and okay, oh, this might be something. I gotta do a deeper dive, but uh, you should find this interesting. Could be coincidence if I believed in them. Emailing details. Domo arigato, Mr. Robato. We're here to save mankind. Oh, it's a cookbook! So, once again, use the laptop and get the email from Brady Boy. And then just interact with it and go ahead and inspect the evidence board again. The Orient Express. I'm going to print these tickets and put them on the board. So, what we're going to do is look for Boston shooting victims still unidentified. So, the Boston shooting victims still unidentified. And we're going to press the A button and put that with Samuel Ratchet, Samuel Ratchet arrested in Armenia a week ago. And then when that is done, we're going to choose Samuel Ratchet arrested in Armenia a week ago. And the same Michael Clark I met four years ago. So, Sam Ratchet, the rested, and the Michael Hello, Clark I met four Clark. years ago. Hello, Samuel Ratchet, the man who stole your identity and your life. Next up, choose Samuel Ratchet, arrested in Armenia a week ago again, and Ratchet's Orient Express ticket. This is Ratchet's ticket. Then choose Hector McQueen's Orient Express ticket. And then District Attorney McQueen retires. <gasps> nya, nya, nya. The person traveling with Ratchet has the same last name as my district attorney during the Armstrong case? Next up, just connect all of the three Orient Express tickets together. These tickets were all booked by McQueen. So head back onto your trusty laptop again and interact with Heck 
Mr. McQueen. And then after the bit of dialogue here, we can inspect the travel magazine on the left nightstand. Make sure to get the front and the back. He goes on the evidence board. The Orient Express departs from Istanbul next week. Interesting. I'll put it on the board. The event? Some old train? But that face, that man. Back to the evidence board now, man. So we're going to connect John Armstrong. We'll be in the top left-hand corner. Eventually, we'll get there eventually. So John Armstrong and connect him to Fortuna's spokesman travels on the Orient Express. I know that face. That's John Armstrong's driver. Next up, connect Hector McQueen and District Attorney Attorney McQueen retires. Hector McQueen is the son of District Attorney McQueen. And then once again, choose Hector McQueen and Hector McQueen's Orient Express ticket. Here's what Hector McQueen looks like. And once again, we are going to connect Hector McQueen and Samuel Ratchet arrested in Armenia a week ago. This guy works for Ratchet, and if that's a coincidence, I'll eat my badge. So choose Samuel Ratchet arrested in Armenia a week ago and driver's license of Alan Franco Cassetti. Then choose for the final four, choose the Orient Express will leave Istanbul next week. Uh, it's right in the middle, by the way. There we go. The Orient Express will leave Istanbul next week. And Fortuna's spokesman travels on the Orient, the Orient Express. Orient Express next week. Then the Orient Express will leave Istanbul next week. And Edward Masterman's Orient Express ticket. A certain Edward Masterman will be on the Orient Express. And then it's basically the same for the other two. So the Orient Express will leave Istanbul next week. And then Hector McQueen's ticket. And then Orient Express, Istanbul, and Ratchet's Orient Express ticket. Orient Express next week. Ratchet will be traveling on the Orient Express in a week. Damn, Ratchet is taking the Orient Express next week. McQueen, the district attorney's son, is too. Foscarelli, the Armstrong chauffeur, is too. It can't be a coincidence. McQueen and Foscarelli must have decided to take revenge and will undoubtedly attack Ratchet on this train. I have to be on the Orient Express to stop them. And above all, I must stop Ratchet. But I can't do it in Istanbul because there's no extradition treaty with the United States. Ratchet can never be judged in the U.S. without an extradition treaty. I'll have to wait until he's in Paris to have him arrested. Okay, so we're almost done with chapter 7 finally. We're going to go ahead, use the laptop, and when you get the option to, make sure to select buy a ticket from someone. Every compartment is taken for this special anniversary journey. Oh, it's impossible to find a ticket. What can I do? Let's find out who's traveling on the Orient Express. Time to call Braid. Braid! It's me again. I haven't found anything useful yet. I need one last favor. But it's a big one. Uh-oh. Can you find me the list of passengers of the Orient Express for that anniversary trip? Hold on. Jeez, their IT is surprisingly good. Maybe because of the big event. I found the list, but they sealed my back door as I was starting to capture it. Oh, no. Whoa, calm down. I got one name. 
female. The name I got before they kicked me up the server was Stacy Johnson. Do you feel like a Stacy Johnson? The question is, how is she going to feel about helping me? That's one you'll have to figure out for yourself. I gotta go back to weaving my magic on the web. Right, so now we're going to use the laptop one more time and interact with the name Stacy Johnson. Now, there's just a couple of specific dialogue options that you've got to pick here. So once we call her um, and we've finished it, Chapter 7 will be done. Hello. Is this so, first up, you're going to say, I'm a police detective, which you are. My name is Joanna Locke. I'm a police detective. And I'm just an actress. Now what did I do wrong? Nothing. I need your help. I need to take your place in the Orient Express. Is this a joke? No. Next up, uh, choose talk about the Armstrong case. Do you remember the Armstrong kidnapping? Of course I do. That poor little girl. I'm a police officer. I have a new lead that may help me find her killer. Wait, didn't they prove it was the nanny? Next, say I have new evidence. I have found compelling new evidence. I've reopened my investigation. You know, I had my doubts about the murderous nanny. I played a nanny a couple years ago in a slasher. I was killed in the first episode, but it got me interested in helping. Next up, say you understand the situation. Stacy, please, you say you help kids? Well, I joined a couple of associations who are trying to help underprivileged kids. If this little girl's real killer is still out there somewhere, I'd do anything I could to help. Getting me on that train will help more than you can imagine. So, you want my ticket for the Orient Express? But I booked it months ago. I was so much... And finally, say, make a nice gesture, and we are finally done. Stacy, I can tell you care about kids. Here's your chance to help put this beast in prison for the rest of his life. Think of the publicity for those causes you care about. Think about the kids. The kids. Yeah. All right. We'll do it for Daisy and the kids who suffer. I'll take care of changing the tickets to your name and send it to you. Get him. Make him pay. I will. Thank you so much. Stacy was as good as her word. I received the ticket. I called my chief to let him know I was taking my vacation time. I had coming. I flew to Istanbul. I was finally going to nail the monster responsible for Daisy Armstrong's death, Michael Clark's death, even his accomplice, and, I suspected, so many others as well. You know the rest. And that's how I found myself on this train, on Ratchet's trail. The rest you know. My identity is easily checked with the Berkshire police. Thank you for your detailed account, Mademoiselle Locke. In addition to giving us crucial details of the investigation, you have made it clear that there are many who might wish to... So the answer doesn't really matter here. You can choose innocent or suspect. I just chose innocent because she's obviously innocent, isn't she? I know you are innocent. Your forthright testimony and your movements, or lack of them, last night, eliminate you from our list of suspects. I agree, without a doubt. Another detective will be great help to the investigation. Book. Although my friend certainly does not need any help. You are too kind. Thank you for believing me. I'd like to help in any way I can. Do not worry, Mademoiselle Locke. Already I see things more clearly. It's obvious whoever drugged you was trying to derail your investigation. You mean the person who did this to me is Ratchet's killer? Both Monsieur Michel and Fraulein Schmidt had the means and opportunity to drug you. While you get your strength back, I intend to interview them. Excellent idea, my friend. All this excitement has 
whetted my appetite. I'm sure Mademoiselle Locke won't say no to a good, invigorating meal. What? No. I want to hear what the conductor and Fräulein Schmidt have to say for themselves. It is my duty to ensure the well-being of the passengers. If Dr. Constantine has no objection, I will escort you to the restaurant car. On the contrary, some food will do her the greatest good. Well, I'm still a little shaky. Mr. Poirot, will you please keep me informed about what you learn? You may be certain of it. Right now, mate, turn around and speak to Hector Freddy... Oh, no. Yeah, Freddy Mercury. Or the, uh... What do I call him? Moldy old beanie or something, wasn't it? Yeah, I forgot now. I'm starting to deflate in my brain. Bro, I didn't see you. Entropy? Randomness in a system or something? Yes. Unpredictability. Even the best laid plans can go astray, thanks to something as simple as... An unexpected passenger? Perhaps. Or snow. Right, so now we're going to go to the lounge and talk to Mrs. Schmidt, your pants. Good evening, Fräulein Schmidt. May I disturb you for a moment? You asked so politely, mein Herr. But I do now we're going to choose Ms. Locke Wakes Up. So yeah, this basically, this whole chapter is just question heavy rather than doing anything else. Uh, but there are another three mustaches that we're going to grab. So Ms. Locke Wakes Up first. And the next answer is going to be Residue in Cup. So choose the answer Residue in Cup. Unfortunately, she doesn't remember much, but we found a residue of a sleeping pill in her cup of tea. Since you two were alone together in your room when she drank it, who else but you could have dragged her? Must I point out I do not make the tea on this train? You should. Next option, say, she almost died. And then Miss Schmidt will really Schmidt herself. Mademoiselle Locke could have died. Whoever drugged her must not feel any empathy for their fellow human beings, given the dose that Mademoiselle Locke ingested. She was close to death. Oh, my God. What did I do? I didn't want to hurt her. Just have her sleep for a few hours while we had time. We? Time for what? Time for what, Madame Schmidt? You think I feel nothing? Nothing? That poor, poor little girl. Indeed, that poor, poor little girl. Fräulein Schmidt is somehow connected to the Armstrong case. And for the next answer, we are going to choose the Armstrong's cook. Now, if you were quite observant, when you were driving away as Joanna, you could see her in the top right window. Um, but if not, well, it's there to see if you want to play through the whole game again. Maybe. I have a certain reputation for sniffing out... I am not a murderer! Forgive me, but I was going to say brilliant chefs. You were the Armstrong family's cook, were you not? But, yes, I was the cook of that lovely, lovely family. I'm sorry, but I must ask you to give me some time to, to collect myself. It wasn't supposed to be like this, my darling, my poor darling child. I will give you that time, Fräulein. You have given me much more in exchange. I must check in with my other suspects to make Right, mate. Time to head to the bar. Let's get ourselves a little uh, drinky drinky yum yum ding ding. So uh, we're going to head to the bar and what we're actually going to do is collect the golden moustache, which is the first out of three on the level from the shelf just behind the bar here. So pick that one up and then go ahead and speak to Jean once more. Can I get you something, Monsieur Poirot? Everyone is so tense. Uh, an aperitif soon, Monsieur Fauché, with pleasure, when the matter is resolved. Okay, not a lot of conversation going on there. Right, 
go to the restaurant and we're going to talk to Joanne Locke again. You're right, Mr. Book. This dessert is delicious. I'm glad we didn't wait for dinner. I promise the entree will be superb as well. Detective Locke, you are recovering well, I see. Yes. I should be helping with the investigation. Do you know who drugged me? It is early yet for conclusions. When I return, then we shall see. Do not worry, Poirot. She is in good hands. Otaru, Freya, and yours truly... Oh, what a surprise. Old croissant head is already waiting for dinner and dessert. <laughs> anyway, uh, next we're going to enter the kitchen and we're going to get the next golden mustache. So enter the kitchen, go to the shelf on the right to collect. It's just hanging like a beautiful, well, golden mustache, if anything. So that's number two out of three. You should now be on 27 out of 40 for the game. Next, we're going to go... Um, through to the storage car, but we're going to go to room 301, which should be on our left just as we come up here. So go into room 301 and speak to, no, Mikey, that's so not right. Good evening, Michelle. Am I bothering you? You seem stressed with everything that's going on. I must admit, it's difficult to be relaxed. Of course, I understand. Especially since we know that Detective Locke's tea was drugged before it was served to her. Detective? Come now, Michel. Surely you would have taken the opportunity to search her things and found her badge. Luckily, she woke up and was finally able to tell us her story. Otaru boiled the water, Jean made the tea. I just brought it. Sir, it could have been any of this stuff. Your defense is to accuse others? You have a network connection? No, unfortunately. It's just an automatic reminder to pay my rent. I always forget and my landlord complains. Pierre Michel had to be involved in the murder. The drugged tea? his post at the end of the hall, and now I know why I know more than one of those people on the screen. So, quick cheeky couple of more to answer here. Who is the person on the left? Pierre Michel. Pierre. Right. Who is the person in the middle? It's obviously going to be Suzanne Moreau. So, Ms. Morova. And then who is the person on the right? It's going to be Cyrus Hardman. What the hell's going on? That was easy. You are the father of Suzanne Moreau, Daisy Armstrong's nanny. My condolences on the death of your wife. What? But I... My wife... Enough lies. Suzanne does not bear your name? No. Suzanne's mother and I were divorced. Suzanne kept her mother's name. My most sincere condolences, Monsieur Michel, on the deaths of Suzanne and your wife. This job. I loved them, but I was never there for them. Then, a year after the divorce, Solange became ill. Suzanne took her to this special hospital in the U.S., got that job as Daisy's nanny. I understand your pain. And the reason that led you to drug Detective Luck. <sighs> we really can't hide anything from you, can we? Many have been foolish enough to try and keep the truth from Hercule Poirot. Yes, I admit, I drugged the tea. But it was only to keep her quiet, until we... I could... But she reacted so much to the sleeping pills. She was lucky, as are you, that she didn't die. Started tying everything quite nicely now. So, what is Mr. Hardman's relationship with Mr. Michael? Mr. Hardman was the future son-in-law of Mr. Mike. Monsieur Hardman was Suzanne's fiancé. Huh. I have the impression my whole life to you is an open book. Yes, Cyrus was my daughter's fiancé. 
I almost consider Cyrus as my own son. Of course. Much more is clear now. I have been patient long enough. It is time to go and see what all the commotion is next door. So just go ahead, head into the next room and start talking to the soft boy leg man. Monsieur Hardman, excellent. The gods who watch over detectives must have trapped you here. Why didn't they watch over me? I'm a detective too. I, um... I was talking to Michelle about a, a leaky faucet, and I wanted to go out, but, um, you showed up. No need to invent some preposterous story. But really, I... Michelle has told me everything. You are the fiancé of Suzanne Moreau, his daughter. Oh. I see. Surely this is not a big surprise to you. No. Suzanne was the only woman I ever loved. And I failed her. We got into a spat. It was nothing, but I was too proud to apologize. We weren't speaking at all. Suzanne never really cared for that guy, Noah. She would have forgiven me. If only... If only... If only... And once you are done finishing up your conversation, we're going to get the third and final golden moustache of the level in the sink in this very room. So just turn around. There it is, beautiful. Golden, glimmering, fantastic. Oh, it's gonna start getting all mired now. Gonna have to do some quick bit of mind maps in just a bit. So there's the third one done. Should that's twenty out of twenty-eight out of forty for the game. Uh, go ahead and check the game chef's kiss on the table. And then what we're gonna do from here? We'll go back to the restaurant and talk to Joanne. So, my friend, tell me, you have something new? Mademoiselle, look. I know who drugged you. Fräulein Schmidt and our conductor, Pierre Michel, both admitted putting sleeping pills into your tea. This explains your overdose. They are relieved you are recovering. Michel drugged a passenger? On behalf of the company. I offer my apologies to you, Mademoiselle Luck. Michelle will answer for this outrage. Both of them? I was pretty sure about Fräulein Schmidt, but I admit that I did not suspect the conductor. I have uh, uncovered multiple connections with the Armstrong case. Pierre Michel is the father of Suzanne Moreau, Little Daisy's nanny, and Monsieur Hardman was Suzanne's fiancée. As for Hildegard Schmidt, she was the cook of the Armstrong family. What a coincidence, don't you think? But it's incredible! What are the odds that so many people linked to that tragic affair ended up on the same train? About the same as you winning the lottery, my friend. I wasn't the officer who interviewed Fräulein Schmidt back then. So she couldn't recognize me here on the train. How could they know who I was? There were other passengers who might have. Or she may have seen you when you visited the Armstrong home. It is now clear to me that some of the clues to this elaborate plot Man, that is an angry-looking Poirot right now. Okay, so, what did they want me to believe? The murderer got on the train at Vinkovsky, killed Ratchet, and got off immediately. So it should be the top option. Got on the train, killed, and got off. I'm right again. That happened. Some clues and information collected so far could lead to a hypothesis. The murderer boarded the train in Vinkovsky killed Ratchet, and then left the train immediately. How did you come to that possibility? Monsieur Hardman told me about a short man with a high-pitched voice who threatened Ratchet. Imagine for a moment that this man, wearing a wagon lee conductor's jacket, killed him while Michel was on the platform at Vinkovsky. This murderer 
then hid the conductor's jacket in Detective Locke's room, then fled before the train left. Why choose Detective Locke's room? Why, indeed. Let me re-explain from the beginning. Allow me to explain. Right, first of all, it is the train stops at Vinkovsky at midnight. Mr. Michel goes down to the platform. That is in the first slot. Number two, the murderer boards the train disguised as a conductor. Number three, the murderer kills Ratchet and exits through Madame Hubbard's room. So the murderer kills Ratchet and exits through Hubbard's room. Number four is going to be the murderer leaves the knife there, losing a jacket button in the process. Number five, the murderer gets rid of the jacket. Number six, the murderer gets off the train. So the murderer gets off the train. And then, of course, number seven, Pierre Michael, no Mikey, no, gets back on the train, which leaves at 12.10 a.m. Et voilà. Mon Dieu. Oui. That must be it. Everything fits so well. It fits too well, my friend. Other clues lead to a second hypothesis. And the next, for the next answer then, you're going to choose. There are several murderers, all related to the Armstrong case, which we are going to find out in just a little bit. So there's several murders all related to the Armstrong case. We're going to do one final mind map, and then we are going to do, I mean, the last part takes a long while with talking and answering questions, but basically you've got to, I'll tell you when we're coming up to it, but we need to do that bit without making any mistakes, so it's always worth just making a save, a manual save just in case. A small town official who could easily be misled. Um, Mr. Poirot? <laughs> Detective Locke, forgive me. You are an obvious exception. You tracked Ratchet with the tenacity of a bloodhound. Unfortunately for the killers, they not only had you to deal with, but now they had, and I say this with all modesty, the world's greatest detective, Hercule Poirot, dropped into the midst of their meticulous planning. Multiple murderers? Multiple detectives? Poirot, please take pity on me. Who is linked to this case, and who is not? My poor friend, I have gone speeding out of the station without you. I will continue. So, who we're going to be choosing then is Natalia Dragomirov. So, who are the no nine people we know connected? Uh, Dragomirov first, then Foscarelli. Make sure to be picking these, of course. Then Cyrus Hardman. Hardman, sorry, then Joanna Locke, Hector McQueen, Pierre Michel, Helena Andreni, Samuel Ratchet, and then Hildegard Schmittenbags. So once you have confirmed all these, we will now go to the lounge car for the final presentation. Now it's from when we go to the lounge car. That is when we are going to do all these questions and answers and you cannot make a mistake in order to get the world's greatest detective achievement. So if you want to, just before going to the lounge, just in case, always worth, like I said, making a manual save because it does take about 20, 25 minutes. On this train. And finally, Detective Locke discovered that Mr. Foscarelli was the Armstrong chauffeur. If we add Detective Luck and Ratchet of the 12 passengers in that coach, nine have a connection with the Armstrong case. What next, Poirot? Or should I say, who next? It is time to summon everyone. Everyone? Even Dr. Constantine? The train crew other than Michel? Dr. Constantine, yes. I will need him. But we don't want the others as witnesses. I will see that their duties keep them occupied elsewhere. Excellent. I have always thought this moment in a case is much like Rodin unveiling the thinker before a captivated audience. A work of art. 
Have you not felt that way, detective? No, Mr. Poirot. I'm happy just to slap the cuffs on him. Well, there is some artistry in that as well, I suppose. Where would you like the unveiling, Poirot? Uh, the lounge? Perfect. Then I will gather all the passengers in the lounge. So this is where it's going to start as soon as we enter the lounge. It's a lot of talking and a lot of answering questions. And again, remember, we cannot make a mistake. So listen to what I say very carefully. Huh? Monsieur Book, are the train crew locked in their quarters? Yes, they are. Then the stage is set for the final act. Ladies and gentlemen, I have gathered you together to hear my reconstruction of the murder of Samuel Edward Ratchet, also known as Cassetti. There is not one, but two possible solutions of the crime. I shall put them both before you, and I shall ask Monsieur Book and Dr. Constantine here to judge which solution is the correct one. Two solutions? Mr. Poirot, I am hardly qualified. Nevertheless, your assistance is required. Now, you all know the facts of the case. Ratchet was found stabbed to death this morning. He was last known to be alive at 12.37 a.m. last night, when he spoke to the wagon lit conductor through the door. His watch was found to be badly dented, and it had stopped at a quarter past one. Dr. Constantine, who examined the body, puts the time of death as having occurred between midnight and two in the morning. At half an hour after midnight, as you all know, the train ran into a snowdrift. After that time, it was impossible for anyone to leave the train. So, here is my first theory. The enemy, as Ratchet expected, joined the train at Vinkovsky by the door left open by Captain Arbuthnot and Monsieur McQueen, who had just descended to the platform. He was equipped with a wagon lit jacket, which he wore over his ordinary clothes, and a pass key which enabled him to gain access to Ratchet's compartment in spite of the doors being locked. Ratchet was under the influence of a sleeping draft. This man stabbed him with great ferocity, a dozen wounds in all. He left the compartment through the communicating door to Madame Hubbard's compartment. Yes, that's so. Scared me half out of my wits. The murderer thrust the dagger he had used into Mrs. Hubbard's handbag in passing. Without knowing it, he lost a button of his uniform. Then he slipped out of the compartment and along the corridor. He put the uniform jacket into Detective Locke's suitcase to cast suspicion on her. And a few minutes later, dressed in his ordinary clothes, he left the train just before it started off again, using the same means for egress, the door near the dining car. That is the first hypothesis. But there's a second. For that, we must examine the mo- So, first up, make sure to choose revenge. Why was Rashid killed? Revenge. The motive is clear. Revenge, of course. Nothing was stolen, and we know that Ratchet had made many enemies. This was a premeditated crime. Next up, when was the crime planned? Make sure to choose several months before departure from Istanbul. So several months before departure. 
Since the kidnapping and death of little Daisy Armstrong, which traumatized many people close to the family. Even when the police concluded that it was Suzanne Moreau, questions remained. Detective Locke continued her investigation, as did others. They became convinced the truth lay elsewhere. We now know who the real... And who is Daisy's real killer? Make sure to choose Ratchet. Ratchet himself. It is clear now that Daisy's killer was Ratchet, also known as Cassetti and Michael Clark and how many other names. But of course, many of you have known this for a long time. It is obvious that the 12 stab wounds are not a random number. Dr. Constantine's analysis revealed that some stab wounds appeared to have been caused by a right-handed attacker. Others indicated the knife wielder was left-handed. Some wounds were deep, more than one fatal, yet Others were not much more than mere scratches. What can explain these discrepancies? This leads us to an obvious conclusion. They so for the next answer, make symbolic. sure to choose a jury in the United States. What do the 12 stabs symbolize? A jury in the United States. 12 stabs. 12! The same number as a trial jury in the United States. But... Not just a jury of 12 members condemning him to death, but 12 executioners as well. This self-appointed jury had meticulously planned for everything except... Snow. Snow. The avalanche that stopped us. As well as the presence of not one, but two detectives on the train. They had to... So these next bits are fine. You've just got to select all the options anyway. So you've got to go basically through all of them. The red kimono, the broken watch, the vaping liquid, and the conductor's jackets. You need to go through all of these anyway. I don't know which of the passengers it was. It does not really matter. It was just a performance. A charade to introduce another possible culprit to muddy the waters. The time on Ratchet's broken watch was deliberately set to conceal the true time of the crime. The vial of vaping liquid incriminated Captain Arbuthnot. However, he had a solid alibi confirmed by Monsieur McQueen. Impossible then to suspect him. The conductor's jacket, found in Detective Locke's suitcase, was put there only to cast suspicion upon her. All these false leads were intended for me. But I am Poirot. I understood the truth. We have a train full of suspects. It's time to identify who the real culprit so now we're going to get to the accusing. First of all, did Joanna stab Ratchet? We're going to choose no. So you're basically going to press right on the left stick in order to fill it up. <laughs> fill her up. Eek. And then interact. So, and then choose she was drugged. So no, and she was drugged. In her suitcase was an attempt to implicate Detective Locke, but she couldn't fake her drugged condition. Dr. Constantine can testify that the drugged tea incapacitated her for hours, and she had two relapses. Let us move on to Monsieur McQueen. When I told him about Cassetti, he looked very surprised that I managed to make the connection between him and the Armstrong case. He told me, but I thought we had... Huh. Next up, make sure to choose, I thought he, we had eliminated all clues. So I thought we had eliminated all the clues. You thought you didn't leave any real clues linking the murder to the Armstrong kidnapping. Moreover, you insisted that Ratchet did not speak French when you knew I had heard a voice calling out in French that was supposed to be Ratchet. So did Queenie stab Ratchet choose yes? 
make sure to choose it. Yes, and then the proof is his father. Oh, daddy, his father. Oh, daddy. Ah, it's ruined. Pleasure in leaving me false clues, I think. It was quite annoying. But you told me yourself that your father was the district attorney who handled the Armstrong case. The case haunted my father. At first, he believed Suzanne Moreau had helped her boyfriend, Noah, to kidnap Daisy. Even though there were questions that went unanswered, and a young policewoman refused to let it go, continuing to find discrepancies, but never enough to reopen the official investigation. That policewoman sits there. Her name is Joanna Locke. Then tell him. Tell him how in the end my father believed you. How he resigned a job that he loved. Racked with guilt that he may have let that monster go free. He died young. Broken. His faith in justice broken. That's what Ratchet did to him. Thank you for your... Honesty, Monsieur McQueen. Your father is one more victim of the man who called himself Ratchet. Now, I will turn to Ratchet's valley. So, did Master Mustard Man do it? Yes, as well. Make sure to choose yes. And then the proof is the sleeping pills for Ratchet. So, sleeping pills, Ratchet. Ratchet sensed danger close to him and naturally wanted to stay awake. You gave him sleeping pills without his knowledge. Once he was sound asleep, you could do what you had to do in peace. Sir, I'll tell you the truth. I was Colonel Armstrong's adjutant in the war, sir, and afterwards I was his valet in New York. I'm afraid I concealed the fact this morning. It was very wrong of me, sir, but I knew how suspicious it would look. Is that all you have to say? That's all, sir. Now, to leave no suspicious stone unturned, let us move on to Monsieur Book. What? Me? I mean, you're more like a suspicious, a suspicious pasty, but there we go. Uh, so, did Book stab Ratchet? No. So make sure to choose no. And the proof is... He found me a room on the train. So, found me a room on the train. Book, my friend, of course you are not guilty. You did everything you could to get me on this train. What madness would cause you to ensure, and I speak with all modesty, that the best detective in the world could be present to witness your crime. But doesn't our friendship count as well? Most assuredly, but a murderer can wear all sorts of masks, including friendship. Let us consider our ever-efficient wagon lit conductor, Pierre Michel. So next up, did Pierre, uh, Pierre Michel, stab Ratchet? Yes. Proof. Drugged Ms. Locke. Your admission that you drugged Detective Locke immediately incriminates you. But the murder could not have been possible without your very capable assistance. Your knowledge of train procedures made the murder possible. And your position in the corridor of the train allowed you to be the perfect alibi for several passengers. And your motive? Suzanne Moreau, Daisy Armstrong's poor nanny, who was wrongly accused and committed suicide, was your daughter. C'est un foiré. He got what he deserved. My poor daughter has finally been avenged. My Suzanne, my child. Let's move on now to Monsieur Hardman, one of three detectives. On Next, did Mr. Hardman stab Ratchet? Yes. And the proof, Mr. Michel's testimony. You thought I was going to say he's testy something else then, didn't you? Yeah. Real detective, but you were never hired by Ratchet. Your alibi was that you were watching the corridor to protect Ratchet, which, of course, you never did. You protected Pierre Michel. However, we just saw that his alibi doesn't hold up, so neither does yours. I don't know about the conductor. 
Being Suzanne's fiancé, you had a substantial motive to punish Ratchet. You used your detective skills, just as Detective Locke did, to hunt him down and finally avenge the death of your beloved. I... That's right, Mr. Poro. I do have some detective skills. I never doubted it. Now, Fraulein Schmidt, the lady's maid with... So next up, did Schmidt stab Ratchet? Yes, she did. And the proof? She drugged Ms. Locke. Fraulein Schmidt, you told me of your remorse for drugging Detective Locke. I believe you are sincere. However, as the cook of the Armstrong family, you experienced the drama from within. The death of Daisy, then Sonia Armstrong, who died in childbirth, and finally Suzanne and John Armstrong. So much misfortune in that poor family. The death of this criminal is only justice. Let us move on to Countess Andreni. I was impressed by the earnestness of her husband when he swore to me solemnly on his honor that his wife never left her compartment that night. Next up, it is Countess Andreni. We're going to say no this time. So make sure to say no. And the proof, morally incapable of stabbing. Countess Andreni, being Sonia Armstrong's sister, you had every reason in the world to want to avenge her. But you were incapable of stabbing someone even after what he had done to you and your family. The night of the crime, you simply took a sleeping pill. I appreciate the irony that nearby, Detective Locke was also in a drugged sleep. When you awoke, you thought the nightmare was over. Rudolph? Hush, my love. Hush. Excellent transition. I was coming to you, Count André. So, on to Count Andreni. Yes, he did stab Ratchet. So, yes, he did. And the proof is he replaced Mrs. Andreni. So, he replaced Mrs. Andreni. Twelve people. A jury. This was very important to all of you. If Countess Andreni did not stab Ratchet, someone had to take her place. And you, Count. The beloved husband. I've seen how fiercely you love and protect your wife. Enough! I would do anything for Helena. Anything. Even that. Yes, even that. Let's move on. So, on to Monsieur Foscarelli. Did he stab Ratchet? Yes, I think he did. So, yes, he did. And the proof? Ms. Locke's investigation. Detective Locke found out that you were the Armstrong chauffeur and that you planned to travel on the same train at the same time as Ratchet. That is what made her decide to obtain a ticket as well. Unfortunately, she could not prevent the murder. Ah, uh, oh, oh. Uh, have you lost your tongue, Mr. Foscarelli? Oh, Daisy. She was the delight of the house. Tonio, she called me, and she, she, she would sit in the car and pretend to drive me. And you, Mademoiselle Olson, a champion for the immigrants, a worthy call. So did Miss Olson stab him as well? Yes, she did. So make sure to choose yes, and then the proof is Mrs. Hubbard's latch. So Miss Hubbard's latch. Mademoiselle Olson, you supported Madame Hubbard's story about her connecting door latch, a story that I later demonstrated to be impossible. So, you deliberately lied to me, and you also lied about Mademoiselle Debenham's whereabouts. Enough! I can't take this any more! I know what you want from me, Mr. Poirot. Very well. Here it is. 
She was my little daisy, my angel so patient. When I patched a scrape or took her temperature, that was my job. But she was so much more to me. She was a shining light in an ever-darkening world. I've tried to honor her by caring for children who have lost everything. Thank you, Mademoiselle Olsen. You too shed light on your path. So, Miss Olsen's uh, occupation, she was the nurse of Daisy. So she was the nurse of Daisy. So, can kind of trick you out there since it's gone on for so long. Remember, she's the noise. Not the nanny. That you have admitted what I know to be the truth and I understand. Let's move on. Dr. Constantine. You suspect me? I know none of these people. I didn't know Ratchet either. And I've taken a solemn oath to help people, not murder them. Of course he didn't. So Dr. Constantine stabbed Ratchet. No. The proof. Book's testimony. You are one of the few people in this room not to have any connection with the Armstrong case. Moreover, your alibi is confirmed by Monsieur Book, whom I would trust with my life. That is... that is very kindly said, my friend. We now come to Mademoiselle Debenham and Captain Arbuthnot, whose relationship was not in doubt from the moment I inspected your room at the hotel. You have a bloody nerve. Indeed, I do. We're getting married. Congratulations. But I would rather talk about your relationship to John Armstrong. So, what links Arbuthnot and Armstrong? They were soldiers together. So click soldiers. Not the dippy egg kind either. My little grey cells did not let... Captain Arbuthnot, you served in the army with John Armstrong. What I don't understand is why a man your age is still a captain. One might expect you to be a colonel as well. Ever fought in a war, Poirot? It was war that first brought me to England. Then you know what it's like. There's a shattering sound and death and mistakes acting on intelligence that proved to be wrong i i sent a patrol to their death good men brave men wasted john testified on my behalf at a court martial i'm not a colonel i don't deserve to be you bloody fool but i'm also not in prison john remained my best friend until until there you have my story Understand now? Archie, calm down, please. You're right, Mary. What you see in me, I don't understand. Oh, Archie, I see in you what John saw. Miss Debenham, I'm sorry. My turn, is it? I'm afraid so. And you have caused me quite a puzzlement. Your connection with the Armstrong family was not obvious. Then I remembered the job you... So as it turns out, she's not the owner of Debenhams, but Miss Debenham, the link is she was a teacher. So, teacher. That's the right answer. You and she was the teacher of Helena Andreni. Andreni. You were the teacher of Helena Andreni, whose maiden name was Helena Goldenberg before she married Count Andreni. Yes, absolutely. Why lie to you? She was an excellent student. Captain Albertnot. So, did Captain Bathnot stab Ratchet? Yes! Proof! Mr. McQueen's testimony. You had one of the strongest alibis, thanks to Mr. McQueen. But his testimony melted like a snowflake. There went your alibi. Poof! Unless you have another one. As for you, Mademoiselle Debenham... Now for Miss Debenham, yes, she also stabbed Ratchet. 
She did, she did, and the proof is Ms. Olsen's testimony. Mademoiselle Olsen was the only one who could confirm your alibi. I think you know where you stand. Very good, Mr. Poirot. Are you satisfied? I will be, soon. Now I must turn to Sonia Armstrong's godmother, Princess Dragomirov. So did the old Russian drinking vodka lady stab Ratchet? Yes, as well. The proof? She is left-handed. Princess Dragomirov, you weren't on my list of suspects at the start, given your social position. I left my social position in a cold country. Do you object to being addressed as princess? I deny people the opportunity. It makes a good story to tell their friends. It also guarantees a good table in the best restaurants. Princess, there is also, forgive me, your extreme physical fragility. It does not stop me when I must be strong. Indeed. Of more importance, though, is the fact that you're the only left-handed person on the train, and the single blow to ratchet from a left-handed person was very, forgive me, weak. Finally, I'm afraid I know the alibi that you shared with Fraulein Schmidt is false. You have been very thorough, sir. I hope you will permit me to say we are much alike. So we are almost done finally. Just three questions left to answer. What is Mrs. Hubbard's real name? The answer is going to be Linda Arden. <gasps> dun dun dun! Shocking twists. So Linda Arden. Linda Arden. If Princess Dragomirov hadn't told me about her relationship with this famous actress, I might not have made the connection. But you are a great actress, madame. Your performance as a flighty, self-involved woman was superb. I never would have guessed something entirely different. As Next up, what ties Linda to the Armstrong family? She is actually Sonia's mother. Oh my gosh. She is Sonia's mother. Holy monkeys. I'm right again. That up, Mrs. Hubbard. You are the mother of Sonia Armstrong and Mrs. Andre. And finally, did she stab Ratchet? Yes, she did. And the proof is the toilet bag hiding the latch. The toilet bag hiding the latch. Once you've done it, and hopefully you've made no mistakes, you will get the world's greatest detective achievement for confronting the 12 jurors without making any mistakes. And this will actually be the end of chapter 8 as well. Hooray! Getting close now. So carefully arranged that if suspicion should fall on any one person, the evidence of one or more of the others would clear the accused person and confuse the issue. Everything was meticulously planned. But you hadn't expected that Detective Locke and I would be on this train, and the avalanche would block it on the night of the murder. You had to improvise. But again, improvisation would be another of your skills as an actress. So, you came up with the story that the latch on the door that communicated with Ratchet's compartment was hidden by the handbag. I always fancied myself in comedy parts. That slip about the sponge bag was silly. Shows you should always rehearse properly. You know all about it, Mr. Poirot. You're a very wonderful man, but... Even you can't quite imagine what it was like. That awful day, I was just crazy with grief. So were the servants. We decided then and there that the sentence of death that Ratchet had escaped had got to be carried out. There were twelve of us, or rather eleven. Suzanne's father was over in France, of course. First we thought we'd draw lots as to who should do it, but in the end we decided on this way. It was the driver. Antonio, who suggested it. Mary worked out all the details later with Hector McQueen. It took a long time to perfect our plan. 
We first had to track Ratchet down. Hardman managed that in the end. Then we had to try and get Edward and Hector into his employment. Well, we managed that. Then we had a consultation with Suzanne's father. Captain Arbuthnot was very keen on having twelve of us. He seemed to think it made it more orderly. He didn't like the stabbing idea much. But he agreed that it did solve most of our difficulties. Well, Suzanne's father was willing. Suzanne had been his only child. We knew from Hector that Ratchet would be coming back from the East sooner or later by the Orient Express. With Pierre Michel actually working on that train, the chance was too good to be missed. My daughter's husband had to know, of course, and he insisted on coming on the train with her. Hector wrangled it so that Ratchet selected the right day for traveling when Michel would be on duty. And then, at the last minute, you came. For the rest of the story, you worked out everything, Mr. Poirot. You were right about all of us. What are you going to do about it? If it must all come out, can't you lay the blame upon me and me only? I would have stabbed that man twelve times willingly. It wasn't only that he was responsible for my daughter's death and her child's, and that of the other child who might have been alive and happy now. It was more than that. There had been other children kidnapped before Daisy, and there might be others in the future. Society had condemned him. We were only carrying out the sentence. But it's unnecessary to bring all these others into it. All these good, faithful souls. You are a director of the company, Monsieur Book. What do you say? In my opinion, Poirot, the first theory you put forward was the correct one. Decidedly so. I suggest that that is the solution we offer to the police. You agree, Doctor? Certainly, I agree. As regards the medical evidence, I think uh, that I made one or two fantastic suggestions. Then my solution before you. I have the honor to read from the case. That genuinely is one incredibly detailed plan. That's, uh, but you think it's all over? Well, it's not now. We've still got a couple of chapters left yet. Ah! I'm sorry to wake you up in the middle of the night, Poirot, but it couldn't wait. There was a detail that bothered me in my preliminary autopsy of Ratchet's body. I went back to examine the body and I discovered a wound covered by another. The blow I hadn't seen was delivered by a thinner, sharper blade. So there were not twelve, but thirteen stab wounds. Twelve stabs for twelve jurors. It doesn't work with thirteen wounds. The symmetry is destroyed. It can't be one of the culprits who stabbed him twice? Doctor, a different knife was used. There is only one explanation. Somehow, some way, there is a thirteenth murderer on this train. We must tell Book. The case is not solved. Please, come in. Ah, book. I see we are moving at last. Yes. The way was finally cleared while we slept. If all goes well, we will arrive in Venice this evening. The train will be there for several hours for refueling and reprovisioning. What do we do with the 13th murderer? Do you have a lead? I thought about it. There is one clue that was left aside in my investigation. The diary I found in Ratchet's safe mentioned an appointment in Venice. Someone with the initials A.W. He will never keep the appointment. Well, God damn it! How'd you miss the 13th one? You're supposed to be a doctor, Constantine! <sighs>
Anyway, so apparently it's chapter 9, here we go, right. So we're going to examine the diary, and the meeting point is Fontania di Conigli. Fontania di Conigli. The city is in Venice. The time is going to be 10 p.m. And it will be on day 18. So this is um, obviously remembering the letter that we found from Ratchet's safe or whatever it was. So what we're going to do now in order to progress the story, you can talk to Dr. Constantine and Joanne. And uh, yeah, just crack it on. Doctor, a moment. Have you made arrangements for Ratchet's body? Yes, it will be collected by the Italian authorities when we reach Venice. The autopsy will be performed there. However, there is something odd. Oh? Since the train is French, jurisdiction must be shared. When I told them you were already on the scene, they have both agreed to support your investigation until we reach Paris. Ratchet's compartment will be sealed until we arrive there. All of those who conspired to kill Ratchet are to be confined to the train until then as well. So, thanks to you, I am the rope in a tug of war between two countries. Oh, but I thought you would want to be in charge. And isn't it odd we continue on our journey with a trainload of people that police consider potential murderers? Calm yourself, Doctor. It is not the first time I find myself in the middle. And, to be honest, I welcome the chance to see this case through. It is fast becoming one of the most challenging of my career. Mademoiselle Locke, you are clearly an excellent police officer. Could you accompany me to Venice for an investigation into Ratchet's activities? There is much we still need to know. I... well, yes. It would be an honor to work with you. And... and I'm glad you trust me. What do you have in mind? There was a notation in Ratchet's appointment book. He had an appointment. With who? There were only the initials A.W. They were to meet at 10 o'clock at the Fontana dei Conigli. I want to know who Ratchet was meeting and why. But you've already discovered the 12 conspirators. Why is this meeting important? Unfortunately, the case is not complete. Dr. Constantine has discovered the presence of a 13th stab wound. One of them could have stabbed him twice. The wound was made with another finer blade. Why would one of them have used two knives? Did they want to confess they killed him more than the others? And if so, why bother to deny it when they have already confessed. No, it makes no sense. And I do not close a case until all questions have been answered. You, of all people, must understand this. You're right. I do understand. I'll help you. Thank you. Together, we will uncover the truth. We will arrive in a few hours. Take the opportunity to rest. I slept well last night. No more effects of the drug. Excellent. Then be prepared when we reach Venice. We have another mystery to solve. This is the third embarking dock and no gondoliers available at all. With Carnival, you can't find a gondolier to cross that damn canal. They're all booked. The worst thing is that the fountain is just across this canal. We're almost there. Hey, 
then, this is a bit of a weird chapter. This is kind of a semi-open location where it can be quite easy to get lost. Um, but it's not too bad, sort of, a, like I said, as long as you're following me, it should be fine. So first of all, what we're going to do is go to not to the right. We're going to go to the left. And we're going to get our first missable achievement of this chapter, which is for basically making pigeons fly away. I do apologize. I thought there were some pigeons on the right, but they're only in this location over to the left-hand side. There they are. So once you've smashed all them out the way, get out of it. Get in my KFC bucket, you. There we go. So the only useful pigeon is a stool pigeon, which is hilarious. So go on to the pier. You can see just one lonely man sitting down. Go ahead and give him a little nudge, nudge, wink, wink, talk, talk, chat, chat. Hi there. We'd like to cross the canal, please. There is a bridge about a kilometer down the canal. Please. According to the map, the Fontana de Canigli is just across the canal here. No. I, Gabriele, cannot help you. I'm sorry. We'll miss the 10 o'clock rendezvous if we try to get through this crowd and have to walk a kilometer in both directions. Why is he refusing to take us across? He looks upset. I should try to find out why. If it's a matter of price, I'm sure we can work it out. Money? Money won't help me now. His problem isn't money. What is it then? Bruh, why can't he just... Like, why isn't there a bridge? Screw these gondoliers and stuff. Anyway, interact with the boat first, so interact with the name. And then there's going to be some crushed flowers in the actual boat as well, which we're going to need to interact with too. Ah, what a sham. A beautiful bouquet crushed by revelers. So, nip into your mind, Matt, there. Go to gondolier problem. Now, what is the problem he has? He had a fight with his girlfriend. And what is the name of the gondolier's girlfriend? Chiara. Again, it's a really nice name, that. Chiara. Great. The detective gets it right. I'm sorry you had a fight with Chiara. What? How did you know? I'm a detective. I'd like to help, if I can. If you have a spare engagement ring, detective, I'll take it. Ah, I see. You lost the engagement ring you were planning to give Chiara? Lost? It is worse than that. I threw it away in the canal. I bitterly regret this gesture. I now find myself without a girlfriend and without a ring. If we find the ring, maybe the gondolier will take us across. You are right. There is not much time. I will help you. Man, this guy is just prolonging this game. Stop being a wiener, bruh. Right, so, go to the left-hand side pier. A pier matara. Uh, inspect the water. And there's going to be garbage to the left, so go ahead, inspect the garbage. Check the square box only to grab the ring, and then you can talk to the gondolier again and finally get to the other side of the, the pier. Oh, someone who'll be happy. Excuse me, I believe I have something that belongs to you. Mamma mia, grazie mille, signorina. With this, I can now win my Chiara's heart again. I know it. How to thank you? My friend and I need to get to the other side. We have a very important date at the Fontana di Conigli. Ah, yes. The rabbit fountain. Of course, I'll take you across. Then I will call Chiara. Hopefully, she will forgive me. I'm sure she will. Well done, Detective Locke. This district of Venice is very charming. You will love it.
If it's not too much to ask, can you wait for us until we return? Yes, no worries. I can call Chiara from here. To find the fountain, walk along the quay on the left, then cross the bridge and you are there. You cannot miss it. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, signorina. You have made me the happiest gondola. Yeah, what a jip. Bro didn't even sing. Yeah, yeah. That's what they sing like, isn't it, gondoliers? Or is that just back in the day? I don't know. I've never been to one. Right, so talk to Poirot here. And what we're going to do, there's only one available route, and that is going to the left. So past all these people here, nip it to the left. Again, there, there are quite a few ways to go, but a lot of places are blocked, and it can be very easy to get lost, as I said. So head over the bridge into the middle here. And we will, it's basically going to be a cutscene first. It's 9.55. The right time in the right place. Now A.W. just needs to show up. You made me run, Detective Luck. Poirot does not run. Yeah, I like Poirot. I do not run. I sit down instead. Sounds good to me. Right, so we're going to get the first golden moustache, first of all. It is just placed on one of these rabbits' noses. So make sure to grab these. Again, because this is so sort of chaotic in a sort of semi-open world environment... It can be easy to get lost, and it can be easy to miss one, too. So grab the first golden moustache there. And then what we're going to do is uh, go ahead and speak to Poirot again. Do you see anyone who could be A.W.? No, no one. But who knows what those masks and costumes are hiding? So if we look to the right, you can just see this little building. This is the hotel what we're trying to go into. The Hotel Pistolin. Pistolin. So we're going to ring the bell. Nothing's exactly going to happen. So after nothing happens, we're going to check the guest logbook. And when we do check, uh, select the uh, guest logbook, we're going to select AW. The only AW on here is Aziz Wadi. Aziz Wadi. That's the only name that corresponds to the initials AW. Spacente. Non ti ho sentito. So, a couple of questions to answer here. The first one, La, Fanta La Fontana de Conigli. Fontana de Conigli. Uh, I'm looking for the Fontana de Conigli. Do you know where it is? Oh, it's right in front of the hotel. It's easy to recognize because of a rabbits. Thank you. I had an appointment with someone, but I can't find him. I wondered if he might be staying in your hotel. I can't help you unless you give... Girl Ski doesn't even try to pronounce it properly. Bleh. Who am I looking for? Say Aziz Wadi. I have an appointment with Mr. Aziz Wadi. Do you know if he's here? Well, unfortunately, he left the hotel this morning. He seemed to be in a hurry, but he left a carta. You are? And then say that you are Mrs. Ratchet. I'm Mrs. Ratchet. Mr. Wadi asked me to give the message to the Signore, but I suppose this is okay. So, mademoiselle, was our mysterious A.W. here? No, but I managed to get his name, Aziz Wadi, and a letter he wrote for Ratchet. It seems to be a kind of riddle rhyme. Let me see. Well, Ratchet and Mr. Wadi must love this book to refer to it so much. Yes, I think we have to search and find the tracks that this person left for Ratchet to find him. I think so. Lead the way, Mademoiselle Luck. So you don't actually have to necessarily look for these clues, but I'm going to show you where they are anyway, just in case you wanted to find them and you couldn't. So the first one is right by this rabbit, where we found the golden moustache, of course. So the number two. You don't have to write it down because it's not randomized, um, but I'm just showing you where they are just in case. So next, go back on yourself and go through this alley with the chess piece or whatever. Head to the, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, but keep going straight ahead, around, 
until we get to this area here um, where we get a, another bridge and then we can go to the left nope sorry no we're going straight over uh, we go into the right over the bridge sorry put a bit ahead of myself there and just next to to this uh, shop called Signor Capello is the next number so the second digit here is number eight so from here we're going to take a left go past this little ice cream stall through this uh, alleyway Keep on going around, and then we are actually going to get the golden mustache out of the gondolier. It's a little bit dark, so we can't be quite tricky to see, but there it is. So that should be the second golden mustache golden from the gondola. Mustache. Thank you very much. So that's number two, and that's 30 out of 40 for the game. So head back on yourself. So it's only through this little alleyway. And then past the ice cream stall again, and this time we're going to go... Um, back over the bridge, so we're moving away from number eight. And then from here, we are going to go to the left. So just along the waterway. Through the little alleyway again. Excuse me, sir, get the hell out of my way. Into this little dancey, dancey little bit of area. And Art Gatto is where we can find the next number. The Art Gatto, so that's number four. Right, from here... Basically, if you do a 360 and go down this alleyway, you can see a broken down ice cream machine. That is where we need to go. So go left. And then left again. And this is basically the next area with the code. So straight in front of us is a police station and the next digit. And it is number six. Right. So from this, you can go down the left alleyway again. And we're basically going to go all the way down. So past everyone. Hello. Get the hell out of my way now. Get the hell out of the way. Yeah. And we're actually going to come up to the third out of four golden mustaches. In this area. To the left in this little shallow grave looking thing. That is where we can get the next golden mustache. The good news is that it's and then we can continue on our way. So that's three out of four for the level. 31 out of 40 for the rest of it. So here is the door that we actually need. Now what we're actually going to do is make a save here as well. So there's an achievement for finishing the chase. You're basically going to chase the murderer or the whoever we're after without losing sight of him. Or her, who knows. Um, but basically what we're going to do, so make a save just in case. But you're going to type in the code... 28469 so 28469 when we go through this is when the chase starts so if it ever comes to a point so basically you'll lose sight of the killer if the bar at the top gets full uh, and then you can reload your save and try again but the chase is easy enough it's not too bad he or she has just stabbed someone to death that's unfortunate um, but now the chase is on Again, it's quite easy enough. Just make sure to be hitting the A button when you've got to do some climbing things and everything. And don't let the bar at the top get too full. Move over. So hopefully you've done that without um, losing sight of the killer and you've got the I am speed achievement. Like I said, it's generally easy enough. Um, so hopefully you've done that first time without any issues. So after this little bit of a chase, we're going to switch to Poirot, where we can do some more investigato. Yes, 
Detective Locke? The murderer got away. I'm coming back. But it looked like he dropped something when he climbed the first wall. All right, I'll go and see. For my part, unfortunately, I could do nothing for the victim. He was already dead. I have already alerted the Italian authorities. I will see what I can find while I wait for them. All right, our kid. Poirot's put the prostate examining gloves on. So, let us inspect the bag just to the right of us. Just in front of us to the right. Um, so the bag will have some money and some glasses. A pair of women's glasses. Was Ratchet planning a new identity? There must be several tens of thousands of dollars in this bag. Next up, we will inspect the body. The victim was stabbed. Apparently the method of choice in this case. And finally, inspect the suitcase, open it up, and inspect and interact with the keys, the clothes, and the passport. Mr. Waddy's Swiss passport. I'll see if I can find a match on the internet to confirm his identity. So, uh, what we're going to do for this little bit of mind map, the uh, first name and surname is Aziz Wadi, remember? So, Aziz. Nationality, Swiss. From the city of Geneva. And his age is 45. Et voilà. Various clothes in his suitcase. Mr. Wadi was obviously planning to leave this city. A bunch of keys. If, as seems likely, Mr. Wadi is a resident of Geneva, then one of these may belong to his home there. Right, so once we're done here then, we're going to turn around from here. We will go to the right. We're going to get the fourth and final golden moustache of the level. So before heading over the bridge to the left, it looks straight in front of you. It kind of looks like a bin, but it's just a post office or post box thing. There it is. Pick up the golden moustache to get four out of four for the level and 32 out of 40 for the game. So across the bridge, just in front of us, you can see a passport, which we are going to pick up. A false passport with Ratchet's picture. Clark? Ratchet? How many others? Now he will become Enrico Caldo. It appears Ratchet changed his identity as often as his socks. So yes, we are going to go back onto the mind map. Uh, for the intuition, which is going to be at the bottom, money in the backpack. There it is, money in the backpack. And the answer is ransom from the Armstrong case. So from the Armstrong case, ransom even. Very well, I choose to go this way. I'm sorry I couldn't catch the suspect, Mr. Poirot. There is no need to apologize, mademoiselle. Your efforts were marvelous. I found some information about Mr. Wadi. Did you access the FBI database? Don't worry. My little gray cells were enough. However, the database may confirm the origin of these banknotes. No need. I included them when I continued my investigation. Excellent. So, another little puzzle to do. It's the banknote one. So, what we're going to do is scroll over to the third page. There it is. And then we'll press the A button to inspect it. 
And then we're going to go down to NA, so basically the third one down, NA215, blah, 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 G. Then we'll press the B button to back out, go to the last but one page, and then interact with two of them. So the third one down again, and then go down another four times, and there we go. So once you've interacted with all those, they are all done. So a couple more questions to answer, and that's chapter 9 done, and then we've just got three chapters left. It would seem so. He knew the serial numbers on the banknotes could be traced, and he could not spend it, so he stashed it there. But now he's run low, something he didn't count on. He hopes enough time has passed so he can begin to spend the ransom money. Ah, there is something else he didn't count on. What's that? He didn't count on you, Detective Locke, and your tenacity. Thank you. But we are still left with a murderer on the loose. But we progress. We know Mr. Wadi had an appointment with Ratchet. He had a bag full of money and a passport with Ratchet's photo, but a new name. What is your so, opinion? first of all, we're going to answer with Ratchet wanted to disappear again, hiding behind another fake identity. I discovered that he was arrested in Armenia for trafficking and stolen art, and was supposed to be arraigned in January. Once again, he changed his identity and vanished. You are correct, mademoiselle. He also told me that he was threatened, and that threatening letter we found in his room was real. He had to disappear. Next up, make sure to choose the motive is not the money. The bag isn't very big. He could have easily run away with it. If he didn't take it, it was deliberate. He wasn't interested in the money. If the motive wasn't money, it leaves passion or revenge for motive. So, Detective Locke, what do you think? Nextly, it is revenge. The motive, the motive, is revenge. Revenge seems like an obvious motive to me. The murderer carefully followed Wadi from the fountain to the new meeting place despite Wadi's precautions. That is cold and careful. Excellent. We cannot yet know for certain, but that is a sound psychological analysis. We have an idea of the motive. It is the same motive as that of our twelve would-be murderers on the train. But we still must know who was under. And next up again is the same murderer who killed Ratchet. I think Wadi's killer is also Ratchet's murderer. The motive for both deaths was revenge, and both are related to the Armstrong case through the ransom money. Exactly. So our murderer is linked to the Armstrong case. The money is linked to the Armstrong case. But these glasses that I found in the bag, they must have Next up, we are going to choose Suzanne Moreau, Daisy's nanny. So Suzanne Moreau, Daisy's nanny's glasses. Wait, I know. I've seen these. They belong to Suzanne Moreau, little Daisy's nurse. I remember seeing them in her bedroom. But they were gone the day she died. I remember the press saying that the nurse had committed suicide. I've always believed otherwise. And the glasses are proof that she was killed by Ratchet or his accomplice. He took those glasses. I always had a gut feeling. But now, Mr. Poirot, now I have proof Suzanne was innocent. Yes, you do. But the question I ask myself is this. Why did Ratchet and for the final, final question of Chapter 9, choose trophies of his victims. In my investigation at the time, I had already found Daisy's hair clip in one of Ratchet's hideouts. And now, Suzanne's glasses end up in this bag, which was a delivery to him. Two objects from two victims of Ratchet. Keeping an object belonging to his victims as a memento of the murder. He was a fetishistic killer, a trophy hunter. Okay, we managed to clear up some of the gray areas. What now? The bag only contained a fraction of the one million dollar ransom of the Armstrong case. The rest must still be in a secure place. I will make a wager with you that it is the Banque du Lac in Geneva where Mr. Wadi worked. Wadi was also the keeper of Ratchet's secrets. They were killed by the same murderer. Agreed. 
Well, there is nothing more we can do here except wait for the police. Prepare yourself for a long evening with the police. We have a lot of explaining to do. And after that? A visit to Geneva, perhaps? Here you are at last. I was worried about you. We just left the police station. We had to explain to the Italian police that we were not murderers. What? Another murder? I'll tell you when we are underway. Are all passengers and staff aboard? Yes, everyone is here. We were waiting for you. Excellent. Let's not waste any more time. We have to make a longer than usual stop in Lausanne. What? How long? Long enough to do a little banking in Geneva. But this is madness! A thirteenth murderer of Ratchet? Mon ami, he was not well liked. But Monsieur Michel would have seen anyone enter Ratchet's compartment. And there were another ten people milling about. And just in case you haven't had enough, let's answer some more questions. Yay! With an hour and a bit left. Yay! So, smoked in Vinkovsky. First of all... The thirteenth killer could have acted when Michel was smoking on the platform at Vinkovsky. But even after the train departed, Michel was absent from his post at the end of the corridor several times the night of the murder. I must know where he really was and where. Is the neighborino murderino still on the train? Yes. Yes, he most certainly returned to the train. How can you be sure? It's obvious. I mean, I hope Mr. Poirot agrees. Please. And then we are going to choose, there is no one missing on the train, uh-huh. All the passengers and crew are still aboard. If the killer of Mr. Wadi had remained in Venice, we would have noticed right away that someone was missing, and we could have alerted the authorities. I promise you, I made certain everyone was aboard before we embarked. Book, calm yourself. Calm myself? But we're back where we started. There is still another murderer on my train. Wait a moment. Can I change my mind about my verdict? Can we turn everyone over to the police? Everyone? <laughs> Including ourselves? What? No. I... No. No, no. Oh, oh, it's a nightmare. Let us take it step by step, my friend. We can start by eliminating all of the members of the Ratchet jury. All right, let's choose some bras once again. Who are the 12 people who are both Ratchet's jury and executioners? Uh, a bus not Ms. Debenham, Ms. Dragomirov, Mr. Foscarelli, Mr. Hardman, Mrs. Ubeld, Mr. McQueen, Mr. Mustardman, Mr. Michael Nogno, Mr. Andreni, Ms. Olsen, and then Ms. Schmittenhausen's. And then what it's going to do, uh, we're actually going to go to the next mind map, the other suspect. It's basically going to be is book a suspect, Ms. Locke, and Dr. Constantine. You're just going to say no for everyone. We are left with seven additional suspects. Seven? It's still too many. I agree. We must reduce our list. Excuse my impatience, Boirou. It's as if my beautiful train is cursed. Can you exonerate any of the seven? Adequate. Book worked hard to get me aboard the train. He is definitely not a suspect. Right. Mademoiselle Locke cannot be a suspect. She pursued Mr. Wadi's murderer. 
well done. Dr. Constantine alerted me to the 13th stab wound. He is not a suspect. That was easy. I have four suspects left who I must now examine more closely. Miss Nielsen, Monsieur Maury, Monsieur Fauché, and Countess Andrény. One of my employees? Suspicious? All three got off the train in Venice to restock supplies. Any one of them might have slipped away without being noticed. I suppose. I suppose. But what of Countess Andrény? You cleared her yourself. She is cleared of the first murder. But we know little of her movements here in Venice. So we still have four suspects to interview. Detective Locke? I can't join you, Poirot. My chief saw something on the news about the case and my involvement. He's demanding an explanation. If I want to keep my badge, I have to call him. Then you must do so by all means. I'm sorry. No need to apologize. I understand. I'll make the call for my compartment. If you're looking for me, I'll be there. I hate to say this, Poirot. But I must. There is, of course, one other suspect with a motive for murder. The ransom money. You mean Detective Locke? Then who did she chase? Who killed Aziz? We both saw the masked murderer standing over the body. All right, let's go and get one golden mustache, please, sir. So we're going to go ahead and go to compartment 205. There we are. We're almost there. So compartment 205. And there's going to be a cheeky little gold moustache just chilling in damn sink. So, uh, yeah, since everyone's in here, we're just I'm just going to grab you a golden moustache, okay, sir? Okay, thanks. That's golden moustache. That's le uh, one out of two for the level. That should put you on 33 out of 40 now. And then we're going to talk to Dr. Constantine and get out of here. Doctor. I need to question Countess Andrény. I'm afraid that won't be possible, Mr. Poirot. The Countess had an anxiety attack when we arrived in Venice. She was terrified the police would come for her and her husband, despite how you concluded your investigation. I had to give her a sedative. She has been sleeping since. You have stayed with her all the time we were in Venice? Count Andrény begged me to watch over her. I have not left this room. You're the reason she's in this state. Book voted to absolve you all. I accepted his verdict. I told her. I tried to reason with her. What she has already suffered, the strain of these last few days, it was too much. I understand, Count. It's quite all right. I have the answers I came for. Right, so we are leaving. We're going to go to the left and talk to Mr. Michael. Ah, Michel, I have a few more questions to ask you, if you will allow me. Anything, Monsieur Poirot. We are in your debt. Please tell me your movements when we were stopped at Venice Station. Once the compartments were cleaned and the linen refreshed, I stayed in my quarters. Did you notice anything special? Comings and goings? Monsieur Book had asked everyone to stay in their compartments. I would occasionally walk the train to ensure everyone was comfortable. Oh, I saw Monsieur Maury was all alone loading his crates of provisions. A great chef like that, reduced to petty labor. I would have helped him. But Monsieur Book had ordered me not to leave the train for any reason. So, Monsieur Maury was forced to labor alone. Let us review the actual timeline of the night of Ratchet's murder, not the one manufactured to hide your crime. I left the train in Minkowski for a smoke, then I resumed my post. That was the truth. The train departed on schedule, but then of course an avalanche of snow blocked the tracks. At 12.45, Madame Hubbard and I met in her compartment to discuss how to adapt our plan. Due to the snow and Poirot. The little play we had staged for you had to be rewritten. I left your compartment at approximately 1.15. Then the curtain went up. Calls in the night, the red kimono, all for my benefit. And all for nothing. 
as it turned out. Do not blame yourself, Michel. I am the theater critic no playwright wants to see in the audience. It kind of makes me laugh how everyone's got f uh, found out of stabbing someone to death and then they, everyone's just going around like it's all normal. All right, back to your post then. Don't worry, all good. So we're going to go to the bar and talk to Jean. You play well. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Thank you. Many years of piano lessons thanks to my mother. I try to play in a few clubs in Paris when I get the chance, but as you can see, it hasn't made me rich. What can I do for you? Conversation only. Tell me about your time in Venice. I had Monsieur Book's permission to see my sister. She lives in Marghera, just outside of Venice. She had a baby a few weeks ago. This was my first chance to meet my new nephew. Monsieur Book gave you permission? Yes, you can ask him. Most assuredly, I will. What time did you leave and when did you return? I left around 9.10 p.m. I was back by 10.45 p.m. When I got back, Hotaru was in a lot of pain. I gave him a back massage. That would have been enough time to kill Monsieur Wadi and return to the train. May I see your knives? Of course. They are here. If you don't mind. Help yourself. They are under the bar counter. Tell me again about your poker game the night of the murder. It's a regular game to help relax after a long day. Let's see, we started around 11 p.m. We took a short break in Vinkovsky, Hotaru, Pierre and I. The game finished up around 2 a.m. We'd all had quite a bit to drink. Ah, yes. I left for about 10 minutes to refrigerate champagne for the next day. That must have been around 1 a.m. So, once you finish talking to him, go around the bar and inspect the knives. Now we're starting to get into knife syndrome territory now. Um, which appears to be fine because there's nothing doing there. That's unfortunate. Uh, right, from here we're going to go to the restaurant and talk to Mr. Croissant Beef Pasty Head. You told Fauché he could go into Venice? Marghera, actually. But not so far away. It was his only chance to see his sister. He's been working every trade for weeks. There is never time to see the new baby. Enough, Book. Your heart does you credit, but your common sense, it... I know. But it's fine. Isn't it? He did come back. Oh, it's fine, as you say. Unless he saw the baby, then killed someone else and returned to the train. But that's monstrous. Murder is always monstrous, my friend. Next up, we are going to go to the kitchen and talk to Memento Mori. Good evening, Monsieur Mori. May I have a moment of your time? I have a few questions to ask you. Of of course, as long as you don't mind if dinner is ruined. I promise to be as brief as possible. What did you do while we were stopped in Venice? With Freya's help, I loaded fresh produce for the next part of our journey. Then, you may not believe this, but my job requires a lot of physical labor. My back suffers, fortunately. Jean has become quite adept at separating my vertebrae. As you may know, I have solved the murder of Monsieur Ratchet. That is a shame. I beg your pardon? The bastard sent my steak turtle back, telling Jean I was to burn it. I will add it to the list of his crimes. One wound on Monsieur Ratchet's body was struck by a very sharp, thin-bladed knife. We haven't found it yet. You think one of mine was used? I'd like to have a look, if you don't mind. In that drawer. Hmm, an impressive set of knives. 
but their blades are too wide to have been used for the crime. Tell me about your poker game the night of the murder. We started around 11 p.m. When John finished his shift, we played until around 2 a.m. From what I remember, it's a bit vague. You played without a break? Actually, we did break once for a smoke. John, Pierre, and I. When we stopped in Vinkovsky. When was that? Around midnight? So once you are done with Memento Mori, just interact with the saffron just behind him. There it is, looking all lovingly and saffrony. Now we shall head towards the storage car again. Uh, so once we get into here, we're going to inspect. There's going to be a black feather just on the floor in front of us. We're going to inspect that. Hmm, a black feather. That reminds me of something. Hmm, reminds you of something? Probably a bird. Just uh, putting it out there, world's greatest detective. Uh, anyway, into compartment 302 we go. We're going to check the case on the table straight in front of us. And it's, uh, well, it's obviously going to be another puzzle that we're going to do in just a mo. But then after this, we're going to leave and actually enter the storage area in order to pick up the next golden moustache and talk to Freya. And it's obviously missing a piece. The box is secured by some sort of locking mechanism. Tamoe! Let's do it, let's do it, let's do it! Right, from the blue suitcase all the way at the back. Um, these golden moustaches just appearing from absolutely everywhere now, aren't they, huh? Hmm, whose moustache is this? Anyway, once that is done, that should be 2 out of 2 for the level, 34 out of 40 altogether. Talk to Freya. Listen, may I talk to you for a moment? Of course, Mr. Poirot. I'm not going to bed right away. Can you tell me your movements while we were stopped in Venice? Uh, that'll be easy. I didn't move much at all. Let's see. I helped Hataru load all of the food crates aboard the train. Hataru had everything he needed, but I realized they forgot half of my order. I spent over an hour on the phone with the supplier without success. I had to change the dessert menu for tomorrow. Dr. Constantine found a stab wound on Ratchet's body that was caused by a much thinner and sharper blade than the others. Possibly a chef's knife? My thought, precisely. And you'd like to see my knives? If you wouldn't mind. I would gladly show you if I had any, but I don't. I use the regular kitchen knives. You may search if you don't believe me. I see. All the knives the staff use are in the kitchen or in the lounge. Except... Except? Otaro prefers to use his own. Monsieur Mori doesn't use the kitchen knives? Not usually. I know he keeps a set of traditional Japanese knives in a box in his room. He doesn't let anyone else use them. Although now that I think of it, he has been using the kitchen knives lately. Can you tell me exactly about your poker game, the night of the murder? We started around 11 p.m. In Vinkovsky, we took a short break. Hataru and Pierre went outside to smoke. Oh, and Hataru got sick around... a few minutes past 1 a.m. 1.10 a.m., maybe? He spent about 15 minutes in the bathroom, but he didn't want to quit on a losing streak. Did his luck improve? No, so we played to around 2 a.m. He lost every hand. I've talked to everyone, but some elements of the testimonies do not seem to correspond. I need to recheck a few things. Ho oh, oh, ho oh, ho, yes it be. Let's check a few things after we stop spinning around. Right, train staff alibis for the murder. And we go in, Mr. Michel, Mr. Mori and Mr. Faucher left the train in Vinkovsky to smoke. And Ms. Nielsen does not smoke. So Ms. Nielsen does not smoke. Oh, now it, now things are starting to add up. Och noch. Mr. Michel was not watching the hallway from 12.35. 
or 12.45, sorry, to 1.15. He was not watching it. And Mr. Mori vomited around 1.10 a.m. Oh, no. And finally, Mr. Michael entered Mrs. Hubbard's room at 12.45 to 1.15. So Mr. Mish entered Mrs. Hubbs. And Mr. Faucher refrigerated the champagne at 12.55. Next, we will talk to Freya again. Any of the three staff members had the opportunity to kill Ratchet when Monsieur Michel wasn't watching the hallway. Et voilà. Remind me of what you did when the train stopped in Venice. No problem. I helped Hataru load all of the food crates aboard the train. Hataru had everything he needed, but I realized they forgot half of my order. I spent over an hour... So it's another confrontation that we're going to come up to then. This will be the 15th out of 17. Almost there now. So the lie is, I brought in all the food crates with Hotaru. So the first option there, I brought in all the food crates. That's the lie. Mademoiselle, I believe you're hiding the truth from me. What makes you say that? And you need to choose a testimony of Mr. Michel. Michel saw Monsieur Mori carrying the crates of food alone. You weren't on the platform. I did help Ataru. The entire time? He carried so many crates, his back was sore. Ah, I'm sorry about that. Okay, I'm guilty. I did leave him before we were finished. But I had to. There was no saffron he needed for a recipe. I volunteered to go into Venice and get him some. The Rialto market would be open late because of the carnival. He gave me money. I knew we weren't supposed to leave the train, but I only wanted to help. Mr. Mori can confirm this. Ask him. I saved dinner. On behalf of my palate, I thank you. How long were you gone? I left at 9.10 p.m. and was back with the saffron around 11. That's when I called my supplier for the items I was missing. Miss Nielsen had almost two hours to buy the saffron, find a costume, kill Monsieur Wadi, elude Detective Locke, and make it back to the train for that phone call. Yes, it's possible that was enough time. Thank you, Mademoiselle Nielsen. That is all for now. Sorry again, Mr. Poirot. I hope you enjoy tonight's dessert. Imagine someone interrogating you and then just staring at you thinking. That's uh, that's some incredible interrogation techniques, but it makes you crap your pants. Right into compartment 302 we go. We're going to inspect the box here on the bed. And this is a bit of a puzzle again we're going to do. All right, so head to the right side where you're looking at the suitcase. This part, you're going to push it over to the right. And then, and then that's it, yep. Nope, keep it open, there we go. Come on, drizzle nizzle, there we go. Right, so now look at it sort of towards the door, so go to the right, and then the back side of the box, the, the bottom one we're pushing to the left. So now we're going to turn to the right again. And you're going to push all three parts, starting from the bottom, out to the left. So one, two, and three, all the way to the left. And we're going to turn to the right again in order to go to the front side of the box. We're going to push the middle and top parts left. So the middle first, and then the top part. We're going to turn to the top side. We're going to move the closest part to us, so the bottom part. We're going to put that left. And then we're going to uh, turn to the right side of the box. So again, facing towards the suitcase, and we're going to push the top part to the left. We're going to turn to the top part of the box again, and then push the top bit out to the right. And then we can click the top part of the box now to open it up, and ta-da! I mean, that's a pretty extravagant thing to hide knives from your kitchen staff. <laughs> right, so we're going to check the case on the table again. Just interact with it a couple of times, and then we are going to inspect the knives. And the one that is different, what we're looking for, is the second knife from the top. Mm. 
Colteria Venezia. Colteria. So that's obviously a lie. So we're going to have to go and speak to Lamb of God's Memento Mori once again. So nip to the catch, speak to the Morich. I'm sorry, Monsieur Mori, but haven't you forgotten something? You haven't told me about the knives hidden in your room. Ha! Yes, indeed. I forgot to tell you about those. They are my personal knives. I only use these knives. There are none better. I bought them all in Japan. No one is allowed to touch them. And of course, this is another confrontation. We all know. So the lie is, I brought them all in Japan. And we obviously know that that's a lie. I'm afraid you are so the truth is going to be... Let's see if I can get this without butchering it. Coltelleria Venezia. Or Coltelleria Venezia? Something like that, Nip. But anyway, that's the one you're choosing. It has an inscription, Coltelleria Venezia. Did you happen to go shopping tonight, monsieur? Damn you, Poirot. Very well. One of my sushi knives has been missing since the night of the murder. I thought you were going to believe I killed Ratchet. He routinely sent back my dishes to be ruined. Why does God give rich people the money to afford the best cuisine, but not the palate to appreciate it? I... I panic. I know a very good store in Venice. I went to buy a knife to replace the one that had gone missing. So. I wouldn't be accused. I assure you that I had nothing to do with any murders. I would have an easier time believing you, monsieur, if you put that knife down. Oh, yes, of course. Sorry. What time did you leave on your little shopping trip? I left around 9.30 p.m. I was back a little after 11. 11.15 p.m.? Hmm, time enough to stab Monsieur Wadi and return. Very well, Monsieur Mori. That's all for now. If I have another question... I'll be right here, cooking. Imagine trying to lie to one of the world's most renowned detectives. Eh, well, worth a shot, isn't it? But nothing gets past the moustache. It has brain cells of its own. Right, so what we're going to do is we are going to do the uh, mind map next. We're going to do alibis in Venice. And who doesn't have an alibi for the murder of Mr. Wadi? Ms. Nielsen... Mr. Mori and Mr. Fosher. So it's down to three. Nyah, nyah, nyah. So after this one, we are now going to go to compartment 105 and talk to Ms. Locke again. What have you been doing, Poirot? I am completely in the dark. I will shine some light on the situation, my friend. I have three new suspects who could have killed Ratchet and Monsieur Wadi. Miss Nielsen, Monsieur Fauché, and Monsieur Mori. They all had periods of time during both murders to commit the deed, and their alibis are weak. A visit to a family, and not one, but two shopping trips. But, but, all are my employees. Alas, yes, my dear book. But we have no proof against any of them. None of the three appears to have any motive whatsoever. But this is a tragedy. Do not give up hope. 
We will catch this murderer. There is still one place that may hold the evidence we need. Geneva. Exact. Do not give up hope. Well, that's easy for you to say. But what if it's Freya? What becomes of dessert? If it's Sotaru, who will cook? Me? And the worst, if it's Jean, who will serve the drinks? I've been checking up on the Banque du Lac. I had to confirm my identity for Interpol, so they contacted my captain at the Berkshire Police. I suspect he was not pleased. That my vacation was actually an unofficial investigation? I'll say. I would be happy to speak to him on your behalf. Thank you. But he'll get over it. It's a chance to close the books on the Armstrong kidnapping. He stopped yelling, asked for a report, then granted me an extra week. Excellent. What did you learn from Interpol about the Banque du Lac? It's had a bad reputation for over a century. Customers have included the Mafia, Nazis, corporate swindlers of every description, even heads of state. It is true, this. It is the worst kept secret in banking. They take advantage of the bank's strict policy of protecting the anonymity of its clients. This is in defiance of many laws from multiple countries, including Switzerland itself. Of course, I have never taken advantage of such a corrupt system. That goes without saying, my friend. There are ongoing investigations, subpoenas, court orders. The bank will eventually have to comply or its assets may be seized. But until then, it still thrives, thanks to its wealthy and powerful clients. It sounds perfect for the late Monsieur Ratchet. Do you have any ideas? The serial numbers from some of the bills match those from the Armstrong kidnapping. We agreed in Venice that the bulk of the money must still be physically in the bank's vault. I concur, Detective Locke. Exemplary work. So, our next task is clear. We need to get into Ratchet's safety deposit box. There will be codes, passwords. And Monsieur Wadi would, of course, have known them all. The bag of money he carried is proof of that. We'll need to find information about Ratchet's box in Wadi's office at the bank. Most assuredly, but remember the secrecy involved. I doubt. So then, where can we find information on Ratchet's safety deposit box? The answer will be Mr. Wadi's apartment. Oh yeah, so we're going to answer some questions, get a little plan going, and we are going to... Oh, let's just do it! not let me down. Mr. Wadi couldn't keep all of his secrets at the bank. Hopefully we'll find something in his apartment. We already have his address, thanks to his passport and his keys we retrieved from his body. The train stops in Lausanne at 8 a.m. But that's far from Geneva. I can delay the departure until 11 a.m., no later. The police are expecting us in Paris by the end of the afternoon, at the latest. They won't tolerate any delay. The bank doesn't open until 9. I can see only one way. That so, there's only one way to go to Geneva, Geneva, and that is through taxi. Let's take a taxi. I checked a map. It should take us less than an hour to get to Geneva from Lausanne, which leaves us just enough time to access that safety deposit box. We have no choice if we want to be back to the train by 11. Next answer, you are going to search the apartment separately. So make sure to choose separately. The best thing is to separate. One of us searches his apartment, the other searches his office. To access the safety deposit box, we need to find the key, the box number, and the passcode. Suppose you find all this. How do you and because they don't actually ask us or anything, we can just impersonate Ratchet in order to access the safety deposit box. So, we are now going to do an outline of the plan in the mind map, and then chapter 11 will begin. Chapter 12 and 13, by the way, are very, very short, so that's always nice. So we've got roughly about an hour left now. Yeah! Hey! I will say I want access to the vault. They don't ask for papers or even names. The vault information is enough. I'm not hearing any of this. I run a train company. I don't rob banks. Perfect. Let's recap the plan. So you know on TV and stuff when they have like plan making music going on in the background? I think that's what we need, but I've got skin dread in my head for... Uh, for whatever reason. So, first of all, go to Geneva by taxi, then choose separate. Then search Mr. Wadi's office and apartment. Then we are going to, number four is going to be find information about Ratchet's safe. Number five is going to be meet up at the bank. 
Number six will then be pretend to be Ratchet, and number seven, search Ratchet's safety deposit box. So yeah, I did want to put, uh, I did want to make up some uh, plan making music like you see in every TV show, but that's all I've got is a bunch of songs from Skindred's new album stuck in my head. And if you don't know who Skindred are, seriously give them a listen. They are an awesome band from Newport. Just, ah, uh, fantastic. But this will be the end of chapter 10, and chapter 11 we are on to. Keeping hidden in his safety deposit box. It sounds impossible. Not for Detective Joanna Locke and Hercule Poirot. We should get some rest. You are right, Detective. We face our greatest challenge tomorrow. Together. Nine o'clock. Our driver did well. It took barely an hour to get here from Lausanne. But we must conclude our business in one hour as well. Book can only hold the train until 11 o'clock. One hour to find the key of Ratchet safety deposit box, the box number, and its passcode. A lot to ask. Indeed. Which is why we must split our forces. I will take the cab to Monsieur Wadi's address. You must search his office. I have you on speed dial. And thank you. Mr. Poirot. For what, mademoiselle? For trusting me. So, first of all, before going to speak to Zikliak, we are going to go to the left side of this statue here and grab the first out of three golden mustaches in this level. There it is, just tucked away. You'd think the janitor or whatever would have found that and thrown it away, but uh, although a golden mustache, probably worth quite a few bob, right? Right, so go ahead and speak to Zikliak. I have an appointment with Mr. Wadi. Oh, that's a nice way to ask. You there, I have an appointment. Bruh, this is not America. This is not how we do it. No? You be polite. Right, uh, choose anonymous. Even though your customers are anonymous, considering the amount of money involved, you should still have a mention of a meeting. Yes, I can't understand it. I'll be sure to ask Mr. Wadi when he arrives. In the meantime, you are more than welcome to wait in his office. I see you're not disturbed. Please follow me. I can't understand where Mr. Wadi might be. So if you ever think of trying to do this in any bank anywhere in the world in real life, they would not let you into someone's office and just leave you in there to wait. That just would not, that's why they have a reception area for waiting. Anyway, grab the second golden mustache here on the chair. Um, I'll tell you what, if they wanted to get some information, they wouldn't be able to solve the case by waltzing in and looking at someone's office. Anyway, uh, inspect the clock, have a look at the cabinet here as well. Now we can interact with the Alice in Wonderland book and the Tower of Babel. Or Babel? Babel or Babel? I'm going to call it Babel. Behind the desk, so here is... We're just going to nip through all the pages. So basically, you can see where all some of the numbers are in capital letters. They're just basically a bunch of codes for um, things that we're going to open up. But rather than just figure it out for yourself, I'm just going to tell you what to do. So we can just pop that back now and then inspect the Tower of Babel. And then uh, again, this is a puzzle which we'll do in just a little bit. Uh, so what we can do now is back out. We're going to interact with the desk drawer, the computer monitor and the photo on the desk. Fucked. I need the password. Maybe Poirot can help me.
I'm taking a picture of it. I'll send it to Poirot. It might be useful to him. So yeah, make sure that you snap a picture of the picture, of the back of the picture, then press the X button in order to call Poirot, and then we will switch over to Poirot. And all we're going to do then is pretty much just enter Wadi's apartment for the time being. Photo with a date on it. I just sent it to you. Maybe you can use it. Thank you. That might help. I've just arrived at the apartment. I'll call you when I find something. As quick as you can. I can't stay here long. Ah, here we are. Let's see if the key I picked up in Monsieur Wadi's luggage in Venice will open his door. Great. So let's get the third and final moustache of the level, go to the right in order to interact with the bathroom and the golden moustache is just by the sink. So that is going to be three out of three and then we've just got three more in the game left to get. Right, so let's go and have a little smash through thing, shall we? First of all, interact with the bookshelf. There is a white dart in the top right corner which we are going to grab. So again, zoom in if you can't reach it. There we go. So we'll grab that one. Thank you very much. Uh, and then we can also uh, read the Alice in Wonderland book as well. There is another Alice in Wonderland book. There it is, just to the bottom left there, if you want to read that for now. Doesn't, doesn't actually matter yet. So what we can do is turn around, have a look at the kitchen island. And this is where the um, password Oh, it's close. I can feel it too. I can feel it on my knee. Wait, that's a rat. What the hell? Right, so, again, if you want to have a look at the uh, Alice in Wonderland book, basically, it's if you open it up, it'll obviously, in this one, there's going to be some missing pages and stuff like that, which you'd have to figure out where to put the codes. But, uh, yeah, again, don't worry about it, because I'm going to tell you what to do. Right, so what we're going to do now is inspect the dartboard, and we will automatically put the white dart back. Uh, again, a lot of bunch of puzzles. We're going to be just smashing through this in just a little bit. So for now, we can back out. We are going to go to the right and inspect the laptop, which is on the desk, and then the clock. Mm, this computer won't give up its secrets easily. Staring at the clock won't help, Wow. And then what we're going to do now is head into the bedroom. Sorry, a bit of an edit skip there, but we're going into the bedroom just next to the laptop. Um, you can interact with the clock if you want, doesn't really matter. But what we need is in the bedside cabinet drawer. Um, so open that one up and it's basically a sheet of paper and it's going to tell you a whole... You have to figure out some stuff again, of course, but... How, I'm just going to tell you the answer, it's basically 5193, it's basically numbers in Arabic letters. Um, if you really want to know, the digits basically always increase by one diagonally. So that's, yeah, that's how you sort of look at that one. This is the password for December, so it is 5193, that is the password. So 5193, and then we can exit the bedroom. 
If that's the password to the computer in Monsieur Wadi's office, we still need to translate the Arabic characters. And there weren't any Arabic characters on the office computer's keyboard. I wonder if the computer in Monsieur Wadi's office has a similar Arabic keyboard. Et voilà. So next up, we're going to go and interact with the fridge. So basically, when we have a look at the fridge, this is the ba the Babel, the Babel, the Babel puzzle, um, which again, you'd have to memorize and come back to it, etc. But don't worry about that. So we've taken a picture of it. Next, we are actually going to go left. So sorry, again, little edit skip there. But if we go left from the fridge, you can see the chessboard. Once you interact with the chessboard, the door will knock. So you'll have to go and answer that. Again, now, I, I'm not sure if the knock happens automatically earlier or a bit later. I don't know if you've got to interact with everything in the room first and then it happens. Uh, but if it happens earlier, don't worry about it. It's all good. Just follow along. Who are you? What are you doing in there? I am Hercule Poirot. I am working with the police. You are Monsieur Wadi's neighbor? Uh, yes, next door. I heard a noise. I thought it was... Mr. Wadi, who had come home. I don't know him very well. So we're coming up to our last and final confrontation now, finally. The lie is, I don't know him very well. Which, since he looks very familiar to him, we know that's pretty much a lie. So, I don't know him very well. You don't know your neighbor very well. And the truth is going to be the office photo frame. So the office photo frame. Now that should be 17 out of 17. So providing you've done all the other ones completely correctly, um, the achievement is complete, but you won't get it until after the credits have rolled, or after the game has finished. So don't worry if it doesn't unlock yet, you won't get it until the end of the game, providing you've done all 17 in 17. All 17 correctly. But what you will get is the achievement just like a police lineup for completing the character's menu. That's basically unmissable. Your brother has been murdered. You have my sincere condolences. Oh no, Aziz, my wife, my son, their hearts will break. Everything he did was for his family. He brought us here from Iraq to give my son a better future. We can't go back. You won't, you won't. Do not fret, Monsieur Wadi. I do not want to cause trouble for you and your family. I am here to catch his murderer. When did you last see your brother? Two days ago. He was on his way to Venice. It was not a journey he was looking forward to. I knew something was wrong, but he promised all would be well soon. My son will be heartbroken. Aziz made the point of reading to Fadi every night so he could learn English. We hope to legally emigrate there one day. Your son, Fadi. What did Monsieur Wadi read to him? His favorite book is Alice in Wonderland. The nonsense of it all. <laughs> Why? It is the answer to a question I had. I believe your brother was a good man, forced for some reason to keep secrets, and that got him killed. Sir, there is something else. Aziz left me a letter to open if anything should happen to him. Could you show it to me? Yes, I, I will get it. Mm, it all makes sense. It's horrific. But to Ratchet, it would be just business as usual. At least I have Ratchet's account number, 82664. Thank you for giving me this letter. Let me assure you, the man Ratchet cannot harm you. He was killed before your brother was. Really? Who did it? The one you say hunted Ratchet? Yes, without a doubt. I promise you I will find them. Sir, we have no papers. The police... Your secret is safe with me, monsieur. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, I must go to my wife and son. Tonight, I will read to Fadi from Alice in Wonderland, and we will remember my brother.
I need to notify Mademoiselle Locke that I have Ratchet's bank account number. Well, that's gone very well for us, hasn't it? We got the um, letter from Ratchet's account number. Tidy boys. Right, so what we'll do now is go ahead and inspect the chessboard like we were just about to do. So now we can inspect it. Um, once we do interact with it, we'll have to go into the mind map in order to uh, complete it. Hmm, a bizarre endgame to be sure, but I suspect checkmate is possible for white in three moves. Let's see. So these are the answers that we're going to put then. So go to checkmate in three moves. There it is, should be at the top left there. So first of all, you're going to put C6, so it's the rook. C6, so make sure to choose that move first. The second one is going to be King C8. So it's going to be King C8, so the middle option there. Great, huh? And then finally, it's going to be Knight C7. Knight C7, Knight C nice. So the one on the right there, Knight, which looks like a horse. C7, that'll get us the Master Chess achievement as well. That was easy. Right, so now once we've backed out of there, we can now go ahead. We've already inspected the fridge. We've already interacted with that one, so it's all good. Um, but if you just want to have another little check, if you're writing it down or not, there we go. So now what we'll do is in sport, uh, we'll interact with the dart board once again. And now we need to place the darts basically in the same fields as the piece on the chessboard. So you can see where it says A down to H. So one of the white darts, we need to put it in A6. So obviously A is going to be the outer ring and just place it where the six is. Um, the next white one is going to be placed in D5. So that is the... Fourth row down, again, don't get confused with the, as I did here, don't get confused with the uh, black and white. Um, the next one is going to be D8. So obviously the 8 is on the outer ring and the D is, the D is in the fourth ring, sorry. So again, just don't get confused. It's very easy to get confused with the, um, with obviously the colors there. It's a bit of a pain in the bum. There we go. So again, make sure obviously D is the fourth one down. So put it in D5 and then D8. How about a date? Uh, wink, wink. <laughs> right, black one's going to go in A7. And then it's going to go in A8. So find the number 8. Obviously the out, very outer ring. And the final one's going to be B7. So the black dart in B7. Once that has been completed, you can now turn it. The board will open, revealing Am's Safeo. Um, but we don't have enough stuff just yet so what we're going to do is now interact with the laptop and then what we have to do is basically trans uh, translate the letters so if we interact with the keyboard i'm going to tell you what the code is so the code is r so the the numbers are obviously already done so it's r5 a1 p9 And then F3, and then it's E for the last one. So R5, A1, P9, F3, E. In Arabic, uh, Arabic's basically read from right to left, so the password is opposite. So it's E3, F9, P1, A, 5, R. So, uh, yeah, that's a little something I know about Arabic right there. You're learning all the time. Right, so once this is all finally done, we can now press the X button in order to switch to Mislock again. I texted Ratchet's account number to you. Wonderful. Did you receive my text? This must be the password to Monsieur Wadi's computer. I have it. Thank you. Right, mate. So now we're going to start getting into the nitty gritty. So you can inspect the Alice in Wonderland book if you so wish, but we're just going to get jump straight into it. So the password is 34962. So that is Ratchet Safety Deposit Part. Box password 34, 
962. Confirm that one. And there we go. So that's all good. Now we are going to inspect the Tower of Babel. Right, so we basically have to just turn each one to get whatever it is. So, the first one is going to be uh, right at the very top, the sort of one black window on the right. The second one, you can leave it as it is, a little square on the left. Whoops, sorry, messed that one up. Uh, but it's just a little square on the left. The third one down, we'll have two circles on the right-hand side, like that. The third one down, will have a little square on the very right-hand side. And the last one should have two squares on the left. And click it open, job done. Open the tower, take the key, and cry joys of tears. Yeah. A key. Okay, Over so, a key. Desk drawer. So let's pick it up, and now we can actually open the desk drawer using the key, and then we will use the pencil and the notepad. So you need to put the notepad in such a way, so basically have it looking towards you, but sort of like this. So towards you, but a little bit down. So you can basically just see some sort of faint uh, drawings on it. So what we need to do now is basically use the pencil, shade as much of the page as you can to find the pattern. Uh, she'll automatically do it. That was an unintentional whatever you just thought I drew right there, by the way. Uh, but just keep going until she automatically stops. I'll send a picture of this to Poirot. Oh my gosh, it's all kicking off now. So, let us go ahead and inspect the monitor. We are now going to in, uh, enter the password, which is E3. So, E3 F9. I'll just try that one again there. Uh, E3. <laughs> when was the last time E3 happened, huh? Mm. F9, so E3 F9. P1, E3F9P1, and then A5R. And we also know the account number to be 82664. So that's 82664. We will now learn the safe deposit box number, which is 4346. Oh yes, now it's time to switch to the old pirate man himself. I sent you a photo of doodles I found on a notepad. I hope it can help you. I hope so as well. I was able to access Mr. Wadi's computer. I have Ratchet's safety deposit box number. Excellent. I think I've discovered Ratchet's safety deposit box passcode. Well done, Mademoiselle Locke. So, now we are back as Poirot. We're going to inspect the dartboard once again. And the password is going to be 415... So 415-368 and the dash, or the hashtag, sorry, dash, dash tag, dash tag. So uh, we'll open it up and it's just a simple little key. Like so after this, we can now call Mrs. Locke herself. Did. Good news. 
I have found the key to Ratchet's safe. Perfect. We're running out of time. Do we have everything? I have the key to the safety deposit box. I have the number of the box. And we have the passcode. I'm on my way. Time to rob a bank. Sorry to keep you waiting. I haven't heard from Monsieur Wadi. You'll have to reschedule with him. This is quite annoying. I'll have to reschedule. Absolutely. I... I hope I have been of service. You have no idea. That was fast. We do this as planned? Yes, I am, Monsieur Ratchet. But with the bank's questionable policy, I do not expect anyone to ask. Right. Absolute secret. Well, isn't that convenient? She, the clerk just gave us just enough time there in order to go through all his things, call Poirot, wait for Poirot to do his stuff, come back, and apparently we've done all this in like less than half hour. Impressive. Right, so go ahead and speak to El Clerc. And after we've done this, we can then go downstairs and talk to the guard. And the clock is ticking. I trust there is no problem. No, no problem at all. May I have your safety deposit box number? 4346. May I see your key? Do you know your passcode? Yes. Mademoiselle will be able to accompany me. No names, of course. Of course. I'll open the door. Go down the stairs. The guard will accompany you. Please leave your personal belongings in this bin and then go through the portal. I'll open it for you. So now we're going to locate the box 4346. It's basically, it, you'd think it would just be uh, in rows going down, but it's actually in rows going across. So, you know, that's a bit, um, it can be a little bit confusing, but it should be just on the right hand side. Nope, not that side, but this side. There we go. So 4346. Then we can insert the key. The guard's going to insert this, his key, and then we're going to enter the password. Which is three four nine six two. So uh, interact with it, so the guard will stick his key square in the tiny little um, blackness of hell hole. And again, the password is three four three four nine six two. And then it's just a simple case then of opening the box and inspecting every single item in the box in order to finish the chapter. I'll be by the door should you need any assistance. At last. I suspect the effort will be worth it. This collection of various personal items. Do you know what they are, Detective Locke? I do. Mr. Poirot, God help me, I do. Souvenirs. The trophies serial killers take from their victims to remind them of their kills. Ratchet wasn't just a kidnapper. No, indeed. He was a monster. Another victim. MC, 
the real journalist Michael Clark, Ratchet would have needed to kill him to assume his identity. He took this ring as his trophy. He knew the serial numbers on the banknotes could be traced. The rest of the Armstrong ransom money. The serial numbers match. The one on the left. Ratchet. Whoever he is with, their friendship seems over. The build. The hair. It could be Noah, his partner in Daisy's kidnapping. It appears they had a falling out. Another bracelet. Another victim. Another trophy. And then there's the one that we already found. Suzanne's red glasses. I wonder who this keychain belonged to. Certainly not Ratchet. Another trophy. A woman. We may never know her name. You were lucky, mademoiselle, when you met him at that cabin in the forest, alone. How many victims do you think Ratchet had? Too many. Diamonds. A fortune. Crime does pay. No, mademoiselle. This time it was the criminal who finally paid. For every soul Ratchet claimed, even more are suffering. Another trophy. We may never know how many people he killed. Four years of investigation. It's all over. I finally have the last piece of evidence that Ratchet was Daisy's kidnapper and murderer. More than that, you have helped unmask a serial killer responsible for so many deaths. But even with all this... We're no closer to solving Ratchet's murder. On the contrary, mademoiselle. Everything. It is coming together. Don't you agree, detective? What? The damaged photograph. It could be Noah. You think Noah killed Ratchet for revenge? The train. What about the train? I know how a killer could vanish without leaving a trace in the snow. Wings? Camouflage. The trophies. Poirot, we have a train to catch. Not just a train, Detective Locke. We have a murderer to catch. So a very sad uh, set of circumstantial tragedy... Don't know what I'm trying to say, but basically it's all very sad. So, basically this chapter, again, very short, the next two, but we only get to sort of walk around as Poirot once. The rest of this, basically this whole thing is mind maps and questions. Because we're about to find out who the real killer is. <laughs> who do you think it is? Put a ten of bet with me right now. Wrong! Or you might be right, because I can't hear you. You have kept us in suspense ever since we left Lausanne. Forgive me, my friend. Detective Locke and I needed the time to put the last pieces of the puzzle in their proper places. I'll fill in where I can, but this is Mr. Poirot's show. I confess I can't help, but I feel a certain déjà vu. You are correct, Doctor. We have been here before. However, without you, we wouldn't have been able to reach the true conclusion of this story. My friends, your attention, please. I hope you have finished your dessert. You have every right to think the solution to the murder of Ratchet is a closed book. You are wrong. I, Poirot, admit that I was wrong. There is a final chapter. What in bloody hell? What does he mean? Perhaps if we are silent, 
Monsieur Poirot will explain. Most of us naturally expect a journey by train to proceed in an orderly fashion from station to station. But this journey has gone off the rails. A comfortable journey, which should have been restful, turned out to be quite a challenge for my little gray cells. I beg your indulgence. I know it will be painful, but I must update you on the strange turn the ratchet murder investigation has taken. I had two hypotheses, as you recall. A stranger boarded the train in Vinkovsky, killed Ratchet, and then exited the train unobserved. That was the first possibility. The second solution gave us 12 jurors who condemned Ratchet to death for the kidnapping and murder of Daisy Armstrong. My friend, Book, properly chose the first solution for the authorities. However, thanks to Dr. Constantine here, a 13th stab wound was discovered, throwing that solution into disarray. Moreover, the words of a witness called into question the chronology of the night of the murder upon which the first two solutions were based. Detective Locke? So, for the first answer then, we are going to choose Pierre Michael. No, that is so not right. Or Pierre Michel. Michael admitted to having been absent several times during the night. His absence, therefore, gave multiple opportunities for a 13th murderer to slip into Ratchet's room before the other 12 jurors lined up to stab him. You are saying the man Ratchet was... was... when we... Yes, you executed a man who was already dead. But there were other suspects that night. Other suspects? Who? They stand before you. Mr. Fauché? Mr. Maury and Ms. Nielsen, and they all also had a hole in their stories about their movements that night. Mr. Poirot? Most of you don't know it, but there was a second murder in Venice. Mein Gott, another murder. The victim was a man named Aziz Wadi, a banker in Geneva who was on the payroll of Ratchet. He looked after the money Ratchet obtained from the Armstrong Ransom. Ratchet needed money and arranged to meet Mr. Wadi in Venice. One of these three knew about that money. Now, each of them had an alibi of a sort. But if any of their alibis was a lie, that person had time to murder Monsieur Wadi. Monsieur Fauché, Mademoiselle Nielsen, and Monsieur Maury. One of you murdered Ratchet and Monsieur Wadi. Are you kidding? I pour drinks for our guests. I don't murder them. It's nonsense. You are accusing me? Next up is Daisy's death motive of the 13th murder. Make sure to choose no. There is an achievement, by the way, for confronting the real killer here without mistakes. So again, make a manual save if you wish. But no is the answer for Daisy's death. ...was revenge but not for Daisy's death. The motive for Aziz Wadi's murder was also revenge. Mr. Wadi was helping Ratchet. Ratchet had an accomplice in the kidnapping named Noah. They kidnapped Daisy together. Ratchet stored the ransom money in a Swiss bank that protected anonymous clients. He forced Monsieur Wadi to watch over the money. Once enough time had passed, Ratchet felt it was safe to have Monsieur Wadi bring him cash whenever Ratchet needed it. The serial numbers of the bills would still be in a file, but no one would be actively checking it. Precisely. But Ratchet didn't just keep the ransom in his safety deposit box. And next up, apart from the ransom, what did the safety deposit box contain? Make sure to choose Victims Trophies. There was something much worse than Daisy's ransom money in that safety deposit box. During her investigation, Detective Locke found evidence proving that Ratchet was what is known as a trophy killer. 
He kept souvenirs of his crimes. We found trophies in the safety deposit box. There were others in a cabin Ratchet used in the Berkshire Mountains, including a beloved toy of Little Daisy's. If I'd have known that, I would have cut the bastard's head off. So, a little bit of a mind map to do here. What we're going to do is, first of all, choose the photo of Ratchet and Noir. So, the photo of Ratchet and Noah, and the leather bracelet, the same as in the photo, which should be on the bottom row, second one over. There we go. Now, be very careful here. We need to pick up the golden mustache. So, before accusing anyone, basically, we're going to have the three in front of us where we can accuse them. But what we need to do first is interact with the golden mustache on the floor. So, don't accuse someone just yet. It's obvious. Ratchet killed Noah. And therefore... At last, I can tell you with absolute certainty who the murderer of Ratchet and Monsieur Wadi is. So here it is then, coming up. Again, don't accuse anyone just yet. What you need to do is look down at the floor uh, to the left of you in order to pick up the 38th out of 40 golden moustaches. This is the only one for the level. We'll get the last two in the last one. And then we can go ahead and choose... Freya! Yes, Freya is the real murderer. Uh, interact with her bracelet. And uh, now it's all going to come out about what happened. Did you have an inkling? Same bracelet as the one found in the safety deposit box in Geneva. A trophy from a victim of Ratchet. Noah. Having a similar bracelet doesn't prove anything. Yes, that might be true. If there were not an inscription on it. Mr. Poirot, you're right. The bracelet looks similar to mine, but I have no idea what the marks on it mean. I just like the design. The marks are not random, mademoiselle. These are special bracelets. They are called Morse code bracelets. Because, well, you know why. The marks are Morse code. Happily, I learned Morse when I was a young man doing my service for the Belgian army. So all you're doing here is just spelling out the name Freya, which is obviously F-R-E-J-A. F-R-E-J-A. And after you've done this, you'll get the world's greatest detective achievement and chapter 12 will be finished after quite a bit of cutscene and a quite dramatic ending. Et voilà. On the bracelet found in Ratchet's safety deposit box was the name Freya in Morse code. Your first name. It belonged to your father, Noah. Noah Nielsen. Let's stop playing this little game, mademoiselle. What does yours say? Noah? It says father. Ratchet. That... Bastard! He kept my father's bracelet as a... as a... trophy! Thank you. I have to admit your timing for Ratchet's murder was perfect. Do you mind if I continue? Would it matter? Go ahead. You've earned the right to crow. I do not make bird sounds, mademoiselle. I take no pleasure in this. You drugged Ratchet's dessert to ensure he would be unconscious when you went to his room. You stole a knife from Monsieur Mori. If it was identified as the murder weapon, he would be accused. You knew Pierre Michel would leave the train for a smoke whenever it was stopped at a station. At Vinkovsky, you waited until he was on the station platform. Then, you carefully made your way along the first-class corridor to Ratchet's room. You entered Ratchet's room with the pass key, accessible to all employees in the crew quarters. You stabbed Ratchet at midnight. But that knife, where is it? Probably thrown out of Ratchet's window before the train left the station. A thorough search after the snow melts should turn it up. 
My beautiful knife. Then, you carefully return to the crew quarters, replace the passkey, and return to your poker game. Et voilà. The affair was not so complicated in the end. But what made the crime seem more complex? Well... It was us. Exactly. The twelve jurors who proceeded to carry out their far more complicated plan literally in the dark without realizing that the man was already dead. Speaking only for myself, of course, but I believe we would have invited you to join us. Ms. Nielsen, you killed Ratchet because he killed your father. Your motive is crystal clear. But why did you kill Aziz Wadi? It's because of Aziz that my father died. My father knew Aziz was the only one with access to Ratchet's safe. So he convinced Aziz to steal the money from the safety deposit box. But Aziz was too afraid of Ratchet. Instead, he betrayed my father by reporting him to Ratchet. Obviously, Ratchet then murdered my father. Aziz was just as guilty of my father's death as Ratchet. Ratchet was the worst of humanity. But Monsieur Wadi, if you knew his story... My father is dead because of him. I will not debate the point with you, mademoiselle. He had done nothing to justify his death. I do not see any extenuating circumstances that should allow you to escape justice. You will be arrested at the Gare de Lyon when we arrive in Paris. Judge and jury are you, Monsieur Poirot. And you get away with it. It must be nice. But think of this. I know what you did. What you all did. She's right. She could turn us all in. Relax. Hector, is it? Your secret is safe with me. I'm not going to jail. Farewell, Poirot. Enjoy your victory. Stop. No, Freya, don't jump. You're going to die. I've made my choice. We'll let fate decide. No! She jumped off the train. Even if she hit the water, considering the height, I doubt she survived. And with this tunnel, either way, she's gone, Poirot. I still can't believe what happened. Thirteen people took revenge on the same person. This investigation is so incredible. It almost looks like a detective story. It would surely be a bestseller. It is true that this case will remain as one of the most important investigations of my career. My only regret will be that I couldn't bring Ratchet to justice, but I can finally close this chapter of my life. Your determination paid off. You can be proud of yourself. I think we'll be arriving in Paris soon. If you will pardon me, Detective Locke, I have to settle a few details with Monsieur Book before we arrive. Well, well, well! What a whole bunch of twists and turns! That was, uh, well, that was certainly something, wasn't it? Right, so we are basically ten minutes away now from getting this done, so we can... Uh, talk to M. Book right here after we. <laughs> it deserts were divine, apart from the fact that she, you know, stabbed someone and then made an innocent girl kill herself and frame her and. Yeah, apart from all that stuff. Yeah. Well, she did get rid of a serial killer, so. She did make some banging desserts. Yeah. And. She was blonde. 
and blondes are lovely, as are brunettes and redheads. Everyone's lovely, but uh, I, I, I like blondes. Anyway, enough about me being a wiener. Um, <laughs> sorry. But uh, yeah, so there we go. That's the end of it. Now she has presumably gone to the hell beneath. True. I look forward to seeing you again abroad, Monsieur Poirot. I promise not all of our trips are this eventful. Princess Dragomirov would like a word with you, Monsieur Poirot. It is important. She is waiting for you in her compartment. When a princess summons me, how can I refuse? Ah, so I guess that's where we're off next then. So we can now go ahead and go to the... Uh, we need to go to the lounge, actually, and we're going to speak to uh, Captain Nico Bellic and Miss Debenham of Debenhams. In fact, actually, no, we're just walking straight past, are we? Okay, uh, I thought we were going to talk to them, but we're not bothering. We're actually going to go to the first class card to pick up the golden moustache. So, <laughs> so that's what we're going to do first. So pick up that golden moustache. That's one out of two. So we've got one left, which we will grab after we get on the train. And then go ahead and talk to Count Andreni. How is the Countess? Much better now that it's all over. I misjudged you, Poirot. And I you. There is something else about my wife you should know. Why I am so overprotective. She is pregnant. <sighs> You are quite the detective. <laughs> Actually, Dr. Constantine told me. She admitted as much when he was attending to her. If it's a girl, we are going to name her Daisy. If it's a boy, Hercule, he'll be stuck with Rudolph. It's a family tradition. I wish you and all of your family much happiness. Thank you. So nip it off and go to compartment 107 for another chat. My daughter, my great friend and I wanted to talk to you one last time. I speak on behalf of the entire Armstrong family as well as those close to us. You have shown compassion. We know your reputation and we understand that your choice was not easy for you. We are all the more grateful. Thank you. Congratulations, my dear. You managed to say the word thank you, although he did manage to put us through quite a lot. You have given us all closure and some peace of mind. You should know that I regret nothing. If this Freya Nielsen person had not been involved, I would have done it again. Someone told me the Stalinists were frightened of you. I believe them. The country of my birth breeds its share of brutes and bullies, but also some of the greatest intellectual and artistic minds the world has ever known. I pray that one day we will again be remembered for that. I share your hope, Princess. And of course, with the real murderer of that man out there somewhere, we are no longer guilty of... Much. Correct? Princess, don't push your luck too far. If you'll excuse me, I have some packing to do. Ladies? And finally, we can go to compartment 202. We're going to pack our suitcase, answer a few questions, and then we are off the train. But in what seems like a long, long year. At the end of this investigation, I still have my doubts. So these answers don't actually matter here. Um, whether you were correct to let the jurors go free, or if Freya Nelson hadn't escaped, would I ever arrested? I just said yes to both of them, uh, but it doesn't matter whatever you want to pick. As for Mademoiselle Nielsen, what would I have done if she had not escaped? Is it justice to let the Twelve go free, but have Mademoiselle Nielsen arrested? A vast question indeed. Judges often take motive into consideration when deciding the sentence for a crime. You are not a judge. 
Your job is to establish the facts, which you have done. The case has been solved. Another already awaits you. It is the reason you were on this train. It is time. Time to move on. So let's go ahead then and grab the final mustache in order to get the gotta catch him up, Pokemon. Uh, so the golden mustache is not on this box here, it is around the other side. So once we have picked it up, you will now be able to uh, get the catch em all achievement. 40 out of 40 all done and you should only have three achievements left. So after that's done, you can basically go ahead and talk to Foscarelli. Ms. Olsen, Mr. Hardman, Mr. Mustard Man, and Mr. Book, and this will effectively end the game. You don't? What? But it's electric. It's good for the planet. I am good for the planet, as long as I don't drive. I don't understand. He refused. No problem. Hmm, I wonder where Princess Dragomirov's bird... Have you lost something? May I help you? Oh, Mr. Poirot, you have done so much already. What is it you have lost? My friends, we are traveling to Poland to help with children. We were to meet at an information booth. But where do I get information on how to find an information booth? There is, I believe, an information booth just inside the main terminal. Oh, thank you, sir. You are a great detective. <laughs> and you, madame, are a good soul. News travels fast. Hey, Poirot. Say. Have you seen a scruffy little guy in a green trench coat? I cannot say I have. Why? He's my next case. Another case? That was indeed fast. A detective's gotta eat. You know what I mean. I have some idea, yes. Suspected embezzler. Traveling east. But not on the Orient Express. Say, you wouldn't be interested in teaming up, would you? Some good money in it. I have had enough of trains for a while, thank you. Okay, suit yourself. Mr. Poirot, Mr. McQueen here thinks he may know an attorney in the Berkshires who might need a gentleman's gentleman. He's old school English. I think the clock stopped for him in 1934. I hope it works out for you, Monsieur Masterman. What about you, Monsieur McQueen? Well, back to law school for me, following my father's footsteps. We can take the train to St. Pancreas, then the Piccadilly line to Heathrow, and check out some flights. Might as well. We're already packed. I wish you both bonne chance. Ah, Poirot. Mission accomplished. I have reported to the police that Freya Nielsen killed Hatchet and that she escaped. They're issuing an international arrest warrant. There's a canal that runs alongside the tracks where she jumped from the train. But they say there's little chance she survived. The police have questioned all of the passengers and crew, so for now, they are free to leave. I gave them the results of my preliminary autopsy, and they have the report from the Venetian authorities. They were arguing about jurisdiction when I left. Thank you, Doctor. You have been of inestimable help. 
A fascinating case. I'm pleased I could assist you. Mr. Poirot, it seems our paths part here. It was an honor and a pleasure to work with you. And I am with you, Detective Luke. The case would have been impossible without your tenacity and dedication to finding the truth. You also proved to be an able con artist in Geneva. You too. <laughs> Thank you for everything. I'll never forget you. And I shall always treasure our collaboration. Well, that's that. I'm hungry. Let's go to the Wagon Rouge restaurant. They make an excellent leg of lamb. But it's only 5.34 p.m. Is food all you really think about, my friend? I'm the one inviting you. You've well deserved it. I'm warning you, I'm not going to obtain for you a secret recipe this time. Poirot, they make a chocolate mousse that is so creamy. It must have a secret ingredient in it. The last recipe came from a murderer. So there we go then, guys and gals. You should now get the three final achievements. A human lie detector for doing all confrontations without a mistake. Completing a game without using a hint. And finishing chapter 13. So thank you so, so much for watching, guys and gals. I do hope you enjoyed the game and that the guide helped as well. If it did, of course, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe and share with a friend as well. Big shout out to all my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. It really, really means a lot. And, uh, whew, well, this was a biggie. But I will see you in the next E. Big lovey.